Chapter 1, in which Benny Profane, a schlemiel, and human yo-yo gets to an aperture. V1 Christmas Eve, 1955, Benny Profane, wearing black Levi's, suede jacket, sneakers, and big cowboy hat, happened to pass through Norfolk, Virginia. Given to sentimental impulses, he thought he'd look in on the sailor's grave, his old tin cans tavern on East Main Street. He got there by way of the arcade, at the east main end of which sat an old street singer with a guitar and an empty sterno can for donations. Out in the street, a chief yeoman was trying to urinate in the gas tank of a 54 Packard patrician, and five or six seamen apprentice were standing around giving encouragement. The old man was singing in a fine, firm baritone, Every night is Christmas Eve on old East Main. Sailors and their sweethearts all agree. Neon signs of red and green shine upon the friendly scene, welcoming you in from off the sea. Santa's bag is filled with all your dreams come true, nickel beers that sparkle like champagne. Barmaids who all love to screw, all of them reminding you it's Christmas Eve on old East Main. Yay, chief, yelled a seaman deuce. Profane rounded the corner. With its usual lack of warning, East Main was on him. Since his discharge from the Navy, Profane had been road laboring, and when there wasn't work, just traveling up and down the East Coast like a yo-yo, and this had been going on for maybe a year and a half. After that long of more named pavements than he'd care to count, Profane had grown a little leery of streets, especially streets like this. They had, in fact, all fused into a single abstracted street, which, come the full moon, he would have nightmares about. East Main, a ghetto for drunken sailors nobody knew what to do with, sprang on your nerves with all the abruptness of a normal night's dream turning to nightmare. Dog into wolf, light into twilight, emptiness into waiting presence. Here were your underage marine barfing in the street, barmaid with a ship's propeller tattooed on each buttock, one potential berserk studying the best technique for jumping through a plate glass window. When to scream Geronimo, before or after the glass breaks. A drunken deck ape crying back in the alley because last time the SPs caught him like this, they put him in a straitjacket. Underfoot, now and again, came vibration in the sidewalk from an SP street lights away, beating out a hay rube with his nightstick. Overhead, turning everybody's face green and ugly, shone mercury vapor lamps receding in an asymmetric V to the east where it's dark and there are no more bars. Arriving at the sailor's grave, Profane found a small fight in progress between sailors and jarheads. He stood in the doorway a moment, watching then realizing he had one foot in the grave anyway, dived out of the way of the fight and lay more or less doggo near the brass rail. Why can't man live in peace with his fellow man? wondered a voice behind Profane's left ear. It was Beatrice, the barmaid, sweetheart of Destiv 22, not to mention Profane's old ship, the destroyer USS Scaffold. Benny, she cried. They became tender, meeting again after so long. Profane began to draw in the sawdust hearts, arrows through them, seagulls carrying a banner in their beaks which read, Dear Beatrice. The scaffold boat's crew were absent, this tin can having got underway for the Mediterranean two evenings ago amid a storm of bitching from the crew, which was heard out in the cloudy roads, so the yarn went, like voices off a ghost ship, heard as far away as Little Creek. Accordingly, there were a few more barmaids than usual tonight, working tables all up and down East Main, for it said, and not without reason, that no sooner does a ship like the scaffold single up all lines than certain navy wives are out of their civvies and into barmaid uniform, flexing their beer-carrying arms and practicing a hooker's sweet smile, even as the N.O.B. band is playing Old Lang Syne, and the destroyers are blowing stacks in black flakes all over the cuckolds to be standing manly at attention, taking leave with rue and a tiny grin. Beatrice brought beer. There was a piercing yelp from one of the back tables. She flinched. Beer slopped over the edge of the glass. God, she said, it's Ploy again. Ploy was now an engineman on the minesweeper impulsive, and a scandal the length of East Main. He stood five feet nothing in sea boots and was always picking fights with the biggest people on the ship, knowing they would never take him seriously. 
Ten months ago, just before he'd transferred off the scaffold, the Navy had decided to remove all of Ploy's teeth. Incensed, Ploy managed to punch his way through a chief corpsman and two dental officers before it was decided he was in earnest about keeping his teeth. But think, the officers shouted, trying not to laugh, fending off his tiny fists. Root canal work, gum abscesses. No, screamed Ploy. They finally had to hit him in the bicep with a pentothal injection. On waking up, Ploy saw Apocalypse, screamed lengthy obscenities. For two months he roamed ghastly around the scaffold, leaping without warning to swing from the overhead like an orangutan, trying to kick officers in the teeth. He would stand on the fantail and harangue whoever would listen, flannel-mouthed through aching gums. When his mouth had healed, he was presented with a gleaming regulation set of upper and lower plates. Oh, God, he bawled and tried to jump over the side, but was restrained by a gargantuan negro named Dahoud. Hey there, little fella, said Dahoud, picking Ploy up by the head and scrutinizing this convulsion of dungarees and despair, whose feet thrashed a yard above the deck. What do you want to go and do that for? Man, I want to die, is all, cried Ploy. Don't you know, said Dahoud. That life is the most precious possession you have? Ho, ho, said Ploy through his tears. Why? Because, said Dahoud, without it you'd be dead. Oh, said Ploy. He thought about this for a week. He calmed down, started to go on liberty again. His transfer to the impulsive became reality. Soon, after lights out, the other snipes began to hear strange grating sounds from the direction of Ploy's rack. This went on for a couple, three weeks, until one morning around two, somebody turned on the lights in the compartment, and there was Ploy, sitting cross-legged on his rack, sharpening his teeth with a small bastard file. Next payday night, Ploy sat at a table in the sailor's grave with a bunch of other snipes, quieter than usual. Around eleven, Beatrice swayed by, carrying a tray full of beers. Gleeful, Ploy stuck his head out, opened his jaws wide, and sank his newly filed dentures into the barmaid's right buttock. Beatrice screamed. Glasses flew parabolic and glittering, spraying the sailor's grave with watery beer. It became Ploy's favorite amusement. The word spread through the division, the squadron, perhaps all desland. People not of the impulsive or scaffold came to watch. This started many fights like the one now in progress. Who did he get, Profane said. I wasn't looking. Beatrice, said Beatrice, Beatrice being another barmaid. Mrs. Buffo, owner of the sailor's grave, whose first name was also Beatrice, had a theory that just as small children call all females mother, so sailors in their way equally as helpless should call all barmaids Beatrice. Further to implement this maternal policy, she had had custom beer taps installed made of foam rubber in the shape of large breasts. From eight to nine on payday nights there occurred something Mrs. Buffo called suck hour. She began it officially by emerging from the back room, clad in a dragon-embroidered kimono, given her by an admirer in the Seventh Fleet, raising a gold bosun's pipe to her lips and blowing chow down. At this signal everyone would dive for, and if they were lucky enough to reach one, be given suck by a beer tap. There were seven of these taps, and an average of 250 sailors usually present for the merrymaking. Ploy's head now appeared around a corner of the bar. He snapped his teeth at Profane. This here, Ploy said, is my friend Dewey Gland, who just came aboard. He indicated a long, sad-looking rebel with a huge beak who had followed Ploy over, dragging a guitar in the sawdust. Howdy, said Dewey Gland. I would like to sing you a little song. To celebrate, you're becoming a PFC, said Ploy. Dewey sings it to everybody. That was last year, said Profane. But Dewey Gland propped one foot on the brass rail and the guitar on his knee and began to strum. After eight bars of this, he sang in waltz time. Poor forlorn civilian, we're going to miss you so. In the goat hole in the wardroom, they're crying. Even the miserable XO. You're making a mistake. Though your ass they should break, your report chits number a million. Ship me over for twenty years. I'll never be a poor, forlorn civilian. It's pretty, said Profane into his beer glass. There's more, said Dewey Gland. Oh, said Profane. 
A miasma of evil suddenly enveloped Profane from behind. An arm fell like a sack of spuds across his shoulder, and into his peripheral vision crept a beer glass surrounded by a large muff fashioned ineptly from diseased baboon fur. Benny, how's the pimping business here, yeah, here? Yeah. The laugh could only have come from Profane's one-time shipmate, Pig Bodine. Profane looked round. It had. Here, here approximates a laugh formed by putting the tongue tip under the top central incisors and squeezing guttural sounds out of the throat. It was, as Pig intended, horribly obscene. Old oh, Pig, aren't you missing movement? I am a wall. Pappy Hod, the bosun mate, drove me over the hill. The best way to avoid SPs is to stay sober and with your own, hence the sailor's grave. How is Pappy? Pig told him how Pappy Hod and the barmaid he'd married had split up. She'd left and come to work at the sailor's grave. That young wife, Paola, she'd said sixteen, but no way of telling because she'd been born just before the war and the building with her records destroyed like most other buildings on the island of Malta. Profane had been there when they met. The Metro Bar on Straight Street, the Gut, the Letter, Malta. Chicago, from Pappy Hod in his gangster voice. You heard of Chicago? Meanwhile, reaching sinister inside his jumper, a standard act for Pappy Hod all around the meds literal. He would pull out a handkerchief and not a heater or a gat after all, blow his nose and laugh at whatever girl it happened to be sitting across the table. American movies had given them stereotypes all, but Paola Maestro, who continued to regard him then with nostrils unflared, eyebrows at dead center. Pappy ended up borrowing five hundred for seven hundred from Mac the Cook's slush fund to bring Paola to the States. Maybe it had only been a way for her to get to America, every Mediterranean barmaid's daftness, where there was enough food, warm clothes, heat all the time, buildings all in one piece. Pappy was to lie about her age to get her into the country. She could be any age she wanted, and you suspected any nationality, for Paola knew scraps, it seemed, of all tongues. Pappy Hod had described her for the deck apes' amusement down in the bosun's locker of the USS Scaffold, speaking the while, however, with a peculiar tenderness, as if slowly coming aware, maybe even as the yarn unlaid, that sex might be more of a mystery than he'd foreseen— and he would not, after all, know the score, because that kind of score wasn't written down in numbers, which after forty-five years was nothing for any riggish pappy hod to be finding out. "'Good stuff,' said Pig aside. Profane looked toward the back of the sailor's grave and saw her approaching now through the night's accumulated smoke. She looked like an East Main barmaid. What was it about the prairie hair in the snow, the tiger in tall grass and sunlight?' She smiled at Profane, sad, with an effort. You come back to re-enlist? Just passing, Profane said. You come with me to the West Coast, Pig said. Ain't an SP car made that can take my Harley. Look, look, cried little Ploy, hopping up and down on one foot. Not now, you guys, stand by. He pointed. Mrs. Buffo had materialized on the bar in her kimono. A hush fell over the place. There was a momentary truce between the jarheads and sailors blocking the doorway. Boys, Mrs. Buffo announced, it's Christmas Eve. She produced the bosun's pipe and began to play. The first notes quavered out fervent and flute-like over widened eyes and gaping mouths. Everyone in the sailor's grave listened awestruck, realizing gradually that she was playing. It came upon a midnight clear within the limited range of the bosun's pipe. From way in the back, a young reserve who had once done nightclub acts around Philly began to sing softly along. Floyd's eyes shone. It is the voice of an angel, he said. They had reached the part that goes, Peace on the earth, good will to man, from heaven's all-gracious king, when Pig, a militant atheist, decided he could stand it no longer. That, he announced in a loud voice, Sounds like chow down. Mrs. Buffo and the reserve fell silent. A second passed before anybody got the message. 
Sock hour, screamed Ploy, which kind of broke the spell. The quick-thinking inmates of the impulsive somehow coalesced in the sudden milling around of jolly jack tars, hoisted Ploy bodily and rushed with the little fellow toward the nearest nipple in the van of the attack. Mrs. Buffo, poised on her rampart like the trumpeter of Krakow, took the full impact of the onslaught toppling over backwards into an ice tub as the first wave came hurtling over the bar. Ploy, hands outstretched, was propelled over the top. He caught on to one of the tap handles, and simultaneously his shipmates let go. His momentum carried him and the handle in a downward arc. Beer began to gush from the foam-rubber breast in a white cascade, washing over Ploy, Mrs. Buffo, and two dozen sailors who had come around behind the bar in a flanking action, and who were now battering one another into insensibility. The group who had carried Ploy over spread out and tried to corner more beer taps. Ploy's leading petty officer was on hands and knees holding Ploy's feet, ready to pull them out from under him and take his striker's place when Ploy had had enough. The impulsive detachment in their charge had formed a flying wedge. In their wake and through the breach clambered at least sixty more slavering blue jackets, kicking, clawing, side-arming, bellowing uproariously, some swinging beer bottles to clear a path. Profane sat at the end of the bar, watching hand-tooled sea-boots, bell-bottoms, rolled-up Levi cuffs, every now and again a drooling face at the end of a fallen body, broken beer bottles, tiny sawdust storms. Soon he looked over. Paola was there, arms around his leg, cheek pressed against the black denim. It's awful, she said. Oh, said Profane. He patted her head. Peace, she sighed. Isn't that what we all want, Benny? Just a little peace, nobody jumping out and biting you on the ass? Hush, said Profane. Look, someone has just walloped Dewey Gland in the stomach with his own guitar. Paola murmured against his leg. They sat quiet without raising their eyes to watch the carnage going on above them. Mrs. Buffo had undertaken a crying jag. Inhuman blubberings beat against and rose from behind the old imitation mahogany of the bar. Pig had moved aside two dozen beer glasses and seated himself on a ledge behind the bar. In times of crisis he preferred to sit in his voyeur. He gazed eagerly as his shipmates grappled shoat-like after the seven geysers below him. Beer had soaked down most of the sawdust behind the bar. Skirmishes and amateur footwork were now scribbling it into alien hieroglyphics. Outside came sirens, whistles, running feet. Uh-oh, said Pig. He hopped down from the shelf, made his way around the end of the bar to Profane and Paola. Hey, Ace, he said, cool and slitting his eyes as if the wind blew into them. The sheriff is coming. Back way, said Profane. Bring the broad, said Pig. The three of them ran broken field through a room full of teeming bodies. On the way, they picked up Dewey Gland. By the time the shore patrol had crashed into the sailor's grave, nightsticks flailing, the four found themselves running down an alley parallel to East Main. Where are we going? Profane said. The way we're heading, said Pig. Move your ass. Two. Where they ended up finally was an apartment in Newport News, inhabited by four wave lieutenants and a switchman at the coal piers, friend of Pig's, named Morris Teflon, who was a sort of housefather. The week between Christmas and New Year's Day was spent drunk enough to know that's what they were. Nobody in the house seemed to object when they all moved in. An unfortunate habit of Teflon's drew Profane and Paola together, though neither wanted that. Teflon had a camera, Leica, procured half-legally overseas by a Navy friend. On weekends, when business was good and guinea red wine splashing around like the wave from a heavy merchantman, Teflon would sling the camera around his neck and go a-roving from bed to bed, taking pictures. These he sold to avid sailors at the lower end of East Main. It happened that Paola Hod, named Maestral, cast loose at her own whim early from the security of Pappy Hod's bed, and late from the half-home of the sailor's grave, was now in a state of shock which endowed Profane with all manner of healing and sympathetic talents he didn't really possess. You're all I have, she warned him. Be good to me. They would sit around a table in Teflon's kitchen. 
Pig Bodine and Dewey Gland facing them, one each like partners at bridge, a vodka bottle in the middle. Nobody would talk except to argue about what they would mix the vodka with next, when what they had ran out. That week they tried milk, canned vegetable soup, finally the juice from a dried-up piece of watermelon which was all Teflon had left in the refrigerator. Try to squeeze a watermelon into a small tumbler sometime when your reflexes are not so good. It is next to impossible. Picking the seeds out of the vodka proved also to be a problem, and resulted in a growing mutual ill will. Part of the trouble was that Peg and Dewey both had eyes for Paola. Every night they would approach Profane as a committee and ask for seconds. She's trying to recover from men, Profane tried to say. Pig would either reject this or take it as an insult to Pappy Hod, his old superior. The truth of it was... Profane wasn't getting any, though it became hard to tell what Paola wanted. What do you mean, Profane said, be good to you. What Pappy Hod wasn't, she said. He soon gave up trying to decode her several hankerings. She would on occasion come up with all sorts of weird tales of infidelity, punchings in the mouth, drunken abuse. Having clamped down, chipped, wire-brushed, painted, and chipped again under Pappy Hod for four years— Profane would believe about half. Half because a woman is only half of something there are usually two sides to. She taught them all a song, learned from a para on French leave from the fighting in Algeria. Demain le noir matin, je fermerai la porte. On est des années mortes. J'irai par les chemins. Je mendierai ma vie. Sur la terre et sur l'onde, Du vieux au nouveau monde. He had been short and built like the island of Malta itself. Rock, an inscrutable heart. She'd had only one night with him, then he was off to the Piraeus. Tomorrow, the black morning, I close the door in the face of the dead years. I will go on the road, bum my way over land and sea from the old to the new world. She taught. Dewey glammed the cord changes, and so they all sat around the table of Teflon's wintry kitchen, while four gas flames on the stove ate up their oxygen, and sang and sang. When Profane watched her eyes, he thought she dreamed of the para, probably a man of no politics, as brave as anyone ever is in combat, but tired, was all tired of relocating native villages and devising barbarities in the morning, as brutal as had come from the FLN the night before. She wore a miraculous medal round her neck, given to her maybe by some random sailor she reminded of a good Catholic girl back in the States where sex is for free, or for marriage. What sort of Catholic was she? Profane, who was only half Catholic, mother Jewish, whose morality was fragmentary, being derived from experience and not much of it, wondered what quaint Jesuit arguments had led her to come away with him, refuse to share a bed, but still ask him to be good. The night before New Year's Eve, they wandered away from the kitchen and out to a kosher delicatessen a few blocks away. On returning to Teflon's, they found Pig and Dewey gone. Gone out to get drunk, said the note. The place was lit up all Christmassy. A radio turned to WAVY and Pat Boone in one bedroom. Sounds of objects being thrown in another. Somehow the young couple had wandered into a darkened room with this bed in it. No, she said, meaning yes. Groan went to bed before either of them knew it. Click went Teflon's Leica. Profane did what was expected of him, came roaring off the bed, arm terminating in a fist. Teflon dodged it easily. Now, now, he chuckled. Outraged privacy was not so important, but the interruption had come just before the big moment. You don't mind, Teflon was telling him. Paola was hurrying into clothes. Out in the snow, Profane said, is where that camera, Teflon, is sending us. Here, opened the camera, handed Profane the film. You're going to be a horse's ass about it. Profane took the film but couldn't back down, so he dressed and topped off with the cowboy hat. Paola had put on a navy greatcoat too big for her. Out, Profane cried, in the snow. Which, in fact, there was. They caught a ferry over to Norfolk and sat topside drinking black coffee out of paper cups and watching snow shrouds flap silent against the big windows.
There was nothing else to look at but a bomb on a bench facing them, and each other. The engine thumped and labored down below. They could feel it through their buttocks, but neither could think of anything to say. Did you want to stay? he asked. No, no, she shivered, a discreet foot of worn bench between them. He had no impulse to bring her closer. Whatever you decide. Madonna, he thought, I have a dependent now. What are you shivering for? It's warm enough in here. She shook her head no, whatever that meant, staring at the toes of her galoshes. After a while, Profane got up and went out on deck. Snow falling lazy on the water made 11 p.m. look like twilight or an eclipse. Overhead, every few seconds, a horn sounded off to warn away anything on collision course. But yet, as if there were nothing in this roads after all but ships, untenanted, inanimate, making noises at each other, which meant nothing more than the turbulence of the screws or the snow hiss on the water, and profane all alone in it. Some of us are afraid of dying, others of human loneliness. Profane was afraid of land or seascapes like this, where nothing else lived but himself. It seemed he was always walking into one, turn a corner in the street, open a door to a weather deck, and there he'd be in alien country. But the door behind him opened again. Soon he felt Paola's gloveless hands slipped under his arms, her cheek against his back. His mental eye withdrew, watching their still life as a stranger might. But she didn't help the scene be any less alien. They kept like that till the other side. The ferry entered the slip, and chains clanked, car ignitions whined, motors started. They rode the bus into town wordless. A lit near the Monticello Hotel and set out for East Main to find Pig and Dewey. The sailor's grave was dark the first time Profane could remember. The cops must have closed it up. They found Pig next door in Chester's Hillbilly Haven. Dewey was sitting in with the band. Party, party, cried Pig. Some dozen ex-scaffold sailors wanted a reunion. Pig, appointing himself social chairman, decided on the Susanna Squaducci, an Italian luxury liner now in the last stages of construction in the Newport News yards. Back to Newport News? Deciding not to tell Pig about the disagreement with Teflon. So, yo-yoing again. This has got to cease, he said, but nobody was listening. Pig was off dancing the dirty boogie with Paola. Three. Profane slept that night at Pig's place down by the old ferry docks, and he slept alone. Paola had run into one of the Beatrices and gone off to stay the night with her after promising demurely to be Profane's date at the New Year's party. Around three, Profane woke up on the kitchen floor with a headache. Night air, bitter cold, seeped under the door, and from somewhere outside he could hear a low, persistent growl. Pig, Profane croaked. Where you keep the aspirin? No answer. Profane stumbled into the other room. Pig wasn't there. The growl outside turned more ominous. Profane went to the window and saw Pig down in the alley, sitting on his motorcycle and racing the engine. Snow fell in tiny, glittering pinpoints. The alley held its own curious snow light, turning Pig to black and white clowns motley, and ancient brick walls dusted with snow to neutral gray. Pig had on a knitted watch cap pulled down over his face to the neck so that his head showed up as a sphere of dead black. Engine exhaust roiled in clouds around him. Profane shivered. What are you doing, Pig? he called. Pig didn't answer. The enigma or sinister vision of Pig and that Harley Davidson alone in an alley at three in the morning reminded Profane too suddenly of Rachel whom he didn't want to think about, not tonight, in the bitter cold, with a headache, with snow slipping into the room. Rachel Owlglass had owned, back in 54, this M.G., her daddy's gift. After giving it its shakedown cruise in the region around Grand Central, where daddy's office was, familiarizing it with telephone poles, fire hydrants, and occasional pedestrians, she brought the car up to the Catskills for the summer. Here... 
Little, sulky, and voluptuous Rachel would G and haw this MG around Route 17's bloodthirsty curves and cutbacks, sashaying its arrogant butt past hay wagons, growling semis, old Ford roadsters filled to capacity with crew-cut undergraduate gnomes. Profane was just out of the Navy and working that summer as assistant salad man at Schlotzauer's Trocadero, nine miles outside Liberty, New York. His chief was one Dakonu, a mad Brazilian who wanted to go fight Arabs in Israel. One night near the opening of the season, a drunken Marine had showed up in the Fiesta Lounge or bar of the Trocadero, carrying a thirty caliber machine gun in his AWOL bag. He wasn't too sure how he had come by the weapon exactly. Dakonu preferred to think it had been smuggled out of Paris Island piece by piece, which was how the Haganah would do it. After a deal of arguing with the bartender, who also wanted the gun, Dakonu finally triumphed, swapping for it three artichokes and an eggplant. To the mezuzah nailed up over the vegetable reefer and the Zionist banner hanging in back of the salad table, Dakonu added this prize. During the weeks that followed, when the head chef was looking the other way, Dakonu would assemble his machine gun, camouflage it with iceberg lettuce, watercress, and Belgian endive, and mock strafe the guests assembled in the dining room. Yibble, 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 he would go, squinting malevolent along the sights. Got you dead center, Abdul Said, yibble, yibble, Muslim pig. Dakonu's machine gun was the only one in the world that went yibble, yibble. He would sit up past four in the morning, cleaning it, dreaming of lunar-looking deserts, the sizzle of Chang music, Yemenite girls whose delicate heads were covered with white kerchiefs, whose loins ached with love. He wondered how American Jews could sit vainglorious in that dining room, meal after meal, while only halfway round the world the desert shifted relentless over corpses of their own. How could he tell soulless stomachs, harangue with oil and vinegar, supplicate with heart of palm? The only voice he had was the machine guns. Could they hear that? Can stomachs listen? No. And you never hear the one that gets you, aimed perhaps at any alimentary canal in a heart Schaffner and Mark's suit, which vented lewd gurgles at the waitresses who passed. That gun was an object only, pointing where any suitable unbalanced force might direct it. But which belt buckle was Dakonu taking a lead on? Abdul Said, the alimentary canal himself? Why ask? He knew no more than that he was a Zionist, suffered, was confused, was daft to stand rooted sock top deep in the loam of any kibbutz a hemisphere away. Profane had wondered then what it was with Dakonu and that machine gun. Love for an object, this was new to him. When he found out not long after this that the same thing was with Rachel and her M.G., he had his first intelligence that something had been going on under the rose, maybe for longer and with more people than he would care to think about. He met her through the M.G. like everyone else met her. It nearly ran him over. He was wandering out the back door of the kitchen one noon, carrying a garbage can overflowing with lettuce leaves Dakonu considered substandard, when somewhere off to his right he heard the M.G.'s sinister growl. Profane kept walking, secure in a faith that burdened pedestrians have the right of way. Next thing he knew, he was clipped in the rear end by the car's right fender. Fortunately, it was only moving at five miles per hour, not fast enough to break anything, only to send profane garbage can and lettuce leaves flying ass over tea kettle in a great green shower. He and Rachel, both covered with lettuce leaves, looked at each other wary. How romantic, she said. For all I know, you may be the man of my dreams. Take that lettuce leaf off your face so I can see. Like doffing a cap, remembering his place, he removed the leaf. No, she said, you're not him. Maybe, said Profane, we can try it next time with a fig leaf. Ha ha, she said and roared off. He found a rake and started collecting the garbage into one pile. He reflected that here was another inanimate object that had nearly killed him. He was not sure whether he meant Rachel or the car. 
He put the pile of lettuce leaves in the garbage can and dumped the can back of the parking lot in a small ravine which served the Trocadero for a refuse pile. As he was returning to the kitchen, Rachel came by again. The M.G.'s adenoidal exhaust sounded like it probably could be heard all the way to Liberty. Come for a ride, hey, fatso, she called out. Profane reckoned he could. It was a couple hours before he had to go in to set up for supper. Five minutes out on Route 17, he decided if he ever got back to the Trocadero unmaimed and alive to forget about Rachel and only be interested thenceforth in quiet, pedestrian girls. She drove like one of the damned on holiday. He had no doubt she knew the cars and her own abilities, but how did she know, for instance, when she passed on a blind curve of that two-lane road, that the milk truck approaching would be just far enough away for her to whip back into line with a whole sixteenth of an inch to spare? He was too afraid for his life to be, as he normally was, girl-shy. He reached over, opened her pocketbook, found a cigarette, lit it. She didn't notice. She drove single-minded and unaware there was anyone next to her. She only spoke once to tell him there was a case of cold beer in the back. He dragged on her cigarette and wondered if he had a compulsion to suicide. It seemed sometimes that he put himself deliberately in the way of hostile objects, as if he were looking to get schlamozzled out of existence. Why was he here, anyway? Because Rachel had a nice ass? He glanced sidewise at it on the leather upholstery bouncing, synced with the car, watched the not-so-simple nor quite harmonic motion of her left breast inside the black sweater she had on. She pulled in finally at an abandoned rock quarry. Irregular chunks of stone were scattered around. He didn't know what kind, but it was all inanimate. They made it up a dirt road to a flat place forty feet above the floor of the quarry. It was an uncomfortable afternoon. Sun beat down out of a cloudless, unprotective heaven. Profane, fat, sweated. Rachel played Do You Know, the few kids she'd known who went to his high school, and Profane lost. She talked about all the dates she was getting this summer, all it seemed with upperclassmen attending Ivy League colleges. Profane would agree from time to time how wonderful it was. She talked about Bennington, her alma mater. She talked about herself. Rachel came from the five towns on the south shore of Long Island, an area comprising Malvern, Lawrence, Cedarhurst, Hewlett, and Woodmere, and sometimes Long Beach and Atlantic Beach, though no one has ever thought of calling it the seven towns. Though the inhabitants are not Sephardim, the area seems afflicted with a kind of geographical incest. Daughters are constrained to pace demure and dark-eyed like so many Rapunzels within the magic frontiers of a country where the elfin architecture of Chinese restaurants, seafood palaces, and split-level synagogues is often enchanting as the sea. Until they have ripened enough to be sent off to the mountains and colleges of the Northeast, not to hunt husbands, for a certain parity is always obtained in the five towns, whereby a nice boy can be predestined for husband as early as age sixteen or seventeen, but to be granted the illusion, at least, of having played the field so necessary to a girl's emotional development. Only the brave escape. Come Sunday nights with golfing done, the Negro maids, having rectified the disorder of last night's party, off to visit with relatives in Lawrence, and Ed Sullivan still hours away, the blood of this kingdom exit from their enormous homes, enter their automobiles, and proceed to the business districts, there to divert themselves among seemingly endless vistas of butterfly shrimp and egg foo young. Orientals bow and smile and flutter through summer's twilight, and in their voices are the birds of summer. And with night's fall comes a brief promenade in the street, the torso of the father solid and sure in its J-press suit, the eyes of the daughters secret behind sunglasses rimmed in rhinestones, and as the jaguar has given its name to the mother's car, so has it given its skin pattern to the slacks which compass her sleek hips. Who could escape? Who could want to? Rachel wanted. 
Profane, having repaired roads around the five towns, could understand why. By the time the sun was going down, they'd nearly finished the case between them. Profane was balefully drunk. He got out of the car, wandered off behind a tree, and pointed west, with some intention of pissing on the sun to put it out for good and all, this being somehow important for him. Inanimate objects could do what they wanted. Not what they wanted, because things do not want, only men. But things do what they do, and this is why Profane was pissing at the sun. It went down, as if he'd extinguished it after all, and continued on immortal, god of a darkened world. Rachel was watching him, curious. He zipped up and staggered back to the beer box. Two cans left. He opened them and handed one to her. I put the sun out, he said. We drink to it. He spilled most of it down his shirt. Two more folded cans fell to the bottom of the quarry. The empty case followed. She hadn't moved from the car. Benny? One fingernail touched his face. What? Will you be my friend? You look like you have enough. She looked down the quarry. Why don't we make believe none of the other is real, she said. No Bennington, no Schlotzauers, and no five towns. Only this quarry, the dead rocks that were here before us and will be after us. Why? Isn't that the world? They teach you that in freshman geology or something? She looked hurt. It's just something I know. Benny, she cried, a little cry. Be my friend is all. He shrugged. Right. Now don't expect how the road is. Your boy's road that I'll never see with its diesels and dust. Roadhouses, crossroads, saloons, that's all. What it's like west of Ithaca and south of Princeton. Places I won't know. He scratched his stomach. Sure. Profane kept running into her in what was left of the summer at least once a day. They talked in the car always, he trying to find the key to her own ignition behind the hooded eyes, she sitting back of the right-hand steering wheel and talking, talking, nothing but M.G. words, inanimate words he couldn't really talk back at. Soon enough, what he was afraid would happen happened. He finagled himself into love for Rachel— and was only surprised that it had taken so long. He lay in the bunkhouse nights, smoking in the dark and apostrophizing the glowing end of his cigarette butt. Around two in the morning, the occupant of the upper bunk would come in off the night shift, one Duke Wedge, a pimpled bravo from the Chelsea district, who always wanted to talk about how much he was getting, which was, in fact, plenty. It lulled profane to sleep. One night he did indeed come upon Rachel and Wedge, the scoundrel, parked in the M.G. in front of her cabin. He slunk back to bed, not feeling particularly betrayed, because he knew Wedge wouldn't get anywhere. He even stayed awake and let Wedge regale him when he came in with a step-by-step -step account of how he had almost made it, but not quite. As usual, Profane fell asleep in the middle. He never got beyond or behind the chatter about her world— one of objects coveted or valued, an atmosphere profane couldn't breathe. The last time he saw her was Labor Day night. She was to leave the next day. Somebody stole Dakonu's machine gun that evening, just before supper. Dakonu dashed around in tears, looking for it. The head chef told Profane to make salads. Somehow Profane managed to get frozen strawberries in the French dressing— and chopped liver in the Waldorf salad, plus accidentally dropping two dozen or so radishes in the French fryer. Though these drew raves from the customers when he served them anyway, too lazy to go after more. From time to time the Brazilian would come charging through the kitchen, crying. He never found his beloved machine gun. Lorn and drained, nervous, he was fired next day. The season was over anyway, for all profane knew, Dakonu may have even taken ship one day for Israel, to tinker with the guts of some tractor trying to forget, like many exhausted workers abroad, some love back in the States. After teardown, Profane set out to find Rachel. 
She was out, he was informed, with the captain of the Harvard crossbow team. Profane wandered by the bunkhouse and found a morose wedge, unusually mateless for the evening. Till midnight they played blackjack for all the contraceptives Wedge had not used over the summer. These numbered about a hundred. Profane borrowed fifty and had a winning streak. When he'd cleaned Wedge out, Wedge dashed away to borrow more. He was back five minutes later shaking his head. Nobody believed me. Profane loaned him a few. At midnight, Profane informed Wedge he was thirty in the hole. Wedge made an appropriate comment. Profane gathered up the pile of rubbers. Wedge pounded his head against the table. He'll never use them, he said to the table. That's the bitch of it, never in his lifetime. Profane wandered up by Rachel's cabin again. He heard splashing and gurgling from the courtyard and back and walked around to investigate. There she was washing her car, in the middle of the night yet. Moreover, she was talking to it. You beautiful stud, he heard her say. I love to touch you. Wah, he thought. Do you know what I feel when we're out on the road, alone, just us? She was running the sponge caressingly over its front bumper. Your funny responses, darling, that I know so well. The way your brakes pull a little to the left. The way you start to shudder around 5,000 RPM when you're excited. And you burn oil when you're mad at me, don't you? I know. There was none of your madness in her voice. It might have been a schoolgirl's game, though still, he admitted, quaint. We'll always be together, running a chamois over the hood. And you needn't worry about that black Buick we passed on the road today. Ugh. Fat, greasy mafia car. I expected to see a body come flying out the back door, didn't you? Besides, you're so angular and proper English and tweedy and, oh, so ivy that I couldn't ever leave you, dear. It occurred to Profane that he might vomit. Public displays of sentiment often affected him this way. She had climbed in the car and now lay back in the driver's seat, her throat open to the summer constellations. He was about to approach her when he saw her left hand snake out all pale to fondle the gear shift. He watched and noticed how she was touching it. Having just been with Wedge, he got the connection. He didn't want to see any more. He ambled away over a hill and into the woods, and when he got back to the Trocadero, he couldn't have said exactly where he'd been walking. All the cabins were dark. The front office was still open. The clerk had stepped out. Profane rooted around in desk drawers till he found a box of thumbtacks. He returned to the cabins, and till three in the morning he moved along the starlit aisles between them, tacking up one of Wedge's contraceptives on each door. No one interrupted him. He felt like the angel of death marking the doors of tomorrow's victims in blood. The purpose of a mezuzah was to fake the angel out so he'd pass by. On these hundred or so cabins, Profane didn't see mezuzah one. So much the worse. After the summer, then, there'd been letters, his surly and full of wrong words, hers by turns witty, desperate, passionate. A year later, she'd graduated from Bennington and come to New York to work as a receptionist in an employment agency, and so he'd seen her in New York once or twice when he passed through. And though they only thought about one another at random, though her yo-yo hand was usually busy at other things, now and again would come the invisible umbilical tug like tonight, mnemonic, arousing, and he would wonder how much his own man he was. One thing he had to give her credit for, she'd never called it a relationship. What is it then, hey? he'd asked once. A secret, with her small child smile, which, like Rogers and Hammerstein in three-quarter time, rendered profane fluttery and gelatinous. She visited him occasionally, as now at night, like a succubus, coming in with the snow. There was no way he knew to keep either out. 4. As it turned out, the New Year's party was to end all yo-yoing, at least for a time. The reunion descended on Susanna Squaducci, conned the night watchman with a bottle of wine, 
and allowed a party from a destroyer in dry dock, after some preliminary brawling, to come aboard. Paola stuck close at first to Profane, who had eyes for a voluptuous lady in some sort of fur coat, who claimed to be an admiral's wife. There was a portable radio, noisemakers, wine, wine. Dewey Gland decided to climb a mast. The mast had just been painted, but Dewey climbed on, turning more zebra-like the higher he went, guitar dangling below him. When he got to the cross trees, Dewey sat down, plonked on the guitar, and began to sing in hillbilly dialect, Depuis que je suis né, j'ai vu mourir des pères. J'ai vu partir des frères et des enfants pleurer. The para again. Who haunted this week? Since I was born, said he, I've seen fathers die, brothers go away, little kids cry. What was that airborne boy's problem? Profane asked her the first time she translated it for him. Who hasn't seen that? It happens for other reasons besides war. Why blame war? I was born in a Hooverville before the war. That's it, Palis said. Je suis né. Being born. That's all you have to do. Dewey's voice sounded like part of the inanimate wind, so high overhead. What had happened to Guy Lombardo and Old Lang Syne? At one minute into 1956, Dewey was down on deck, and Profane was up, straddling a spar, looking down at Pig and the Admiral's wife, copulating directly below. A seagull swooped in out of the snow's sky, circled, lit on the spar a foot from Profane's hand. Yo, Seagull, said Profane. Seagull didn't answer. Oh, man, Profane said to the knight. I like to see young people get together. He scanned the main deck. Paola had disappeared. All at once things erupted. There was a siren, too, out in the street. Cars came roaring onto the pier, gray Chevys with U.S. Navy written on the sides. Spotlights came on, little men in white hats and black and yellow SP armbands milled around on the pier. Three alert revelers ran along the port side throwing gangplanks into the water. A sound truck joined the vehicles on the dock, whose number was growing almost to a full-sized motor pool. All right, you men. Fifty watts of disembodied voice began to bellow. All right, you men. That was about all it had to say. The admiral's wife started shrieking about how it was her husband, caught up with her at last. Two or three spotlights pinned them where they lay in burning sin. Pig, trying to get the thirteen buttons on his blues into the right buttonholes, which is nearly impossible when you're in a hurry. Cheers and laughter from the pier. Some of the SPs were coming across rat fashion on the mooring lines. Ex-scaffold sailors roused from sleep below decks came stumbling up the ladders while Dewey yelled, Now stand by to repel boarders, and waved his guitar like a cutlass. Profane watched it all and half worried about Paola. He looked for her, but the spotlights kept moving around, screwing up the illumination on the main deck. It started to snow again. Suppose, said Profane to the seagull, who was blinking at him, suppose I was God. He inched onto the platform and lay on his stomach with nose, eyes, and cowboy hat sticking over the edge like a horizontal Kilroy. If I was God, he pointed at an SP. Zap, SP, your ass has had it. The SP kept on at what he'd been doing, battering a 250-pound fire controlman named Patsy Pagano in the stomach with a nightstick. The motor pool on the pier was augmented by a cattle car, which is navy for paddy wagon or black Mariah. Zap, said Profane. Cattle car, keep going and drive off the end of the pier, which it almost did but braked in time. Patsy Pagano, grow wings and fly out of here but a final clobber sent Patsy down for good. The SP left him where he was. It would take six men to move him. What's the matter? Profane wondered. The seabird, bored with all this, took off in the direction of N.O.B. Maybe, Profane thought, God is supposed to be more positive instead of throwing thunderbolts all the time. Carefully, he pointed a finger. 
Dewey Gland, sing them that Algerian pacifist song. Dewey, now astride a lifeline on the bridge, gave a bass string intro and began to sing blue suede shoes after Elvis Presley. Profane flopped over on his back, blinking up into the snow. Well, almost, he said, to the gone bird, to the snow. He put the hat over his face, closed his eyes, and soon was asleep. Noise below diminished. Bodies were carried off, stacked in the cattle car. The sound truck, after several bursts of feedback noise, was switched off and driven away. Spotlights went out, sirens dopplered away in the direction of shore patrol headquarters. Profane woke up early in the morning covered with a thin layer of snow and feeling the onset of a bad cold. He blundered down the ladder's ice-covered rungs, slipping about every other step. The ship was deserted. He headed below decks to get warm. Again, he was in the guts of something inanimate. Noise a few decks below. Night watchman, most likely. You can't ever be alone, Profane mumbled, tiptoeing along a passageway. He spotted a mousetrap on deck, picked it up carefully, and heaved it down the passageway. It hit a bulkhead and went off with a loud snap. Sound of the footsteps quit abruptly, then started again, more cautious, moved under Profane and up a ladder toward where the mousetrap lay. Ha ha, said Profane. He sneaked around a corner found another mouse trap and dropped it down a companionway. Snap! Footsteps went pattering back down the ladder. Four mouse traps later, Profane found himself in the galley where the watchman had set up a primitive coffee mess. Figuring the watchman would be confused for a few minutes, Profane set a pot of water to boil on the hot plate. Hey! yelled the watchman two decks above. Uh-oh, said Profane. A sneaky peated out of the galley and went looking for more mouse traps. He found one up on the next deck, stepped outside, lobbed it up in an invisible arc. If nothing else, he was saving mice. There was a muffled snap and a scream from above. My coffee, Profane muttered, taking the steps down two at a time. He threw a handful of grounds into the boiling water and slipped out the other side, nearly running into the night watchman, who was stalking along with a mousetrap hanging off his left sleeve. It was close enough so Profane could see the patient, martyred look on this watchman's face. Watchman entered the galley and Profane was off. He made it up three decks before he heard the bellowing from the galley. What now? He wandered into a passageway lined with empty staterooms found a piece of chalk left by a welder, wrote, Screw the Susanna Squaducci, and down with all you rich bastards on the bulkhead, signed it the Phantom, and felt better. Who'd be sailing off to Italy in this thing? Chairman of the board, movie stars, deported racketeers, maybe. Tonight, profane purred, tonight, Susanna, you belong to me. His to mark up, to set mouse traps off in more than any paid passenger would ever do for her. He moseyed along the passageway, collecting mousetraps. Outside the galley again, he started throwing them in all directions. Ha-ha, said the night watchman. Go ahead, make noise. I'm drinking your coffee. So he was. Profane absently hefted his one remaining mousetrap. It went off, catching three fingers between the first and second knuckles. What do I do, he wondered. Scream? No. The night watchman was laughing hard enough as it was. Setting his teeth, Profane unfried the trap from his hand, reset it, tossed it through a porthole to the galley, and fled. It reached the pier and got a snowball in the back of the head, which knocked off the cowboy hat. He stooped to get the hat and thought about returning the shot. No. He kept running. Paola was at the ferry, waiting. She took his arm as they went on board. All he said was, we ever going to get off this ferry? You have snow on you. She reached up to brush it off, and he almost kissed her. Cold was turning the mousetrap injury numb. Wind had started up coming in from Norfolk. This crossing, they stayed inside. Rachel caught up with him in the bus station in Norfolk. He sat slouched next to Paola, 
on a wooden bench worn pallid and greasy with a generation of random duffs, two one-way tickets for New York, New York, tucked inside the cowboy hat. He had his eyes closed. He was trying to sleep. He had just begun to drift off when the paging system called his name. He knew immediately, even before he was fully awake, who it must be. Just a hunch. He had been thinking about her. Dear Benny, Rachel said, I've called every bus station in the country. He could hear a party on in the background. New Year's night. Where he was, there was only an old clock to tell the time, and a dozen homeless slouched on the wooden bench trying to sleep, waiting for a long-haul bus run neither by Greyhound nor Trailways. He watched them and let her talk. She was saying, come home. The only one he would allow to tell him this, except for an internal voice he would rather disown as prodigal than listen to. You know, he tried to say, I'll send you bus fare. She would. A hollow, twanging sound dragged across the floor toward him. Dewey gland, morose and all bones, trailed his guitar behind him. Profane interrupted her gently. Here is my friend Dewey gland, he said, almost whispering. He would like to sing you a little song. Dewey sang her the old depression song, Wandering. Eels in the ocean, eels in the sea. A red-headed woman made a fool of me. Rachel's hair was red, veined with premature grey, so long she could take it and back with one hand, lift it above her head and let it fall forward over her long eyes, which for a girl four feet ten inches in stocking feet is a ridiculous gesture or should be. He felt that invisible umbilical string tug at his midsection. He thought of long fingers through which maybe he might catch sight of the blue sky once in a while. And it looks like I'm never going to cease. She wants you, Dewey said. The girl at the information desk was frowning. Big boned, motley complexion, girl from out of town somewhere whose eyes dreamed of grinning Buick grills, Friday night shuffleboard at some roadhouse. I want you, Rachel said. He moved his chin across the mouthpiece, making grating sounds with a three-day growth. He thought that all the way up north, along a five-hundred-mile length of underground phone cable, there must be earthworms, blind troll folk listening in. Trolls know a lot of magic. Could they change words, do vocal imitations? Will you just drift, then? she said. Behind her... He heard somebody barfing and those who watched laughing hysterically. Jazz on the record player. He wanted to say, God, the things we want. He said, How is the party? It's over at Raoul's, she said. Raoul Slab and Melvin being part of a crowd of disaffected which someone had labeled the whole sick crew. They lived half their time in a bar on the lower west side called the Rusty Spoon. He thought of the sailor's grave and could not see much difference. Benny. She had never cried, never that he could remember. It worried him. But she might be faking. Ciao, she said. That phony Greenwich Village way to avoid saying goodbye. He hung up. There's a nice fight on, Dewey Gland said, sullen and red-eyed. Old Ploy is so juiced he went and bit a marine on the ass. If you look from the side at a planet swinging around in its orbit, split the sun with a mirror and imagine a string, it all looks like a yo-yo. The point furthest from the sun is called a philion. The point furthest from the yo-yo hand is called, by analogy, aperture. Profane and Paola left for New York that night. Dewey Gland went back to the ship, and Profane never saw him again. Pig had taken off on the Harley, destination unknown. On the Greyhound were one young couple who would come sleep for the other passengers, make it in a rear seat. One pencil sharpener salesman, who had seen every territory in the country and could give you interesting information on any city, no matter which one you happened to be heading for and four infants, 
each with an incompetent mother, scattered at strategic locations throughout the bus, who babbled, cooed, vomited, practiced self-asphyxia, drooled. At least one managed to be screaming all through the twelve-hour trip. About the time they hit Maryland, Profane decided to get it over with. Not that I'm trying to get rid of you, handing her a ticket envelope with Rachel's address on it in pencil, but I don't know how long I'll be in the city. He didn't. She nodded. Are you in love, then? She's a good woman. She'll put you on to a job, find you a place to stay. Don't ask me if we're in love. The word doesn't mean anything. Here's her address. You can take the West Side IRT right up there. What are you afraid of? Go to sleep. She did on Profane's shoulder. At the 34th Street station in New York, he gave her a brief salute. I may be around, but I hope not. It's complicated. Shall I tell her? She'll know. That's the trouble. There's nothing you, I, can tell her she doesn't know. Call me, Ben. Please. Maybe. Right, he told her. Maybe. Five. So in January 1956, Benny Profane showed up again in New York. He came into town at the tag end of a spell of false spring, found a mattress at a downtown flop house called Our Home, and a newspaper at an uptown kiosk. Roamed around the streets late that night, studying the classified by streetlight. As usual, nobody wanted him in particular. If anybody had been around to remember him, they would have noticed right off that Profane hadn't changed. Still, a great amoeba-like boy, soft and fat, hair cropped close and growing in patches, eyes small like a pig's and set too far apart. Roadwork had done nothing to improve the outward profane, or the inward one either. Though the street had claimed a big fraction of profane's age, it and he remained strangers in every way. Streets, roads, circles, squares, places, prospects, had taught him nothing. He couldn't work a transit, crane, payloader, couldn't lay bricks, stretch a tape right, Hold an elevation rod still, hadn't even learned to drive a car. He walked. Walked, he thought sometimes, the aisles of a bright, gigantic supermarket, his only function, to want. One morning Profane woke up early, couldn't get back to sleep, and decided on a whim to spend the day like a yo-yo, shuttling on the subway back and forth underneath 42nd Street, from Times Square to Grand Central, and vice versa. He made his way to the washroom of our home, tripping over two empty mattresses en route. Cut himself shaving, had trouble extracting the blade, and gashed a finger. He took a shower to get rid of the blood. The handles wouldn't turn. When he finally found a shower that worked, the water came out hot and cold in random patterns. He danced around, yowling and shivering, slipped on a bar of soap, and nearly broke his neck. Drying off, he ripped a frayed towel in half, rendering it useless. He put on his skivvy shirt backwards, took ten minutes getting his fly zipped, and another fifteen repairing a shoelace which had broken as he was tying it. All the rest of his morning songs were silent cuss words. It wasn't that he was tired or even notably uncoordinated, only something that, being a schlemiel, he'd known for years. Inanimate objects and he... Could not live in peace. Profane took a Lexington Avenue local up to Grand Central. As it happened, the subway car he got into was filled with all manner of ravishingly gorgeous knockouts, secretaries en route to work and jailbait to school. It was too much, too much. Profane hung on the hand grip, weak. He was visited on a lunar basis by these great, unspecific waves of horniness whereby all women within a certain age group and figure envelope became immediately and impossibly desirable. He emerged from these spells with eyeballs still oscillating and a wish that his neck could rotate through the full 360 degrees. The shuttle after morning rush hour is near empty, like a littered beach after tourists have all gone home. 
in the hours between nine and noon, the permanent residents come creeping back up their strand, shy and tentative. Since sunup, all manner of affluent have filled the limits of that world with a sense of summer and life. Now sleeping bombs and old ladies on relief, who have been there all along unnoticed, re-establish a kind of property right and the coming on of a falling season. On his eleventh or twelfth transit, Profane fell asleep and dreamed. He was awakened close to noon by three Puerto Rican kids named Tolito, Jose, and Cook, short for Cucarachito. They had this act, which was for money, even though they knew that the subway on weekday mornings noise bueno for dancing in bongos. Jose carried around a coffee can, which upside down served to rattle off their raving merengues, or bayons on, and hollow side up to receive from an appreciative audience pennies, transit tokens, chewing gum, spit. Profane blinked awake and watched them jazzing around, doing handsprings, aping courtship. They swung from the handle grips, shimmied up the poles, Toledo tossing Cook, the seven-year-old, about the car like a beanbag, and behind it all, clobbering polyrhythmic to the racketing of the shuttle, Jose on his tin drum, forearms and hands vibrating out beyond the persistence of vision, and a tireless smile across his teeth, wide as the west side. They passed the can as the train was pulling into Times Square. Profane closed his eyes before they got to him, and they sat on the seat opposite, counting the take, feet dangling. Cook was in the middle, and the other two were trying to push him on the floor. Two teenage boys from their neighborhood entered the car, black chinos, black shirts, black gang jackets with playboys lettered in dripping red on the back. Abruptly, all motion among the three on the seat stopped. They held each other, staring wide-eyed. Cook, the baby, could hold nothing in. Maricon, he yelled gleefully. Profane's eyes came open. Heel taps of the older boys moved past, aloof and staccato, to the next car. Toledo put his hand on Cook's head, trying to squash him down through the floor, out of sight. Cook slipped away. The doors closed. The shuttle started off again for Grand Central. The three turned their attention to Profane. Hey, man, Cook said. Profane watched him, half cautious. How come, Jose said. He put the coffee can absently on his head, where it slipped down over his ears. How come you didn't get off at Times Square? He was asleep, Toledo said. He's a yo-yo, Jose said. Wait and see. They forgot Profane for the moment, moved forward a car and did their routine. They came back as the train was starting off again from Grand Central. See, Jose said. Hey, man, Cook said. How come? You out of a job, Toledo said. Why don't you hunt alligators like my brother, Cook said. Cook's brother shoots them with a shotgun, Toledo said. If you need a job, you should hunt alligators, Jose said. Profane scratched his stomach. He looked at the floor. Is it steady? He said. The subway pulled into Times Square. Disgorged passengers took more on, shut up its doors, and shrieked away down the tunnel. Another shuttle came in on a different track. Bodies milled in the brown light. A loudspeaker announced shuttles. It was lunch hour. The subway station began to buzz, fill with human noise and motion. Tourists were coming back in droves. Another train arrived, opened, closed, was gone. The press on the wooden platforms grew, along with an air of discomfort, hunger, uneasy bladders, suffocation. The first shuttle returned. Among the crowd that squeezed inside this time was a young girl wearing a black coat, her hair hanging long outside it. She searched four cars before she found Cook sitting next to Profane, watching him. He wants to help Anhale kill the alligators, Cook told her. Profane was asleep, lying diagonal on the seat. In his dream, he was all alone as usual, walking on a street at night where there was nothing but his own field of vision alive. It had to be night on that street. 
The lights gleamed unflickering on hydrants, manhole covers which lay around in the street. There were neon signs scattered here and there, spelling out words he wouldn't remember when he woke. Somehow it was all tied up with a story he'd heard once about a boy born with a golden screw where his navel should have been. For twenty years he consults doctors and specialists all over the world, trying to get rid of this screw and having no success. Finally, in Haiti, he runs into a voodoo doctor who gives him a foul-smelling potion. He drinks it, goes to sleep, and has a dream. In this dream, he finds himself on a street lit by green lamps. Following the witch man's instructions, he takes two rights and a left from his point of origin, finds a tree growing by the seventh streetlight, hung all over with colored balloons. On the fourth limb from the top there is a red balloon, he breaks it, and inside is a screwdriver with a yellow plastic handle. With the screwdriver, he removes the screw from his stomach, and as soon as this happens, he wakes from the dream. It is morning. He looks down toward his navel. The screw is gone. That twenty years curse is lifted at last. Delirious with joy, he leaps out of bed, and his ass falls off. To profane, alone in the street, it would always seem maybe he was looking for something, too, to make the fact of his own disassembly plausible as that of any machine. It was always at this point that the fear started, here that it would turn into a nightmare. Because now, if he kept going down that street, not only his ass, but also his arms, legs, sponge, brain, and clock of a heart must be left behind to litter the pavement, be scattered among manhole covers. Was it home, the mercury-lit street? Was he returning like the elephant to his graveyard to lie down and soon become ivory in whose bulk slept latent, exquisite shapes of chessmen, back-scratchers, hollow, open-work Chinese spheres nested one inside the other? This was all there was to dream, all there ever was, the street. Soon he woke, having found no screwdriver, no key. Woke to a girl's face near his own. Kook stood in the background, feet braced apart, head hanging. From two cars away, riding above the racketing of the subway over its points, came the metallic rattle of Toledo on the coffee can. Her face was young, soft. She had a brown mole on one cheek. She'd been talking to him before his eyes were open. She wanted him to come home with her. Her name was Josefina Mendoza. She was Cook's sister. She lived uptown. She must help him. He had no idea what was happening. Whoa, lady, he said, whoa. Do you like it here? she cried. I do not like it, lady, no, said Profane. The train was heading toward Times Square, crowded. Two old ladies who had been shopping at Bloomingdale stood glaring hostile at them from up the car. Fina started to cry. The other kids came charging back in, singing, Help! Profane said he didn't know who he was asking. He'd awakened, loving every woman in the city, wanting them all. Here was one who wanted to take him home. The shuttle pulled into Times Square. The doors flew open. In a swoop, only half aware of what he was doing, he gathered Kook in one arm and ran out the door. Fina, with tropical birds peeking from her green dress whenever the black coat flew open, followed, hands joined with Tolito and Jose in a line. They ran through the station beneath a chain of green lights, profane loping, unathletic, into trash cans and coke machines. Cook broke away and tore broken field through the noon crowd. Luis Aparicio, he screamed, sliding for some private home plate. Luis Aparicio, wreaking havoc through a troop of Girl Scouts. Down the stairs, over to the uptown local, a train was waiting. Fina and the kids got in. As Profane started through, the doors closed on him, squeezing him in the middle. Fina's eyes went wide like her brother's. With a frightened little cry, she took Profane's hand and tugged, and a miracle happened. The doors opened again. She gathered him inside into her quiet field of force. He knew all at once. Here, for the time being, Profane the Schlemiel can move nimble and sure. All the way home, Cook sang Tienes mi corazón a love song he had heard once in a movie. They lived uptown in the 80s between Amsterdam Avenue and Broadway. Fina, Kook, 
mother, father, and another brother named Anhel. Sometimes Anhel's friend Geronimo would come over and sleep on the kitchen floor. When the old man was on relief, the mother fell in love with Profane immediately. They gave him the bathtub. Next day, Kook found him sleeping there and turned on the cold water. Jesus, God, Profane yelled, spluttering awake. Man, you go find a job, Kook said. Fina says so. Profane jumped up and went chasing Kook through the little apartment, trailing water behind him. In the front room, he tripped over Anhel and Geronimo, who were lying there drinking wine and talking about the girls they would watch that day in Riverside Park. Kook escaped, laughing and screaming, Luis Aparicio. Profane lay there with his nose pressed against the floor. Have some wine, Anhel said. A few hours later, they all came reeling down the steps of the old brownstone, horribly drunk. Anhel and Geronimo were arguing about whether it was too cold for girls to be in the park. They walked west in the middle of the street. The sky was overcast and dismal. Profane kept bumping into cars. At the corner, they invaded a hot dog stand and drank piña colada to sober up. It did no good. They made it to Riverside Drive, where Geronimo collapsed. Profane and Anhel picked him up and ran across the street with him, held like a battering ram, down a hill and into the park. Profane tripped over a rock, and the three of them went flying. They lay on the frozen grass while a bunch of kids in fat wool coats ran back and forth over them, playing pitch and catch with a bright yellow beanbag. Geronimo started to sing. Man, Anhel said, there is one. She came walking, a mean, nasty-faced poodle, young with long hair that danced and shimmered against the collar of her coat. Geronimo broke off the song to say, Cogno, and wobble his fingers. Then he continued singing now to her. She didn't notice any of them, but headed uptown, serene and smiling at the naked trees. Their eyes followed her out of sight. They felt sad. On his side, there are so many, he said, so many millions and millions of girls, here in New York and up in Boston, where I was once, and in thousands more cities. It makes me lose heart. Out in Jersey, too, said Profane. I worked in Jersey. A lot of good stuff in Jersey, Anhel said. Out on the road, said Profane. They were all in cars. Geronimo and I work in the sewers, Anhel said, under the street. You don't see anything down there. Under the street, Profane repeated after a minute. Under the street. Geronimo stopped singing and told Profane how it was. Did he remember the baby alligators? Last year, or maybe the year before, kids all over Nueva York bought these little alligators for pets. Macy's was selling them for fifty cents. Every child, it seemed, had to have one. But soon the children grew bored with them. Some set them loose in the streets, but most flushed them down the toilets. And these had grown and reproduced, had fed off rats and sewage, so that now they moved big, blind albino all over the sewer system. Down there, God knew how many there were. Some had turned cannibal because in their neighborhood the rats had all been eaten or had fled in terror. Since the sewer scandal last year, the department had got conscientious. They called for volunteers to go down with shotguns and get rid of the alligators. Not many had volunteered. Those who had quit soon. Anhel and he, Geronimo said proudly, had been there three months longer than anybody. Profane, all at once, was sober. Are they still looking for volunteers? He said slowly. Anhel started to sing. Profane rolled over, glaring at Geronimo. Hey! Sure, Geronimo said. You ever use a shotgun before? Profane said yes. He never had and never would, not at street level. But a shotgun under the street, under the street, might be all right. He could kill himself, but maybe it would be all right. He could try. I will talk to Mr. Zeitzus, the boss, said Geronimo. The beanbag hung for a second, jolly and bright in the air. Look, look, the kids cried. Look at it fall. Chapter Two The Whole Sick Crew V. One. 
Profane, Arnhale and Geronimo gave up girl-watching about noon and left the park in search of wine. An hour or so later, Rachel Owlglass, Profane's Rachel, passed by the spot they'd abandoned on her way home. There is no way to describe the way she walked except as a kind of brave, sensual trudging, as if she were nose-deep in snowdrifts, and yet en route to meet a lover. She came up the dead center of the mall, her gray coat fluttering a little in the breeze off the Jersey coast. Her high heels hit precise and neat each time on the X's of the grating in the middle of the mall. Half a year in this city, and at least she had learned to do that. Had lost heels and once in a while composure in the process, but now could do it blindfolded. She kept on the grating just to show off to herself. Rachel worked as an interviewer or personnel girl at a downtown employment agency. Was at the moment returning from an appointment on the east side with one Shale Schoenmaker, M.D., a plastic surgeon. Schoenmaker was a craftsman and came high, had two assistants, one a secretary, receptionist, nurse, with an impossibly coy, retrousse nose and thousands of freckles, all of which Schoenmaker had done himself. The freckles were tattooed, the girl his mistress, called by virtue of some associative freak Irving. The other assistant was a juvenile delinquent named Trench, who amused himself between patients by throwing scalpels at a wooden plaque presented to his employer by the United Jewish Appeal. The business was carried on in a fashionable maze or warren of rooms in an apartment building between First and York Avenues, at the fringes of Germantown. In keeping with the location, Brauhaus music blared over a concealed loudspeaker system continuously. She had arrived at ten in the morning. Irving told her to wait. She waited. The doctor was busy this morning. The office was crowded, Rachel figured, because it takes four months for a nose job to heal. Four months from now would be June. This meant many pretty Jewish girls who felt they would be perfectly marriageable were it not for an ugly nose could now go husband hunting at the various resorts, all with uniform septa. It disgusted Rachel, her theory being that it was not for cosmetic reasons these girls got operated on so much as that the hook nose is traditionally the sign of the Jew and the retrousse nose the sign of the wasp or white Anglo-Saxon Protestant in the movies and advertisements. She sat back, watching the patients come through the outer office, not particularly anxious to see Schoenmaker. One youth with a wispy beard which did nothing to hide a weak chin kept glancing at her, embarrassed from moist eyes across a wide stretch of neutral carpeting. A girl with a gauze beak, eyes closed, lay slumped on a sofa flanked by her parents, who conferred in whispers about the price. Directly across the room from Rachel was a mirror hung high on the wall, and under the mirror a shelf which held a turn-of-the-century clock. The double face was suspended by four golden flying buttresses above a maze of works enclosed in clear Swedish lead glass. The pendulum didn't swing back and forth, but was in the form of a disc parallel to the floor and driven by a shaft which paralleled the hands at six o'clock. The disc turned a quarter revolution one way, then a quarter revolution the other, each reversed torsion on the shaft advancing the escapement a notch. Mounted on the disc were two imps or demons wrought in gold, posed in fantastic attitudes. Their movements were reflected in the mirror along with the window at Rachel's back, which extended from floor to ceiling and revealed the branches and green needles of a pine tree. The branches whipped back and forth in the February wind, ceaseless and shimmering, and in front of them the two demons performed their metronomic dance beneath a vertical array of golden gears and ratchet wheels, levers and springs which gleamed warm and gay as any ballroom chandelier. Rachel was looking into the mirror at an angle of forty-five degrees, and so had a view of the face turned toward the room and the face on the other side reflected in the mirror. Here were time and reverse time coexisting, cancelling one another exactly out. Were there many such reference points 
scattered through the world, perhaps only at nodes like this room, which housed a transient population of the imperfect, the dissatisfied. Did real time plus virtual or mirror time equal zero, and thus serve some half-understood moral purpose? Or was it only the mirror world that counted, only a promise of a kind that the inward bow of a nose bridge or a promontory of extra cartilage at the chin meant a reversal of ill fortune, such that the world of the altered would thenceforth run on mirror time, work and love by mirror light, and be only till death stopped the heart's ticking, metronome's music, quietly as light ceases to vibrate, and imps dance under the century's own chandeliers. Miss Alglass, Irving, smiling from the entrance to Schoenmaker's sacristy. Rachel arose, taking her pocketbook, passed the mirror, and caught a sidelong glance at her own double in the mirror's district, passed through the door to confront the doctor, lazy and hostile, behind his kidney-shaped desk. He had the bill and a carbon lying on the desk. Miss Harvitz's account, Schoenmaker said. Rachel opened her pocketbook, took out a roll of twenties, dropped them on top of the papers. Count them, she said. This is the balance. Later, the doctor said. Sit down, Miss Alglass. Esther is flat broke, Rachel said, and she is going through hell. What you are running here is a vicious racket, he said dryly. Cigarette. I have my own. She sat on the edge of the chair, pushed away a strand or two of hair hanging over her forehead, searched for a cigarette. Trafficking in human vanity, Schoenmaker continued, propagating the fallacy that beauty is not in the soul, that it can be bought. Yes, his arm shot out with a heavy silver lighter, a thin flame, his voice barked. It can be bought, Miss Owlglass. I am selling it. I don't even look on myself as a necessary evil. You are unnecessary, she said, through a halo of smoke. Her eyes glittered like the slopes of adjacent saw teeth. You encourage them to sell out, she said. He watched the sensual arch of her own nose. You're orthodox? No. Conservative? Young people never are. My parents were orthodox. They believe, I believe, that whatever your father is, as long as your mother is Jewish, you are Jewish too, because we all come from our mother's womb. A long... Unbroken chain of Jewish mothers going all the way back to Eve. She looked hypocrite at him. No, he said. Eve was the first Jewish mother, the one who set the pattern. The words she said to Adam have been repeated ever since by her daughters. Adam, she said, come inside, have a piece fruit. Ha, ha, said Rachel. What about this chain? What of inherited characteristics? We've come along, become with years more sophisticated. We no longer believe now the earth is flat. Though there's a man in England, president of a flat earth society, who says it is and is ringed by ice barriers, a frozen world which is where all missing persons go and never return from. So with Lamarck, who said that if you cut the tail off a mother mouse, her children will be tailless also. But this is not true. The weight of scientific evidence is against him. Just as every photograph from a rocket over White Sands or Cape Canaveral is against the Flat Earth Society, nothing I do to a Jewish girl's nose is going to change the noses of her children when she becomes, as she must, a Jewish mother. So how am I being vicious? Am I altering that grand unbroken chain? No. I'm not going against nature. I am not selling out any Jews. Individuals do what they want, but the chain goes on, and small forces like me will never prevail against it. All that can is something which will change the germplasm. Nuclear radiation, maybe. They will sell out the Jews, maybe give future generations two noses, or no nose, who knows, ha ah. They will sell out the human race. Behind the far door came the thud of Trench's knife practice. Rachel sat with her legs crossed tightly. Inside, she said. What does it do to them there? You alter them there, too. What kind of Jewish mother do they make? They're the kind who make a girl get a nose job, even if she doesn't want one. 
How many generations have you worked on so far? How many have you played the dear old family doctor for? You are a nasty girl, said Schoenmaker. And so pretty, too. Why yell at me? All I am is one plastic surgeon, not a psychoanalyst. Maybe someday there will be special plastic surgeons who can do brain jobs, too. Make some young kid in Einstein, some girl in Eleanor Roosevelt. Or even make people act less nasty. Till then, how do I know what goes on inside? Inside has nothing to do with the chain. You set up another chain. She was trying not to yell. Changing them inside sets up another chain which has nothing to do with germplasm. You can transmit characteristics outside, too. You can pass along an attitude. Inside, outside, he said. You're being inconsistent. You lose me. I'd like to, she said, rising. I have bad dreams about people like you. Have your analyst tell you what they mean, he said. I hope you keep dreaming. She was at the door, half turned to him. My bank balance is big enough so I don't get disillusioned, he said. Being the kind of girl who can't resist an exit line. I heard about a disillusioned plastic surgeon, she said, who hung himself. She was gone, stomping out past the mirrored clock, out into the same wind that moved the pine tree, leaving behind the soft chins, warped noses, and facial scars of what she feared was a sort of drawing together or communion. Now, having left the grating behind, she walked over the dead grass of Riverside Park, under leafless trees and even more substantial skeletons of apartment houses on the drive, wondering about Esther Harvitz, her longtime roommate, whom she had helped out of more financial crises than either could remember. An old, rusty beer can lay in her path. She kicked it viciously. What is it, she thought. Is this the way Nueva York is set up? And freeloaders and victims? Schoenmaker freeloads off my roommate, she freeloads off me. Is there this long daisy chain of victimizers and victims, screwers and screwees? And if so, who is it I am screwing? She thought first of Slab, Slab of the Raoul Slab Melvin triumvirate between whom and a lack of charity toward all men she'd alternated ever since coming to the city. What do you let her take for? he had said. Always take. It was in his studio, she remembered, back during one of those Slab and Rachel idols that usually preceded a Slab and Esther affair. Con Edison had just shut off the electricity, so all they had to look at each other by was one gas burner on the stove, which bloomed in a blue and yellow minaret, making the faces masks, their eyes expressionless sheets of light. Maybe, she said, Slab, it is only that the kid is broke, and if I can afford it, why not? No, Slab said, a tick dancing high on his cheekbone. Or it might only have been the gaslight. No. Don't you think I see what this is? She needs you for all the money she keeps soaking you for, and you need her in order to feel like a mother. Every dime she gets out of your pocketbook adds one more strand to this cable that ties you two together like an umbilical cord making it that much harder to cut, making her survival that much more in danger if the cord ever is cut. How much has she ever paid you back? She will, Rachel said. Sure. Now eight hundred dollars more to change this. He waved his arm at a small portrait leaning against the wall by the garbage can. He reached over, picked it up, tilted it toward the blue flame so they both could see. Girl at a party. The picture, perhaps, was meant to be looked at only under hydrocarbon light. It was Esther, leaning against a wall, looking straight out of the picture, at someone approaching her. And there, that look in the eyes, half victim, half in control. Look at it, the nose, he said. Why does she want to get that changed? With the nose, she is a human being. Is it only an artist's concern, Rachel said. You object on pictorial or social grounds, but what else? Rachel, he yelled, she takes home fifty a week, twenty-five comes out for analysis, twelve for rent, leaving thirteen. What for? For high heels she breaks on subway gratings, for lipstick, earrings, clothes, food occasionally. So now eight hundred for a nose job. What will it be next? Mercedes-Benz 300 SL? Picasso original abortion what? 
She has been right on time, Rachel said, Frosty, in case you are worrying. Baby, suddenly all wistful and boyish, you are a good woman, member of a vanishing race. It is right you should help the less fortunate, but you reach a point. The argument had gone back and forth with neither of them actually getting mad, and at three in the morning the inevitable terminal point, bed, to caress away the headaches both had developed. Nothing settled, nothing ever settled. That had been back in September. The gauze beak was gone, the nose now a proud sickle, pointing, you felt, at the big Westchester in the sky, where all gods elect sooner or late ended up. She turned out of the park and walked away from the Hudson on 112th Street, screwer and screwy. On this foundation, perhaps, the island stood from the bottom of the lowest sewer bed right up through the streets to the tip of the TV antenna on top of the Empire State Building. She entered her lobby, smiled at the ancient doorman, into the elevator, up seven flights to 7G, home, ho, ho. First thing she saw through the open door was a sign on the kitchen wall with the word party, illuminated by pencil caricatures of the whole sick crew. She tossed the pocketbook on the kitchen table, closed the door. Paola's handiwork, Paola Maestro, the third roommate, who had also left a note on the table, winsome, charisma, foo, and I, V-note, McClintic sphere, Paola Maestro. Nothing but proper nouns. The girl lived proper nouns, persons, places, no things. Had anyone told her about things? It seemed Rachel had had to do with nothing else, the main one now being Esther's nose. In the shower, Rachel sang a torch song in a red, hot mama voice, which the tiled chamber magnified. She knew it amused people because it came from such a little girl. Say a man is no good for anything but jazzing around. He'll go live in a cat house. He'll jazz it all over town. And all kinds of meanness to put a good woman down. Now I am a good woman because I'm telling you I am. And I sure been put down, but honey, I don't give a damn. You're going to have a hard time finding you a kind-hearted man, because a kind-hearted man is the kind who will... Presently, the light in Paola's room began to leak out the window, up the air shaft and into the sky, accompanied by clinking bottles, running water, flushing toilet in the bathroom, and then the almost imperceptible sounds of Rachel fixing her long hair. When she left, turning off all the lights, the hands on an illuminated clock near Paola Maestral's bed stood near six o'clock. No ticking. The clock was electric. Its minute hand could not be seen to move, but soon the hand passed twelve and began its course down the other side of the face, as if it had passed through the surface of a mirror and had now to repeat in mirror time what it had done on the side of real time. Two. The party, as if it were inanimate after all, unwound like a clock's mainspring toward the edges of the chocolate room, seeking some easing of its own tension, some equilibrium. Near its center, Rachel Owlglass was curled on the pine floor, legs shining pale through black stockings. You felt she'd done a thousand secret things to her eyes. They needed no haze of cigarette smoke to look at you out of sexy and fathomless, but carried their own along with them. New York must have been for her a city of smoke, its streets, the courtyards of limbo, its bodies like wraiths. Smoke seemed to be in her voice, in her movements, making her all the more substantial, more there, as if words, glances, small lewdnesses could only become baffled and brought to rest like smoke in her long hair, remain there useless till she released them, accidentally and unknowingly, with a toss of her head. Young Stencil, the world adventurer, seated on the sink, waggled his shoulder blades like wings. Her back was to him. Through the entrance to the kitchen he could see the shadow of her spine's indentation snaking down a deeper black along the black of her sweater, see the tiny movements of her head and hair as she listened. She didn't like him, Stencil had decided. It's the way he looks at Paola, she told Esther, 
Esther, of course, had told Stencil. But it wasn't sexual. It lay deeper. Paola was Maltese. Born in 1901, the year Victoria died, Stencil was in time to be the century's child. Raised motherless. The father, Sidney Stencil, had served the foreign office of his country, taciturn and competent. No facts on the mother's disappearance. Died in childbirth. Ran off with someone, committed suicide, some way of vanishing painful enough to keep Sidney from ever referring to it in all the correspondence to his son which is available. The father died under unknown circumstances in 1919 while investigating the June disturbances in Malta. On an evening in 1946, separated by stone balusters from the Mediterranean, the son had sat with one Margravine de Chiave Lowenstein on the terrace of her villa on the western coast of Majorca. The sun was setting into thick clouds, turning all the visible sea to a sheet of pearl grey. Perhaps they may have felt like the last two gods, the last inhabitants of a watery earth, or perhaps, but it would be unfair to infer. Whatever the reason, the scene played as follows. Marg. Then you must leave. Sten. Stencil must be in Lucerne before the week is out. Marg. I dislike pre-military activity. Sten. It isn't espionage. Marg. What then? Stencil laughs, watching the twilight. Marg. You are so close. Sten. To whom? Margravine, not even to himself. This place, this island, all his life he's done nothing but hop from island to island. Is that a reason? Does there have to be a reason? Shall he tell you he works for no Whitehall, and unconceivable, unless <laughs> the network of white halls in his own brain? These featureless corridors he keeps swept and correct for occasional visiting agents? Envoys from the zones of human crucified? the fabled districts of human love, but in whose employ, not his own, it would be lunacy, the lunacy of any self-appointed prophet. There is a long pause as the light reaching them through the clouds weakens or thins out to wash over them, enervated and ugly. Sten. Stencil reached his majority three years after old Stencil died. Part of the estate that came to him then was a number of manuscript books bound in half-calf, and warped by the humid air of many European cities. His journals, his unofficial log of an agent's career. Under Florence, April, 1899, is a sentence. Young Stencil has memorized it. There is more behind and inside thee than any of us had suspected. Not who, but what. What is she? God grant that I may never be called upon to write the answer, either here or in any official report. Marg. A woman. Sten. Another woman. Marg. It is she you are pursuing, seeking? Sten. You'll ask next if he believes her to be his mother. The question is ridiculous. Since 1945, Herbert Stencil had been on a conscious campaign to do without sleep. Before 1945, he had been slothful, accepting sleep as one of life's major blessings. He'd spent the time between wars footloose, the source of his income then as now uncertain. Sydney hadn't left much in the way of pounds and shillings, but had generated goodwill in nearly every city in the Western world among those of his own generation. This being a generation which still believed in the family, it meant a good lookout for young Herbert. He didn't freeload all the time. He'd worked as a croupier in southern France, plantation foreman in East Africa, bordello manager in Greece, and in a number of civil service positions back home. Stud poker could be depended on to fill in the low places, though an occasional mountain or two had also been leveled. In that interregnum between kingdoms of death, Herbert just got by studying his father's journals only by way of learning how to please the blood-conscious contacts of his legacy. The passage on V was never noticed. In 1939 he was in London working for the Foreign Office. September came and went. 
It was as if a stranger located above the frontiers of consciousness were shaking him. He didn't particularly care to wake, but realized that if he didn't, he would soon be sleeping alone. Being the sociable sort, Herbert volunteered his services. He was sent to North Africa in some fuzzily defined spy-interpreter liaison capacity, and seesawed with the rest from Tobruk to El Aguila, back through Tobruk to El Alamein, back again to Tunisia. At the end of it, he had seen more dead than he cared to again. Peace having been won, he flirted with the idea of resuming that pre-war sleepwalk. Sitting at a café in Oran, frequented largely by American ex-GIs who'd decided not to return to the States just yet, he was leafing through the Florence Journal idly when the sentences on V suddenly acquired a light of their own. V for victory, the Margravine had suggested playfully. No, Stencil shook his head. It may be that Stencil has been lonely and needs something for company. Whatever the reason, he began to discover that sleep was taking up time which could be spent active. His random movements before the war had given way to a great single movement from inertness to, if not vitality, then at least activity. Work, the chase, for it was V he hunted, far from being a means to glorify God and one's own godliness, as the Puritans believe, was for stencil grim, joyless, a conscious acceptance of the unpleasant for no other reason than that V was there to track down. Finding her, what then? Only that what love there was to stencil had become directed entirely inward toward this acquired sense of animateness. Having found this, he could hardly release it. It was too dear. To sustain it, he had to hunt V. But if he should find her, where else would there be to go but back into half-consciousness? He tried not to think, therefore, about any end to the search. Approach and avoid. Here in New York, the impasse had become acute. He'd come to the party at the invitation of Esther Harvitz, whose plastic surgeon, Schoenmaker, owned a vital piece of the V jigsaw, but protested ignorance. Stencil would wait. He'd taken over a low-rent apartment in the thirties, he sighed, temporarily vacated by an Egyptologist named Bongo Shaftesbury, son of an Egyptologist Sidney had known. They had been opponents once before the First War, as had been Sidney and many of the present contacts, which was curious, certainly, but lucky for Herbert because it doubled his chances of subsistence. He had been using the apartment for a pied-à-terre this last month, snatching sleep between interminable visits among his other contacts, a population coming more and more to comprise sons and friends of the originals. At each step, the sense of blood weakened. Stencil could see a day when he would only be tolerated. It would then be he and V all alone in a world that somehow had lost sight of them both. Until such time, there were Sean Maker to wait for, and Chicklets, the munitions king, and Eigenvalue, the physician, epithets characteristically stemming from Sidney's day, though Sidney had known neither of the men personally, to fill up the time. It was dithering, it was a stagnant period, and Stencil knew it. A month was too long to stay in any city unless there were something tangible to investigate. He'd taken to roving the city aimlessly, waiting for a coincidence. None came. He'd snatched at Esther's invitation, hoping to come across some clue, trace, hint. But the whole sick crew had nothing to offer. The owner of this apartment seemed to express a prevailing humor common to them all. As if he were Stencil's pre-war self, he presented to Stencil a horrifying spectacle. Fergus Mixolydian, the Irish-Armenian Jew and universal man, laid claim to being the laziest living being in Nueva York. His creative ventures, all incomplete, ranged from a western in blank verse to a wall he'd had removed from a stall in the Penn Station men's room and entered in an art exhibition as what the old Dadaists called a ready-made. Critical comment was not kind. Fergus got so lazy that his only activity, short of those necessary to sustain life, 
was once a week to fiddle around at the kitchen sink with dry cells, retorts, alembics, salt solutions. What he was doing, he was generating hydrogen. This went to fill a sturdy green balloon with a great Z printed on it. He would tie the balloon by a string to the post of the bed whenever he planned to sleep, this being the only way for visitors to tell which side of consciousness Fergus was on. His other amusement was watching the TV. He devised an ingenious sleep switch, receiving its signal from two electrodes placed on the inner skin of his forearm. When Fergus dropped below a certain level of awareness, the skin resistance increased over a preset value to operate the switch. Fergus thus became an extension of the TV set. The rest of the crew partook of the same lethargy, Raoul wrote for television, keeping carefully in mind and complaining bitterly about all the sponsor fetishes of that industry. Slab painted in sporadic bursts, referring to himself as a catatonic expressionist and his work as the ultimate in non-communication. Melvin played the guitar and sang liberal folk songs. The pattern would have been familiar, bohemian creative arty, except that it was even further removed from reality, romanticism in its furthest decadence, being only an exhausted impersonation of poverty, rebellion, and artistic soul. For it was the unhappy fact that most of them worked for a living and obtained the substance of their conversation from the pages of Time magazine and like publications. Perhaps the only reason they survived, Stencil reasoned, was that they were not alone. God knew how many more there were with a hothouse sense of time, no knowledge of life, and at the mercy of fortune. The party itself tonight was divided in three parts. Fergus and his date and another couple had long retreated into the bedroom with a gallon of wine, locked the door, and let the crew do what they could in the way of chaos to the rest of the place. The sink on which Stencil now sat would become Melvin's perch. He would play his guitar, and there would be horrors and African fertility dances in the kitchen before midnight. The lights in the living room would go out one by one. Schoenberg's quartets, complete, would go on the record player, changer, and repeat, and repeat. While cigarette calls dotted the room like watchfires, and the promiscuous Debbie Sensei, for example, would be on the floor, caressed by Raoul, say, or Slab, while she ran her hand up the leg of another, sitting on the couch with her roommate, and on, in a kind of love feast or daisy chain. Wine would spill, furniture would be broken. Fergus would awake briefly next morning, view the destruction and residual guests sprawled about the apartment, cuss them all out, and go back to sleep. Stencil shrugged irritably, rose from the sink, and found his coat. On the way out he touched a knot of six, Raoul, Slab, Melvin, and three girls. Man, said Raoul. Seen, said Slab, waving his arm to indicate the unwinding party. Later, Stencil said, and moved on out the door. The girls stood silent. They were camp followers of a sort and expendable, or at least could be replaced. Oh, yes, said Melvin. Uptown, Slab said, is taking over the world. Ha ha, said one of the girls. Shut up, said Slab. He tugged at his hat. He always wore a hat, inside or outside, in bed or dead drunk. And George Raft suits with immense pointed lapels. Pointed, starched, non-button-down collars. Padded, pointed shoulders. He was all points. But his face, the girl noticed, was not rather soft, like a dissolute angel's. Curly hair, red and purple rings, slung looped in twos and threes beneath the eyes. Tonight she would kiss beneath his eyes, one by one, these sad circles. Excuse me, she murmured, drifting away toward the fire escape. At the window she gazed out toward the river, seeing nothing but fog. A hand touched her spine, exactly in that spot every man she ever knew had been able to find sooner or later. She straightened up, squeezing her shoulder blades together, moving her breasts, taut and suddenly visible toward the window. She could see his reflection, watching their reflection. She turned. He was blushing. Crew-cut suit, Harris Tweed. Say, you're new, she smiled. I am Esther. He blushed and was cute. 
Brad, he said. I'm sorry I made you jump. She knew instinctively. He will be fine as the fraternity boy just out of an Ivy League school who knows he will never stop being a fraternity boy as long as he lives, but who still feels he is missing something and so hangs at the edges of the whole sick crew. If he is going into management, he writes. If he is an engineer or architect, why, he paints or sculpts. He will straddle the line, aware up to the point of knowing he is getting the worst of both worlds, but never stopping to wonder why there should ever have been a line, or even if there is a line at all. He will learn how to be a twinned man, and will go on at the game straddling until he splits up the crotch and in half from the prolonged tension, and then he will be destroyed. She assumed ballet fourth position, moved her breasts at a forty-five degree angle to his line of sight, pointed her nose at his heart, looked up at him through her eyelashes. How long have you been in New York? Outside the V-note, a number of bums stood around the front windows, looking inside, fogging the glass with their breath. From time to time, a collegiate-looking type, usually with a date, would emerge from the swinging doors, and they would ask him, one by one in a line down that short section of Bowery sidewalk, for a cigarette, subway fare, the price of a beer. All night the February wind would come barreling down the wide keyway of Third Avenue, moving right over them all. The shavings, cutting oil, sludge of New York's lathe. Inside, McClintock's sphere was swinging his ass off. His skin was hard, as if it were part of the skull. Every vein and whisker on that head stood out sharp and clear under the green baby spot. You could see the twin lines running down from either side of his lower lip, etched in by the force of his embouchure, looking like extensions of his mustache. He blew a hand-carved ivory alto saxophone with a four-and-a-half reed, and the sound was like nothing any of them had heard before. The usual divisions prevailed. Collegians did not dig and left after an average of one-and-a-half sets. Personnel from other groups, either with a night off or taking a long break from somewhere across town or uptown, listened hard, trying to dig. I am still thinking, they would say, if you asked. People at the bar all looked as if they did dig in the sense of understand, approve of, empathize with. But this was probably only because people who prefer to stand at the bar have, universally, an inscrutable look. At the end of the bar in the V-note is a table which is normally used by customers to put empty beer bottles and glasses on. But if somebody grabs it early enough, nobody minds, and the bartenders are usually too busy anyway to yell at them to get off. At the moment, the table was occupied by Winsome, Charisma, and Foo. Paola had gone to the ladies' room. None of them were saying anything. The group on the stand had no piano. It was bass, drums, McClintock, and a boy he had found in the Ozarks, who blew a natural horn in F. The drummer was a groupman who avoided pyrotechnics, which may have irritated the college crowd. The bass was small and evil-looking, and his eyes were yellow with pinpoints in the center. He talked to his instrument. It was taller than he was and didn't seem to be listening. Horn and alto together favored sixths and minor fourths, and when this happened it was like a knife fight or tug of war. The sound was consonant, but as if cross-purposes were in the air. The solos of McClintock's sphere were something else. There were people around, mostly those who wrote for Downbeat magazine or the liners of LP records, who seemed to feel he played disregarding chord changes completely. They talked a great deal about soul and the anti-intellectual and the rising rhythms of African nationalism. It was a new conception, they said, and some of them said bird lives. Since the soul of Charlie Parker had dissolved away into a hostile March wind nearly a year before, a great deal of nonsense had been spoken and written about him. Much more was to come. Some is still being written today. He was the greatest alto on the post-war scene, and when he left it, some curious negative will, a reluctance and refusal to believe in the final cold fact, possessed the lunatic fringe to scrawl in every subway station, on sidewalks, in pissoirs, the denial, 
bird lives. So that among the people in the V-note that night were, at a conservative estimate, a dreamy 10% who had not got the word and saw in McClintic's sphere a kind of reincarnation. He plays all the notes bird missed, somebody whispered in front of Fu. Fu went silently through the motions of breaking a beer bottle on the edge of the table, jamming it into the speaker's back and twisting. It was near closing time, the last set. It's nearly time to go, Charisma said. Where's Paola? Here she comes, said Winsome. Outside, the wind had its own permanent gig and was still blowing. Chapter 3 In which Stancil, a quick-change artist, does eight impersonations. V. As spread thighs are to the libertine, flights of migratory birds to the ornithologist, the working part of his tool bit to the production machinist, so was the letter V to young Stencil. He would dream, perhaps once a week, that it had all been a dream, and that now he'd awakened to discover the pursuit of V was merely a scholarly quest after all, an adventure of the mind in the tradition of the Golden Bough or the White Goddess. But soon enough, he'd wake up the second, real time, to make again the tiresome discovery that it hadn't really ever stopped being the same simple-minded, literal pursuit. V, ambiguously a beast of venery, chased like the heart, hind, or hair, chased like an obsolete or bizarre or forbidden form of sexual delight, and clownish stencil capering along behind her, bells a jingle, waving a wooden toy ox goat for no one's amusement but his own. His protest to the Margravine de Chiave Lowenstein, suspecting V's natural habitat to be the state of siege he'd come to Majorca directly from Toledo, where he'd spent a week night-walking the Alcazar, asking questions, gathering useless memorabilia. It isn't espionage. Had been, and still was, spoken more out of petulance than any desire to establish purity of motive. He wished it could all be as respectable and orthodox as spying. But somehow, in his hands, the traditional tools and attitudes were always employed toward mean ends. Cloak for a laundry sack, dagger to peel potatoes, dossiers to fill up dead Sunday afternoons. And worst of all, disguise itself not out of any professional necessity, but only as a trick simply to involve him less in the chase, to put off some part of the pain of dilemma on various impersonations. Herbert Stencil, like small children at a certain stage, and Henry Adams in the education, as well as assorted autocrats since time out of mind, always referred to himself in the third person. This helped Stencil appear as only one among a repertoire of identities. Forcible, Dislocation of personality was what he called the general technique, which is not exactly the same as seeing the other fellow's point of view, for it involved, say, wearing clothes that Stencil wouldn't be caught dead in, eating foods that would have made Stencil gag, living in unfamiliar digs, frequenting bars or cafes of a non-Stencilian character. All this for weeks on end. And why? To keep Stencil in his place, that is, in the third person. Around each seed of a dossier, therefore, had developed a nacreous mass of inference, poetic license, forcible dislocation of personality into a past he didn't remember and had no right in, save the right of imaginative anxiety or historical care, which is recognized by no one. He tended each seashell on his submarine scongile farm, tender and impartial, moving awkwardly about his staked preserve on the harbor bed, carefully avoiding the little dark deep right there in the midst of the tame shellfish, down in which God knew what lived. The island Malta, where his father had died, where Herbert had never been and knew nothing at all about because something there kept him off because it frightened him. One evening, Drowsing on the sofa in Bongo Shaftesbury's apartment, Stencil took out his one souvenir of whatever old Sidney's Maltese adventure had been. A gay, 
four-color postcard, a Daily Mail battle photo from the Great War, showing a platoon of sweating, kilted Gordons wheeling a stretcher on which lay an enormous German enlisted man with a great mustache, one leg in a splint, and a most comfortable grin. Sidney's message read, I feel old, and yet like a sacrificial virgin. Write and cheer me up, Father. Young Stencil hadn't written because he was eighteen and never wrote. That was part of the present venery. The way he'd felt on hearing of Sidney's death half a year later, and only then realizing that neither of them had communicated since the picture postcard. A certain porpentine, one of his father's colleagues, had been murdered in Egypt under the duelo by Eric Bongo Shaftesbury, the father of the man who owned this apartment. Had Porpentine gone to Egypt like old stencil to Malta, perhaps having written his own son, that he felt like some other spy, who'd in turn gone off to die in Schleswig-Holstein, Trieste, Sophia, anywhere? Apostolic succession. They must know when it's time, stencil had often thought, but if death did come like some last charismatic bestowal, he'd have no real way of telling. He'd only the veiled references to Porpentine in the journals. The rest was impersonation and dream. 1. As the afternoon progressed, yellow clouds began to gather over Plas Muhammad Ali from the direction of the Libyan desert. A wind with no sound at all swept up Rue Ibrahim and across the square, bringing a desert chill into the city. For one P. Aul, cafe waiter and amateur libertine, the clouds signaled rain. His lone customer, an Englishman, perhaps a tourist because his face was badly sunburned, sat all tweeds, ulster and expectation, looking out on the square. Though he'd been there over coffee not fifteen minutes, already he seemed as permanent a landscape's feature as the equestrian statue of Muhammad Ali itself. Certain Englishmen, Ayul knew, have this talent, but they're usually not tourists. Ayul lounged near the entrance to the café. Outwardly inert, but teeming inside with sad and philosophical reflections. Was this one waiting for a lady? How wrong to expect any romance or sudden love from Alexandria. No tourist's city gave that gift lightly. It took... How long had he been away from the Midi? Twelve years? At least that long. Let them be deceived into thinking the city something more than what their Baedeker said it was. A Ferris, long gone to earthquake and the sea. Picturesque but faceless Arabs. Monuments, tombs, modern hotels. A false and bastard city inert for them, as Ayul himself. He watched the sun darken and the wind flutter the leaves of acacias round Plas Muhammad Ali. In the distance, a name was being bellowed, Porpentine, Porpentine. It whined in the square's hollow reaches like a voice from childhood. Another fat Englishman, fair-haired, florid, didn't all northerners look alike, had been striding down Rue Sharif Pasha in a dress suit and a pith helmet two sizes too large. Approaching Ayul's customer, he began blithering rapidly in English from twenty yards out, something about a woman, a consulate. The waiter shrugged, having learned years back there was little to be curious about in the conversations of Englishmen, but the bad habit persisted. Rain began, thin drops hardly more than a mist. Hat fingan, the fat one roared, hat fingan kawa bisuka ya willed. Two red faces burned angry at each other across the table. Merde, Aïdou thought, at the table. Monsieur? Ah, the gross smiled. Coffee, then. Café, you know. On his return, the two were conversing lackadaisically about a grand party at the consulate tonight. What consulate? All Aïdou could distinguish were names. Victoria Wren, Sir Alistair Wren, father, husband, a bongo shaft spree, 
What ridiculous names that country produced. Ayul delivered the coffee and returned to his lounging space. This fat one was out to seduce the girl, Victoria Wren, another tourist traveling with her tourist father, but was prevented by the lover, Bongo Shaftesbury. The old one in Tweed, Porpentine, was the Macro. The two he watched were anarchists plotting to assassinate Sir Alistair Wren, a powerful member of the English Parliament. The peer's wife, Victoria, was meanwhile being blackmailed by Bongo Shaftesbury, who knew of her own secret anarchist sympathies. The two were music hall entertainers seeking jobs in a grand vaudeville being produced by Bongo Shaftesbury, who was in town seeking funds from the foolish knight Wren. Bongo Shaftesbury's avenue of approach would be through the glamorous actress Victoria, Wren's mistress posing as his wife to satisfy the English fetish of respectability. Fat and Tweed would enter their consulate tonight arm in arm, singing a jovial song, shuffling, rolling their eyes. Rain had increased in thickness. A white envelope with a crest on the flap passed between the two at the table. All at once the Tweed one jerked to his feet like a clockwork doll and began speaking in Italian. A fit? But there was no sun, and Tweed had begun to sing, Pazzo son, guardate, come io piango ed imploro. Italian opera. Ayur felt sick. He watched them with a pained smile. The antic Englishman leaped in the air, clicked his heels, stood posturing, fist on chest, other arm outstretched. Come io quiero pietà. Rain drenched the two. A sunburned face bobbed like a balloon, the only touch of color in that square. Fat sat in the rain, sipping at the coffee, observing his frolicking companion. Ayul could hear drops of rain pattering on the pith helmet. At length, Fat seemed to awake. A rose, leaving a piaster and a milliam on the table. Avar. And nodded to the other who now stood watching him. The square was empty except for Muhammad Ali and the horse. How many times have they stood this way, dwarfed, horizontal, and vertical by any plaza or late afternoon? Could an argument from design be predicated on that instant only? Then the two must have been displaceable, like minor chess pieces, anywhere across Europe's board. Both of a color, though, one hanging back diagonal in deference to his partner, both scanning any embassy's parquetry for signs of some dimly sensed opposition. Lover, meal ticket, object of political assassination, any statue's face for a reassurance of self-agency and perhaps unhappily self-humanity. Might they be trying not to remember that each square in Europe, however you cut it, remains inanimate after all? They turned about formally and parted in opposite directions, fat back toward the Hotel Cadival, tweed into Rue de Rossetin and the Turkish Quarter. Bon chance, Aïl thought. Whatever it is tonight, bon chance, because I will see neither of you again. That's the least I can wish. He fell asleep at last against the wall, made drowsy by the rain, to dream of one Mariam, and tonight, and the Arab quarter. Low places in the square filled, the usual random sets of crisscrossing concentric circles moved across them. Near eight o'clock, the rain slackened off. Two. Yusuf, the factotum, temporarily on loan from Hotel Cadival, dashed through the failing rain across the street to the Austrian consulate, darting in by the servant's entrance. Late, shouted Magnus, leader of the kitchen force. And so, spawn of a homosexual camel, the punch table for you. Not a bad assignment, Yusuf thought, as he put on the white jacket and combed his mustaches. From the punch table on the mezzanine, one could see the whole show. Down the decolletage of the prettier women. Italian breasts were the finest. Ah! Over all that resplendent muster of stars, ribbons, and exotic orders. Soon, from his vantage, Yusuf could allow the first sneer of many this evening to ripple across a knowledgeable mouth. 
let them make holiday while they could. Soon enough the fine clothes would be rags and the elegant woodwork crusted with blood. Yusuf was an anarchist. Anarchist, and no one's fool. He kept abreast of current events, always on lookout for any news favorable to even minor chaos. Tonight the political situation was hopeful. Sirdar Kitchener, England's newest colonial hero, recently victorious at Khartoum, was just now some four hundred miles further down the White Nile, foraging about in the jungle. A general marchand was also rumored in the vicinity. Britain wanted no part of France in the Nile Valley. Monsieur Delcasse, foreign minister of a newly formed French cabinet, would as soon go to war as not if there were any trouble when the two detachments met. As meet, everyone realized by now, they would. Russia would support France, while England had a temporary rapprochement with Germany, meaning Italy and Austria as well. Bung ho, the English said, up goes the balloon. Yosef, believing that an anarchist or devotee of annihilation must have some childhood memory to be nostalgic about by way of balance, loved balloons. Most nights at Dreams Verge, he could revolve like the moon about any gaily dyed pig's intestine, distended with his own warm breath. But from the corner of his eye now, miracle. How, if one believed in nothing, could one account a balloon girl? A balloon girl, hardly seeming to touch the waxed mirror beneath, holding her empty cup out to Yusuf. Messikombilka, good evening. Are there any other cavities you wish filled, my English lady? Perhaps he would spare children like this, would he? If it should come to a morning, any morning, when all the muezzins were silent, the pigeons gone to hide among the catacombs, could he rise robeless in nothing's dawn and do what he must? By conscience, must? Oh, she smiled. Oh, thank you. Leldak Leben. May thy night be white as milk, as thy belly, enough. She bobbed off, light as cigar smoke rising from the great room below. She'd pronounced her o's with a sigh, as if fainting from love. An older man, solidly built, hair gone gray, looking like a professional street brawler in evening dress, joined her at the stairs. Victoria, he rumbled. Victoria, named after her queen. He fought in vain to hold back laughter. No telling what would amuse Yusuf. His attention was to stray to her now and again throughout the evening. It was pleasant amid all that glitter to have something to focus on. But she stood out. Her color, even her voice, was lighter than the rest of her world, rising with the smoke to Yusuf, whose hands were sticky with Chambly punch, mustache, a sad tangle. He had a habit of unconsciously trimming the ends with his teeth. Mechnis dropped by every half hour to call him names. If no one happened to be in earshot, they traded insults, some coarse, some ingenious, all following the Levantine pattern of proceeding backward through the other's ancestry, creating extempore at each step or generation an even more improbable and bizarre misalliance. Count Heaven Hüller Metsch, the Austrian consul, had been spending much time in the company of his Russian counterpart, Monsieur de Villiers. How, Yusuf wondered, can two men joke like that and tomorrow be enemies? Perhaps they'd been enemies yesterday. He decided public servants weren't human. Yusuf shook the punch ladle at the retreating back of Mechnes. Public servant, indeed. What was he, Yusuf, if not a public servant? Was he human? Before he'd embraced political nihilism, certainly, but as a servant here tonight for them, he might as well be a fixture on the wall. But that will change, he smiled, grim. Soon he was daydreaming again of balloons. At the bottom of the steps sat the girl, Victoria, center of a curious tableau. Seated next to her was a chubby blonde man whose evening clothes looked shrunken by the rain. Standing facing them at the apices of a flat isosceles triangle were the gray-headed man who'd spoken her name, a young girl of eleven in a white shapeless frock, 
and another man whose face looked sunburned. The only voice Yusuf could hear was Victoria's. My sister is fond of rocks and fossils, Mr. Goodfellow. The blonde head next to her nodded courteously. Show them, Mildred. The younger girl produced from her reticule a rock, turned and held it up first to Victoria's companion and then to the red face beside her. This one seemed to retreat, embarrassed. Yusuf reflected that he could blush at will and no one would know. A few more words, and the red face had left the group to come loping up the stairs. To Yusuf, he held up five fingers. Come, sir. As Yusuf busied himself filling the cups, someone approached from behind and touched the Englishman lightly on one shoulder. The Englishman spun, his hands balling into fists and moving into position for violence. Yusuf's eyebrows went up a fraction of an inch. Another street fighter. How long since he'd seen reflexes like that? In Tufik, the assassin, eighteen and apprentice tombstone cutter, perhaps. But this one was forty or forty-five. No one, Yusuf reasoned, would stay fit that long unless his profession demanded it. What profession would include both a talent for killing and presence at a consulate party? An Austrian consulate at that. The Englishman's hands had relaxed. He nodded pleasantly. Lovely girl, the other said. He wore blue-tinted spectacles and a false nose. The Englishman smiled, turned, picked up his five cups of punch, and started down the stairs. At the second step, he tripped and fell, proceeded whirling and bouncing, followed by sounds of breaking glass and a spray of shabli punch to the bottom. Yusuf noted that he knew how to take falls. The other street fighter laughed to cover the general awkwardness. Saw a fellow do that in a music hall once, he rumbled. You're much better, Porpentine, really. Porpentine extracted a cigarette and lay while smoking where he'd come to rest. Up on the mezzanine, the man with the blue eyeglasses peeked archly from behind a pillar, removed the nose, pocketed it, and vanished. A strange collection. There is more here, Yusuf guessed. Had it to do with Kitchener and Marchand? Of course it must, but... His puzzling was interrupted by Mechnes, who had returned to describe Yusuf's great-great-great-grandfather and grandmother as a one-legged mongrel dog who fed on donkey excrement and a syphilitic elephant, respectively. 3. The Fink restaurant was quiet, not much doing. A few English and German tourists, the penny-pinching kind, whom it was never any use approaching, sat scattered about the room making noise enough for midday in Place Muhammad Ali. Maxwell Rowley Bouguet, hair coiffed, mustaches curled and external clothing correct to the last wrinkle and thread, sat in one corner, back to the wall, feeling the first shooting pains of panic begin to dance about his abdomen. For beneath the careful shell of hair... Skin and fabric lay hold and grey linen and a ne'er-do-well's heart. Old Max was a peregrine and penniless at that. Give it a quarter of an hour more, he decided. If nothing promising comes along, I shall move on to l'univers. He had crossed the border into Baedekerland some eight years ago, ninety, after an unpleasantness in Yorkshire. It had been Ralph McBurgess then, a young Lochinvar come down to the then wide enough horizons of England's vaudeville circuits. He sang a bit, danced a bit, told a number of passable barnyard jokes. But Max, or Ralph, had a problem, being perhaps too daft for small girls. This particular girl, Alice, had shown at age ten the same halfway responses, a game she'd carol such fun of her predecessors. But they know, Max told himself, no matter how young, they know what it is, what they're doing. Only they don't think about it that much, which was why he drew the line at sixteen or so. Any older and romance, religion, remorse entered like blundering stagehands to ruin a pure pas de deux. But this one had told her friends, who became jealous, one at least enough to pass it on to the clergyman, parents, police, oh God. How awkward it had been. Though he'd not tried to forget the tableau, 
dressing room in the Athenaeum Theatre, a middle-sized town called Lardwick in the Fen. Bare pipes, worn sequined gowns hung in a corner. Broken hollow pasteboard pillar for the romantic tragedy the vaudeville had replaced. A costume box for their bed. Then footsteps, voices, a knob turning so slow. She'd wanted it. Even afterward, dry-eyed among a protective cordon of hating faces, the eyes had said, I still want it. Alice, the ruin of Ralph McBurgess. Who knew what any of them wanted? How he'd come to Alexandria, where he would go on leaving, little of that could matter to any tourist. He was that sort of vagrant who exists, though unwillingly, entirely within the Baedeker world as much a feature of the topography as the other automata. Waiters, porters, cabmen, clerks, taken for granted. Whenever he was about his business, cadging meals, drinks, or lodging, a temporary covenant would come into effect between Max and his touch, by which Max was defined as a well-off fellow tourist temporarily embarrassed by a malfunction in Cook's machinery. A common game among tourists, they knew what he was, and those who participated in the game did so for the same reason they haggled at shops or gave backsheesh to beggars. It was in the unwritten laws of Baedekerland. Max was one of the minor inconveniences to an almost perfectly arranged tourist state. The inconvenience was more than made up for in color. Finks now began a burst into life. Max looked up with interest. Merrymakers were coming across Rue de Rosette from a building which looked like an embassy or consulate. Party there must have only now broken up. The restaurant was filling rapidly. Max surveyed each newcomer, waiting for the imperceptible knob, the high sign. He decided at last on a group of four, two men, a small girl, and a young lady who, liked the gown she wore, seemed awkwardly bouffant and provincial. All English, of course, Max had his criteria. He also had an eye, and something about the group disturbed him. After eight years in this supranational domain, he knew a tourist when he saw one. The girls were almost certain, but their companions acted wrong, lacking a certain assurance, an instinctive way of belonging to the touristic part of Alex common to all cities, which even the green show their first time out. But it was getting late, and Max had nowhere to stay tonight, nor had he eaten. His opening line was unimportant, being only a choice among standard openers, each effective as long as the touches were eligible to play. It was the response that counted. Here it came out close to what he'd guessed. The two men, looking like a comedy team, one fair and fat, the other dark, red-faced and scrawny, seemed to want to play the gay dog. Fine, let them. Max knew how to be gay. During the introductions, his eyes may have stayed a half-second too long on Mildred Wren, but she was myopic and stocky, nothing of that old Alice in her at all. An ideal touch. All behaved as if they'd known him for years, but you somehow felt that through some horrible osmosis the word was going to get round. Wing in on the wind to every beggar, vagrant... Exile by choice and peregrine at large in Alex that the team of Porpentine and Goodfellow, plus the Wren sisters, were sitting at a table in the Fink. This whole hard-up population might soon begin to drift in one by one, each getting the same sort of reception drawn into the group cordially and casually as a close acquaintance who had left but a quarter of an hour before. Max was subject to visions. It would go on into tomorrow, the next day, the next... They would keep calling for waiters in the same cheery voices to bring more chairs, food, wine. Soon the other tourists would have to be sent away. Every chair in the Fink would be in use, spreading out from this table in rings like a tree trunk or rain puddle. And when the Fink's chairs ran out, the harassed waiters would have to begin bringing more in from next door and down the street, and then the next block, the next quarter. The seated beggars would overflow into the street. It would swell and swell, and the conversation would grow to enormity, each of the thousands participating bringing to it his own reminiscences, jokes, dreams, looninesses, epigrams, an entertainment, a grand vaudeville, 
They'd sit like that, eating when hunger came, getting drunk, sleeping it off, getting drunk again. How would it end? How could it? She'd been talking, the older girl, Victoria. White Verslauer gone, perhaps, to her head. Eighteen, Max guessed, slowly giving up his vision of vagrant's communion. About the age Alice would be now. Was there a bit of Alice there? Alice was, of course, another of his criteria. Well, the same queer mixture, at least, of girl at play, girl in heat, blithe and so green. She was Catholic, had been to a convent school near her home. This was her first trip abroad. She talked, perhaps, overmuch about her religion, had indeed for a time considered the Son of God as a young lady will consider any eligible bachelor, but had realized eventually that, of course, he was not, but maintained instead a great harem clad in black, decked only with rosaries. Unable to stand for any such competition, Victoria had therefore left the novitiate after a matter of weeks, but not the church. That, with its sad-faced statuary, odors of candles and incense, formed, along with an Uncle Evelyn, the foci of her serene orbit. The uncle, a wild or renegade sundowner, would arrive from Australia once every few years, bringing no gifts but his wonderful yarns. As far as Victoria remembered, he'd never repeated himself. More important, perhaps, she was given enough material to evolve between visits a private back of beyond, a colonial doll's world she could play with and within constantly, developing, exploring, manipulating, especially during Mass, for here was the stage or dramatic field already prepared, serviceable to a seed-time fancy. So it came about that God wore a wide-awake hat and fought skirmishes with an aboriginal Satan out at the antipodes of the firmament in the name and for the safekeeping of any Victoria. Now, Alice, it had been her clergyman, had it not, she was C of E, sturdy English, future mother, apple cheeks, all that. What is wrong with you, Max, he asked himself. Come out of that costume box, that cheerless past. This one's only Victoria, Victoria, but what was there about her? Normally in gatherings like this, Max could be talkative, amusing, not so much by way of paying for his meal or kip as to keep fit, retain the fine edge, the knack for telling a good yarn and gauging his own rapport with the audience in case, in case... He could go back into the business. There were touring companies abroad, even now, eight years aged, eyebrow line altered, hair dyed, the mustache, who'd know him? What need for exile? The story had spread to the troop and through them to all small urban and provincial England. But they'd all loved him, handsome, jolly Ralph, surely after eight years, even if he were recognized. But now Max found not much to say. The girl dominated the conversation, and it was the kind of conversation Max had no knack for. Here were none of your post-mortems on the day past, vistas, tombs, curious beggars, no bringing out of small prizes from the shops and bazaars, no speculation on tomorrow's itinerary, only a passing reference to a party tonight at the Austrian consulate. Here, instead, was unilateral confession, and Mildred contemplating a rock with trilobite fossils she'd found out near the site of the pharos and the two other men listening to Victoria, but yet off somewhere else, switching glances at each other, at the door, about the room. Dinner came, was eaten, went. But even with a filled belly, Max could not cheer up. They were somehow depressing. Max felt disquieted. What had he walked into? It showed bad judgment settling on this lot. My God, from Goodfellow. They looked up to see, materialized behind them, an emaciated figure in evening dress whose head appeared to be that of a nettled sparrowhawk. The head guffawed, retaining its fierce expression. Victoria bubbled over in a laugh. It's Hugh, she cried, delighted. Indeed, came a hollow voice from inside somewhere. Hugh Bongo Shaftesbury, said Goodfellow, ungracious. Harmachis. Bongo Shaftesbury indicated the ceramic hawk's head. God of Heliopolis and chief deity of Lower Egypt, 
Utterly genuine, this, a mask, you know, used in the ancient rituals. He seated himself next to Victoria. Goodfellow scowled. Literally, Horus on the horizon also represented as a lion with the head of a man, like the Sphinx. Oh, Victoria said, that languid, oh, the Sphinx. How far down the Nile do you intend to go? asked Porpentine. Mr. Goodfellow has mentioned your interest in Luxor. I feel it is fresh territory, sir, Bongo Shaftesbury replied. No first-rate work around the area since Grebo discovered the tomb of the Theban priests back in 91. Of course, one should have a look round the pyramids at Giza, but that is pretty much old hat since Mr. Flinders Petrie's painstaking inspection of 16 or 17 years ago. Now, what was this, Max wondered? An Egyptologist, was he, or only reciting from the pages of his Baedeker? Victoria poised prettily between Goodfellow and Bongo Shaftesbury, attempting to maintain a kind of flirtatious equilibrium. On the face of it, all normal. Rivalry for the young lady's attentions between the two. Mildred, a younger sister, Porpentine, perhaps a personal secretary, for Goodfellow did have the affluent look. But beneath? It came to the awareness reluctantly in Baedeker land, one doesn't often run across impostors. Duplicity is against the law. It is being a bad fellow. But they were only posing as tourists, playing a game different from Max's, and it frightened him. Talk at the table stopped. The faces of the three men lost whatever marks of specific passion they had held. The cause was approaching their table, an unremarkable figure wearing a cape, and blue eyeglasses. Hello, Lepsius, said Goodfellow. Tire of the climate in Brindisi, did you? Sudden business called me to Egypt. So the party had already grown from four to seven. Max remembered his vision. What quaint manner of peregrine here, these two. He saw a flicker of communication between the newcomers, rapid and nearly coinciding with a similar glance between Porpentine and Goodfellow. Was that how the sides were drawn up? Were there sides at all? Goodfellow sniffed at his wine. Your traveling companion, he said at last. We'd rather hoped to see him again. Go on to uh, Switzerland, said Lepsius, of clean winds, clean mountains. One can have enough one day of this soiled south. Unless you go far enough south, I imagine far enough down the Nile one gets back to a kind of primitive spotlessness. Good timing, Max noted, and the gestures preceded the lines as they should. Whoever they were, it was none of your amateur night. Lepsius speculated. Doesn't the law of the wild beast prevail down there? There are no property rights. There is fighting. The victor wins all, glory, life, power, and property. All. Perhaps, but in Europe, you know, we are civilized. Fortunately, jungle law is inadmissible. Odd. Neither Porpentine nor Bongo Shaftesbury spoke. Each had bent a close eye on his own man, keeping expressionless. "'Shall we meet again in Cairo, then?' said Lepsius. "'Most certainly,' nodding. Lepsius took his leave then. "'What a queer gentleman,' Victoria smiled, restraining Mildred, who'd cocked an arm, preparing to heave her rock at his retreating form. Bongo Shaftesbury turned to Porpentine. Is it queer to favor the clean over the impure? It may depend on one's employment, was Porpentine's rejoinder, and employer. Time had come for the fink to close up. Bongo Shaftesbury took the check with an alacrity which amused them all. Half the battle, thought Max. Out in the street he touched Porpentine's sleeve and began an apologetic denunciation of Cook's. Victoria skipped ahead across Rue Sharif Pasha to the hotel. Behind them, a closed carriage came rattling out of the drive beside the Austrian consulate and dashed away hell for leather down Rue de Rosette. Porpentine turned to watch it. Someone is in a hurry, Bongo Shaftesbury noted. Indeed, said Goodfellow. The three watched a few lights in the upper windows of the consulate. Quiet, though. 
Bongo Shaftesbury laughed quickly, perhaps a bit incredulous. Here, in the street, a fiver would see me through, Max had continued, trying to regain Porpentine's attention. Oh, Veg, of course I could spare it, fumbling naively with his wallet. Victoria watched them from the curb opposite. Do come along, she called. Good fellow grinned. Here, my dear, and started across with Bongo Shaftesbury. She stamped her foot. Mr. Porpentine. Porpentine, five quid between his fingertips, looked around. Do finish with your cripple. Give him his shilling and come. It's late. The white wine. A ghost of Alice first doubts that Porpentine was genuine. All could contribute to a violation of code, the code being only, Max, take whatever they give you. Max had already turned away from the note which fluttered in the street's wind, moved off against the wind, limping toward the next pool of light he sensed Porpentine still looked after him, also knew what he must look like, a little halt, less sure of his own memory's safety and of how many more pools of light he could reasonably expect from the street at night. 4. The Alexandria and Cairo Morning Express was late. It puffed into the Gare du Caire, slow, noisy, venting black smoke and white steam to mingle among palms and acacias in the park across the tracks from the station house. Of course, the train was late. Valdetar, the conductor, snorted good-naturedly at those on the platform. Tourists and businessmen, porters from cooks and gazes, poorer, third-class passengers with their impedimenta, like a bazaar. What else did they expect? Seven years he'd made the same leisurely run, and the train had never been on time. Schedules were for the line's owners, for those who calculated profit and loss. The train itself ran on a different clock, its own, which no human could read. Valdetar was not an Alexandrian. Born in Portugal, he now lived with a wife and three children near the railroad yards in Cairo. His life's progress had been inevitably east. Having somehow escaped the hothouse of his fellow Sephardim, he flew to the other extreme and developed an obsession with ancestral roots. Land of triumph, land of God, land of suffering also. Scenes of specific persecution upset him. But Alexandria was a special case. In the Jewish year 3554, Ptolemy Philopator, having been refused entrance to the temple at Jerusalem, returned to Alexandria and imprisoned many of the Jewish colony there. Christians were not the first to be put on exhibition and mass murdered for the amusement of a mob. Here Ptolemy, after ordering Alexandria's Jews confined in the Hippodrome, embarked on a two-day debauch. The king, his guests, and a herd of killer elephants fed on wine and aphrodisiacs. When all had been worked up to the proper level of bloodlust, the elephants were turned loose in the arena and driven upon the prisoners. But turned, goes the tale, on the guards and spectators instead, trampling many to death. So impressed was Ptolemy that he released the condemned, restored their privileges, and gave them leave to kill their enemies. Valdetar, a highly religious man, had heard the story from his father and was inclined to take the common-sense view. If there is no telling what a drunken human will do, so much less a herd of drunken elephants. Why put it down to God's intervention? There were enough instances of that in history, all regarded by Valdetar with terror and a sense of his own smallness. Noah's warning of the flood, the parting of the Red Sea, Lot's escape from annihilated Sodom. Men, he felt, even perhaps Sephardim, are at the mercy of the earth and its seas. Whether a cataclysm is accident or design, they need a god to keep them from harm. The storm and the earthquake have no mind. Soul cannot commend no soul, only God can. But elephants have souls. Anything that can get drunk, he reasoned, must have some soul. Perhaps this is all soul means. Events between soul and soul are not God's direct province. They are under the influence either of fortune or of virtue. 
fortune had saved the Jews in the Hippodrome. Merely trains hardware for any casual onlooker, Voldetar in private life was exactly this mist of philosophy, imagination, and continual worry over his several relationships, not only with God, but also with Nita, with their children, with his own history. There's no organized effort about it, but there remains a grand joke on all visitors to Baedeker's world. The permanent residents are actually humans in disguise. The secret is as well kept as the others, that statues talk, though the vocal Memnon of Thebes, certain sunrises, had been indiscreet, that some government buildings go mad and mosques make love. Passengers and baggage aboard, the train overcame its inertia and started off only a quarter of an hour behind schedule toward the climbing sun. The railway from Alexandria to Cairo describes a rough arc whose cord points southeast, but the train must first angle north to skirt Lake Mariotis. While Valdetar made his way among the first-class compartments to gather tickets, the train passed rich villages and gardens alive with palms and orange trees. Abruptly, these were left behind. Valdetar squeezed past a German with blue lenses for eyes and an Arab deep in conversation in time to enter a compartment and see from the window momentary death. Desert. The site of the ancient Eleusis, a great mound looking like the one spot on earth fertile Demeter had never seen, passed by to the south. At Sidi Jabba the train swung at last toward the southeast, inching slow as the sun. Zenith and Cairo would, in fact, be reached at the same time. Across the Mahmudia Canal, into a slow bloom of green, the delta, and clouds of ducks and pelicans rising from the shores of Mariotis, frightened by the noise. Beneath the lake were one hundred fifty villages, submerged by a man-made flood in 1801, when the English cut through an isthmus of desert during the siege of Alexandria to let the Mediterranean in. Valdetar liked to think that the waterfowl soaring thick in the air were ghosts of Fellahin. What submarine wonders at the floor of Mariotis! Lost country, houses, hovels, farms, water wheels, all intact. Did the narwhal pull their plows? Devil fish drive their water wheels? Down the embankment, a group of Arabs lazed about evaporating water from the lake for salt. Far down the canal were barges, their sails brave white under this sun. Under the same sun, Nita would be moving now about their little yard, growing heavy with what Valdetar hoped would be a boy. A boy could even it up two and two. Women outnumber us now, he thought. Why should I contribute further to the imbalance? Though I'm not against it, he'd once told her during their courtship. Partway here in Barcelona, when he was stevedoring at the docks. God's will, is it not? Look at Solomon, at many great kings— one man, several wives. Great king, she yelled. Who? They both started to laugh like children. One peasant girl you can't even support, which is no way to impress a young man you are bent on marrying. It was one of the reasons he fell in love with her shortly afterward and why they'd stayed in love for nearly seven years of monogamy. Nita, Nita, the mind's picture was always of her seated behind their house at dusk, where the cries of children were drowned in the whistle of a night train for Suez, where cinders came to lodge in pores beginning to widen under the stresses of some heart's geology. Your complexion is going from bad to worse, he'd say. I'll have to start paying more attention to the lovely young French girls who are always making eyes at me. Fine, she'd retort. I'll tell that to the baker when he comes to sleep with me tomorrow. It'll make him feel better were all the nostalgias of an Iberian literal lost to them. The squid hung to dry, nets stretched across any sky-glow morning or evening, singing or drunken cries of sailors and fishermen from behind only the next looming warehouse, 
Find them, find them, voices whose misery is all the world's night, came unreal in a symbolic way, as a racketing of a points, a chuff, chuff of inanimate breath, and had only pretended to gather among the pumpkins, purslane and cucumbers, lone date palm, roses, and poinsettias of their garden. Halfway to Damanhur, he heard a child crying from a compartment nearby. Curious, Valdetar looked inside. The girl was English, eleven or so, nearsighted. Her watering eyes swam distorted behind thick eyeglasses. Across from her a man, thirty or so, harangued. Another looked on, perhaps angry, his burning face at least giving the illusion. The girl held a rock to her flat bosom. "'But have you never played with a clockwork doll?' the man insisted, the voice muffled through the door. "'A doll which does everything perfectly, because of the machinery inside, walks, sings, jumps rope. "'Real little boys and girls, you know, cry. Act sullen, won't behave.' His hands lay perfectly still, long and starved, nervous, one on each knee. "'Bongo Shaftesbury,' the other began. Bongo Shaftesbury waved him off, irritated. Come, may I show you a mechanical doll, an electro-mechanical doll. Have you one? She was frightened, Valdetar thought, with an onrush of sympathy, seeing his own girls. Damn some of these English. Have you one with you? I am one, Bongo Shaftesbury smiled, and pushed back the sleeve of his coat to remove a cufflink. He rolled up the shirt cuff and thrust the naked underside of his arm at the girl. Shiny and black, sewn into the flesh, was a miniature electric switch. Single pole, double throw. Valdita recoiled and stood blinking. Thin silver wires ran from its terminals up the arm, disappearing under the sleeve. You see, Mildred, these wires run into my brain. When the switch is closed, like this, I act the way I do now. When it is thrown the other... Papa! the girl cried. Everything works by electricity, simple and clean. Stop it, said the other Englishman. Why, Porpentine, vicious. Why, for her? Touched by her fright, are you, or is it for yourself? Porpentine seemed to retreat bashfully. One doesn't frighten a child, sir. Hurrah! General principles again. Corpse, fingers jabbed in the air. But some day, Porpentine, I or another will catch you off guard. Loving... Hating, even showing some absent-minded sympathy. I'll watch you. The moment you forget yourself enough to admit another's humanity, see him as a person and not a symbol, then, perhaps, what is humanity? You ask the obvious, ha <laughs> ha. Humanity is something to destroy. There was noise from the rear car behind Valdetar. Porpentine came dashing out, and they collided. Mildred had fled, clutching her rock to the adjoining compartment. The door to the rear platform was open. In front of it, a fat, florid Englishman wrestled with the Arab Valdetar had seen earlier talking to the German. The Arab had a pistol. Porpentine moved toward them, closing cautiously, choosing his point. Valdetar, recovering at last, hurried in to break up the fight. Before he could reach them, Porpentine had let loose a kick at the Arab's throat, catching him across the windpipe. The Arab collapsed, rattling. No. Porpentine pondered. The fat Englishman had taken the pistol. "'What is the trouble?' Valdetar demanded, in his best public servant's voice. "'Nothing,' Porpentine held out a sovereign. "'Nothing that cannot be healed by this sovereign cure.' Valdetar shrugged. Between them they got the Arab to a third-class compartment, instructed the attendant there to look after him, he was sick, and to put him off at Damanhur. A blue mark was appearing on the Arab's throat. He tried to talk several times. He looked sick enough. When the Englishmen had at last returned to their compartments, Valdetar fell into reverie, which continued on past Amanhur, where he saw the Arab and blue-lensed German again conversing. Through a narrowing delta, as the sun rose toward noon and the train crawled toward Cairo's principal station, as dozens of small children ran alongside the train calling for bakshish, as girls in blue cotton skirts and veils with breasts made sleek brown by the sun traipsed down to the Nile to fill their water jars, 
as water wheels spun and irrigation canals glittered and interlaced away to the horizon, as Fellaheen lounged under the palms, as buffalo paced their every day's tracks round and round the sequias. The point of the green triangle is Cairo. It means that, relatively speaking, assuming your train stands still and the land moves past, that the twin wastes of the Libyan and Arabian deserts to right and left creep in inexorably to narrow the fertile and quick part of your world until you are left with hardly more than a right of way, and before you a great city. So there crept in on the gentle Valdetar a suspicion cheerless as the desert. If they are what I think, what sort of world is it when they must let children suffer? Thinking, of course, of Manuel, Antonia, and Maria, his own. Five. The desert creeps in on a man's land, not a fellow, but he does own some land, did own. From a boy he has repaired the wall, mortared, carried stone heavy as he, lifted, set in place. Still, the desert comes. Is the wall a traitor letting it in? Is the boy possessed by a djinn who makes his hands do the work wrong? Is the desert's attack too powerful for any boy or wall or dead father and mother? No, the desert moves in. It happens, nothing else. No djinn in the boy, no treachery in the wall, no hostility in the desert, nothing. Soon, nothing. Soon, only the desert. The two goats must choke on sand, nuzzling down to find the white clover. He, never to taste their soured milk again. The melons die beneath the sand. Never more can you give comfort in the summer. Cool Abdullahi, shaped like the angel's trumpet. The maize dies and there is no bread. The wife, the children grow sick and short-tempered. The man, he runs one night out to where the wall was, begins to lift and toss imaginary rocks about, curses Allah, then begs forgiveness from the prophet, then urinates on the desert, hoping to insult what cannot be insulted. They find him in the morning, a mile from the house, skin-blued, shivering in a sleep which is almost death, Tears turned to frost on the sand. And now the house begins to fill with desert, like the lower half of an hourglass which will never be inverted again. What does a man do? Jebrail shot a quick look back at his fare. Even here, in the Azbekia garden at high noon, these horses' hooves sounded hollow, you jolly damn right, Ingleasy. A man comes to the city and drives for you, and every other Frank with land to return to. His family lives altogether in a room no bigger than your W.C., out in Arabian Cairo, where you never go because it's too dirty and not curious. Where the street is so narrow, hardly a man's shadow can pass. A street, like many, not on any guidebook's map where the houses pile up in steps so high that the windows of two buildings may touch across the street and hide the sun, where goldsmiths live in filth and tend tiny flames to make adornment for your traveling English ladies. Five years Jebrail had hated them, hated the stone buildings and metalled roads, the iron bridges and glass windows of Shepherd's Hotel, which it seemed were only different forms of the same dead sand that had taken his home. The city, Jebrail often told his wife, just after admitting he'd come home drunk and just before beginning to yell at his children, the five of them curled blind in the windowless room above the barber like so many puppy bodies. The city is only the desert, Jebel in disguise. Jebel? Jebrail... Why should he not call himself by the desert's name? Why not? The Lord's angel, Jabrail, dictated the Koran to Muhammad, the Lord's prophet. What a joke if all that holy book were only twenty-three years of listening to the desert, a desert which has no voice, 
If the Quran were nothing, then Islam was nothing. Then Allah was a story and his paradise wishful thinking. Fine. The fair leaned over his shoulder, smelling of garlic like an Italian. Wait here. But dressed like an Inglese. How horrible the face looked. Dead skin peeling off the burned face in white rags. They were in front of Shepherd's Hotel. Since noon, they'd been all over the fashionable part of the city, from Hotel Victoria, where oddly his fare had emerged from the servants' entrance. They had driven first to the Quarter Rosetti, then a few stops along the Muski, then uphill to the Rondpoint, where Jebrail waited while the Englishman disappeared for half an hour into the bazaar's pungent labyrinth. Visiting, perhaps. Now he'd seen the girl before, surely. The girl in the quarter Rosetti. Coptic, probably. Eyes made impossibly huge with mascara. Nose slightly hooked and bowed. Two vertical dimples on either side of the mouth. Crocheted shawl covering hair and back. High cheekbones, warm brown skin. Of course, she'd been a fair. He remembered the face. She was mistress to some clerk or other in the British consulate. Jabrail had picked the boy up for her in front of the Hotel Victoria, across the street. Another time they'd gone to her rooms. It helped Jabrail to remember faces. Brought in more bakshish if you bade them good day any second time. How could you say they were people, they were money? What did he care about the love affairs of the English? Charity, selfless or erotic, was as much a lie as the Koran, did not exist. One merchant in the Muski, too, he had seen, a jewel merchant who had lent money to the Mahdists and was afraid his sympathies would become known now that the movement was crushed. What did the Englishman want there? He had brought no jewels away from the shop, though he'd remained inside for nearly an hour. Jabrail shrugged. They were both fools. The only Mahdi is the desert. Muhammad Ahmed, the Mahdi of eighty-three, was believed by some to be sleeping, not dead, in a cavern near Baghdad. And on the last day when the Prophet Christ reestablishes El Islam as the religion of the world, he will return to life to slay Dajjal, the Antichrist, at a church gate somewhere in Palestine. The angel Asrafil will trumpet a blast to kill everything on earth and another to awaken the dead. But Jebrail, Jebel, the desert's angel, had hidden all the trumpets beneath the sand. The desert was prophecy enough of the last day. Jebrail lounged exhausted against the seat of his pinto-colored phaeton. He watched the hindquarters of the poor horse, a poor horse's ass, he nearly laughed. Was this a revelation, then, from God? Haze hung over the city. Tonight he would get drunk with an acquaintance who sold sycamore figs, whose name Jebrail didn't know. The fig hawker believed in the last day. Saw it, in fact, close at hand. Rumors, he said darkly, smiling at the girl with the rotting teeth who worked the Arabian cafes, looking for love-needy francs with her baby on one shoulder. Political rumors. Politics is a lie. Far up the Bahar el Abiyad, in the heathen jungle, is a place called Fashoda. The Franks, Inglisi, Ferencawi, will fight a great battle there, which will spread in all directions to engulf the world. And Asrafil will sound the call to arms, snorted Jebrail. He cannot, he is a lie, his trumpet is a lie. The only truth is the desert, is the desert. Wayat Abuk, God forbid. And the fig hawker went off into the smoke to get more brandy. Nothing was coming, nothing was already here. Back came the Englishman with his gangrenous face. A fat friend followed him out of the hotel. Bide time, the fair called mirthfully. Ha, ho, I'm taking Victoria to the opera tomorrow night. Back in the cab. There is a chemist's shop near the Crédit Lyonnais. Weary Jebrail gathered the reins. 
Night was coming rapidly. This haze would make the stars invisible. Brandy, too, would help. Jabrail enjoyed starless nights, as if a great lie were finally to be exposed. Six. Three in the morning, hardly a sound in the streets, and time for Girgis, the mountebank, to be about his nighttime avocation, burglary. Breeze in the acacias, that was all. Girgis huddled in bushes near the back of Shepherd's Hotel. While the sun was up, he and a crew of Syrian acrobats and a trio from Port Said, dulcimer, Nubian drum, reed pipe, performed in a cleared space by the Ismailia Canal, out in the suburbs, near the slaughterhouse of Abbasia. A fair. There were swings and a fearsome steam-driven carousel for the children, serpent charmers and hawkers of all refreshment, toasted seeds of abdullahi, limes, fried treacle, water flavored with licorice or orange blossom, meat puddings. His customers were the children of Cairo and those aged children of Europe, the tourists. Take from them by day, take from them by night. If only his bones weren't beginning so much to feel it. Performing the tricks with silk kerchiefs, folding boxes, a mysteriously pocketed cloak decorated outside with hieroglyphic plows, scepters, feeding ibis, lily, and sun. Sleight of hand and burglary needed light hands, bones of rubber. But the clowning, that took it out of him. Hardened the bones, bones that should be alive, not rock rods under the flesh. Falling off the top of a motley pyramid of Syrians, making the dive look as near fatal as it actually was, or else engaging the bottom man in a slapstick routine so violent that the whole construction tottered and swayed, mock horror appearing on the faces of the others, while the children laughed, shrieked, closed their eyes, or enjoyed the suspense. That was the only real compensation, he supposed. God knew it wasn't the pay. A response from the children, buffoon's treasure. Enough, enough. Best get this over, he decided, and to bed as soon as possible. One of these days he'd climb up on that pyramid so exhausted, reflexes off enough that the neck-breaking routine would be no sham. Jirgis shivered in the same wind that cooled the acacias. Up, he told his body, up. That window. And was halfway erect before he saw his competition. Another comic acrobat climbing out a window some ten feet above the bushes Jirgis crouched in. Patience, then. Study his technique. We can always learn. The other's face, turned in profile, seemed wrong, but it was only the streetlight. Feet now on a narrow ledge, the man began to inch along, crab-like, toward the corner of the building. After a few steps, stopped, began to pick at his face. Something white fluttered down, tissue-thin, into the bushes. Skin? Jirgis shivered again. He had a way of repressing thoughts of disease. Apparently the ledge narrowed toward the corner. The thief was hugging the wall closer. He reached the corner. As he stood with each foot on a different side and the edge of the building bisecting him from eyebrows to abdomen, he lost his balance and fell. On the way down he yelled out an obscenity in English, then hit the shrubbery with a crash, rolled and lay still for a while. A match flared and went out, leaving only the pulsing coal of a cigarette. Jujis was all sympathy. He could see it happening to himself one day in front of the children, old and young. If he'd believed in signs, he would have given it up for tonight and gone back to the tent they all shared near the slaughterhouse. But how could he stay alive on the few milliams tossed his way during the day? Mountebank is a dying profession, he'd reckon, in his lighter moments. All the good ones have moved into politics. The Englishman put out his cigarette, rose, and began to climb a tree nearby. Jujis lay muttering old curses. He could hear the Englishman wheezing and talking to himself as he ascended, crawled out on a limb, straddled it, and peered in a window. After a lag of fifteen seconds, 
Jurgis distinctly heard the words, a bit thick, you know, from the tree. Another cigarette coal appeared, then abruptly swung in a quick arc downward and hung a few feet below the limb. The Englishman was swinging by one arm from the limb. This is ridiculous, Jurgis thought. Crash! The Englishman fell into the bushes again. Jurgis got cautiously to his feet and went over to him. Bongo Shaftesbury, the Englishman said, hearing Jurgis approach. He lay looking up at a starless zenith, picking absently at flakes of dead skin on his face. Jurgis stopped a few feet away. Not yet, the other continued. You haven't got me quite yet. They're up there on my bed, good fellow and the girl. We've been together now for two years, and I can't begin, you know, to count all the girls he's done this to, as if every capital of Europe were Margate, and the promenade a continent long. He began to sing. It isn't the girl I saw you with in Brighton. Who, who, who's your lady friend? Mad, thought Judges, pitying. The sun hadn't stopped with this poor fellow's face. It had gone on into the brain. She will be in love with him, whatever the word means. He will leave her. Do you think I care? One accepts his partner as one does any tool, with all its idiosyncrasies. I had read Goodfellow's dossier. I knew what I was getting. But perhaps the sun and what is happening down the Nile and the knife switch on your arm, which I did not expect, and the frightened child, and now, he gestured up at the window, he'd laughed, have thrown me off. We all have a threshold. Put your revolver away, Bongo Shaftesbury. There's a good fellow. And wait, only wait. She is still faceless, still expendable. God, who knows how many of us will have to be sacrificed this coming week. She is the least of my worries. She and good fellow. What comfort could Jujis give him? His English wasn't good. He'd only understood half the words. The madman had not moved, had only continued to stare at the sky. Jurgis opened his mouth to speak, thought better of it, and began to back away. He realized all at once how tired he was, how much the days of acrobatics took out of him. Would that alienated figure on the ground be Jurgis some day? I am getting old, Jurgis thought. I have seen my own ghost. But I'll have a look at the Hotel du Nil anyway. The tourists there aren't as rich, but we all do what we can. 7. The beer halle, north of the Asbekia Garden, had been created by North European tourists in their own image. One memory of home among the dark-skinned and tropical, but so German as to be ultimately a parody of home. Hannah had held on to the job only because she was stout and blonde. A smaller brunette from the South had stayed for a time, but was finally let go because she didn't look German enough. A Bavarian peasant, but not German enough. The whims of Berblick, the owner, got only amusement from Hannah. Bred to patience, a barmaid since age thirteen, she had cultivated and perfected a vast, cow-like calm, which served her now in good stead among the drunkenness sex for sale, and general fatuousness of the beer halle. To the bovine of this world, this tourist world at least, love comes, is undergone, and goes away unobtrusive as possible. So with Hanna and the itinerant Lepsius, a salesman, said he, of ladies' jewelry, who was she to question? Having been through it, her phrase, Hanna, schooled in the ways of an unsentimental world, knew well enough that men were obsessed with politics almost as much as women with marriage, knew the beer halle to be more than a place only to get drunk or fixed up with a woman, just as its list of frequent customers did comprise individuals strange to Karl Baedeker's way of life. How upset Berblick would be could he see her lover. Hannah mooned about the kitchen now in the slack period between dinner and serious drinking, up to her elbows in soapy water. Lepsius was certainly not German enough, half a head shorter than Hannah, eyes so delicate that he must wear tinted glasses even in the murk of Berblick's, and such poor thin arms and legs. There is a competitor in town, he confided to her, pushing an inferior line, underselling us. It's unethical, don't you see? 
She nodded. Well, if he came in, anything she happened to overhear, a rotten business, nothing he'd ever want to subject a woman to, but... For his poor weak eyes, his loud snoring, his boy-like way of mounting her, taking too long to come to rest in the embrace of her fat legs, of course she would go on watch for any competitor. English she was, and somewhere had got a bad touch of the sun. All day, through the slower morning hours, her hearing seemed to grow sharper, so that at noon, when the kitchen erupted gently into disorder, nothing outright, a few delayed orders, a dropped plate which shattered like her tender eardrums, she'd heard perhaps more than she was intended to. Fashoda. Fashoda. The word washed about Burblix like a pestilent rain. Even the faces changed. Gruner, the chef, Werner, the bartender, Musa, the boy who swept floors, Lota and Eva and the other girls all seemed to have turned shifty, to have been hiding secrets all this time. There was even something sinister about the usual slap on the buttocks Burblick gave Hannah as she passed by. Imagination, she told herself. She'd always been a practical girl, not given to fancy. Could this be one of love's side effects? To bring on visions and courage voices which did not exist? To make the chewing and second digestion of any cud only more difficult? It worried Hannah, who thought she knew everything about love. How was Lepsius different? A little slower, a little weaker, certainly no high priest at the business, no more mysterious or remarkable than any other of a dozen strangers. Damn men and their politics. Perhaps it was a kind of sex for them. Didn't they even use the same word for what a man does to a woman and what a successful politician does to his unlucky opponent? What was Fashoda to her? Or Marchand, or Kitchener, or whatever their names were, the two who had met. Met for what? Anna laughed, shaking her head. She could imagine for what. She pushed back a straggle of yellow hair with one soap-bleached hand. Odd how the skin died and grew soggy white. It looked like leprosy. Since midday, a certain leitmotif of disease had come jittering in, had half revealed itself latent in the music of Cairo's afternoon. Fashoda. Fashoda. A word to give pale, unspecific headaches. A word suggestive of jungle and outlandish microorganisms. And fevers, which were not loves, the only she'd known, after all being a healthy girl. Or anything humans. Was it a change in the light? Or were the skins of the others actually beginning to show the blotches of disease? She rinsed and stacked the last plate. No, a stain. Back went the plate into the dishwater. Anna scrubbed, then examined the plate again, tilting it toward the light. The stain was still there, hardly visible. Roughly triangular, it extended from an apex near the center to a base an inch or so from the edge. A sort of brown color... Outlines indistinct against the faded white of the plate's surface. She tilted the plate another few degrees toward the light, and the stain disappeared. Puzzled, she moved her head to look at it from another angle. The stain flickered twice in and out of existence. Anna found that if she focused her eyes a little behind and off the edge of the plate, the stain would remain fairly constant, though its shape had begun to change outline. Now crescent, now trapezoid. Annoyed, she plunged the plate back into the water and searched among the kitchen gear under the sink for a stiffer brush. Was the stain real? She didn't like its color, the color of her headache, pallid brown. It is a stain, she told herself. That's all it is, she scrubbed fiercely. Outside, the beer drinkers were coming in from the street. Hana, called Burbick. Oh, God, would it never go away? She gave it up at last and stacked the plate with the other dishes. But now it seemed the stain had fissioned and transferred like an overlay to each of her retinae. A quick look at her hair in the mirror fragment over the sink, then on went a smile and out went Hanna to wait on her countrymen. Of course, the first face she saw was that of the competitor. It sickened her mottled red and white, and loose wisps of skin hanging. 
He was conferring anxiously with Varkumian, the pimp, whom she knew. She began to make passes. Lord Cromer could keep it from avalanching. So are every whore and assassin in Cairo. In the corner someone vomited. Hannah rushed to clean it up. If they should assassinate Cromer, bad show to have no consul general, it will degenerate. Amorous embrace from a customer, Burblick approached with a friendly scowl. Keep him safe at all costs. Capable men in this sick world are at a... Bongo Shaftesbury will try. The opera. Where? Not the opera. Asbekia Garden. The opera. Manolisco. Who did say? I know her. Zenobia the Copt. Kenneth Slime at the Embassy's Girl. Love. She paid attention. Has it from Slime that Cromer is taking no precautions? My God, good fellow and I barged in this morning as Irish tourists. He in a moldy morning hat with a shamrock, I in a red beard. They threw us bodily into the street. No precautions. Oh, God. God with a shamrock. Good fellow wanted to lob a bomb. As if nothing could wake him up, doesn't he read the... A long wait by the bar while Werner and Musa tapped a new keg. The triangular stain swam somewhere over the crowd like a tongue on Pentecost. Now that they have met, they will stay, I imagine, round the jungles round. Will it be, do you think? If it begins, it will be round... Where? Fashoda. Fashoda. Hannah continued on her way through the establishment's doors and into the street. Gruna, the waiter, found her ten minutes later leaning back against a shop front, gazing on the night garden with mild eyes. Come. What is Fashoda, Gruna? Shrug. A place like Munich, Weimar, Kiel. A town, but in the jungle. What does it have to do with women's jewelry? Come in. The girls and I can't handle that herd. I see something. Do you? Floating over the park. From across the canal came the whistle of the night express for Alexandria. Bitte. Some common nostalgia for the cities of home, for the train, or only its whistle, may have held them for a moment. Then the girl shrugged, and they returned to the beer holla. Varkumian had been replaced by a young girl in a flowered dress. The leprous Englishman seemed upset. With ruminant resourcefulness, Hannah rolled her eyes, thrust bosoms at a middle-aged bank clerk seated with cronies at the table next to the couple, received and accepted an invitation to join them. I followed you, the girl said. Papa would die if he found out. Hannah could see her face half in shadow. About Mr. Goodfellow... Pause. Then. Your father was in a German church this afternoon, as we are now in a German beer hall. Sir Alistair was listening to someone play Bach, as if Bach were all that were left. Another pause. So that he may know. She hung her head, a mustache of beer foam on her upper lip. There came one of those queer lulls in the noise level of any room, in its center, another whistle from the Alexandria Express. You love good fellow, he said. Yes, nearly a whisper. Whatever I may think, she said, I have guessed. You can't believe me, but I must say it. It's true. What would you have me do then? Twisting ringlets round her fingers. Nothing. Only understand. How can you? exasperated. Men can get killed, don't you see, for understanding someone the way you want it. Is your whole family daft? Will they be content with nothing less than the heart, lights, and liver? It was not love. Hannah excused herself and left. It was not man-woman. The stain was still with her. What could she tell Lepsius tonight? She had only the desire to remove his spectacles snap and crush them and watch him suffer. How delightful it would be. This from gentle, 
Hannah Akirza. Had the world gone mad with Fashoda? 8. The corridor runs by the curtained entrances to four boxes, located to audience right at the top level of the summer theater in the Esbekia Garden. A man wearing blue spectacles hurries into the second box from the stage end of the corridor. The red curtains, heavy velvet, swing to and fro unsynchronized after his passage. The oscillation soon damps out because of the weight. They hang still. Ten minutes pass. Two men turn the corner by the allegorical statue of tragedy. Their feet crush unicorns and peacocks that repeat diamond fashion the entire length of the carpet. The face of one is hardly to be distinguished beneath masses of white tissue which have obscured the features and changed slightly the outlines of the face. The other is fat. They enter the box next to the one the man with the blue spectacles is in. Light from outside, late summer light now falls through a single window, turning the statue and the figured carpet to a monochrome orange. Shadows become more opaque. The air between seems to thicken with an indeterminate color, though it is probably orange. Then a girl in a flowered dress comes down the hall and enters the box occupied by the two men. Minutes later she emerges, tears in her eyes and on her face. The fat man follows. They pass out of the field of vision. The silence is total, so there's no warning when the red and white-faced man comes through his curtains holding a drawn pistol. The pistol smokes. He enters the next box. Soon he and the man with the blue spectacles, struggling, pitch through the curtains and fall to the carpet. Their lower halves are still hidden by the curtains. The man with the white blotched face removes the blue spectacles, snaps them in two, and drops them to the floor. The other shuts his eyes tightly, tries to turn his head away from the light. Another has been standing at the end of the corridor. From this vantage he appears only as a shadow. The window is behind him. The man who removed the spectacles now crouches, forcing the prostrate one's head toward the light. The man at the end of the corridor makes a small gesture with his right hand. The crouching man looks that way and half rises. A flame appears in the area of the other's right hand. Another flame. Another. The flames are colored a brighter orange than the sun. Vision must be the last to go. There must also be a nearly imperceptible line between an eye that reflects and an eye that receives. The half-crouched body collapses. The face and its masses of white skin loom ever closer. At rest, the body is assumed exactly into the space of this vantage. Chapter 4 in which Esther gets a nose job. V. Next evening, prim and nervous thawed in a rear seat of the crosstown bus, Esther divided her attention between the delinquent wilderness outside and a paperback copy of The Search for Bridie Murphy. This book had been written by a Colorado businessman to tell people there was life after death. In its course, he touched upon metempsychosis, faith healing, extrasensory perception, and the rest of a weird canon of twentieth-century metaphysics we've come now to associate with the city of Los Angeles and similar regions. The bus driver was of the normal or placid crosstown type, having fewer traffic lights and stops to cope with than the up-and-downtown drivers. He could afford to be genial. A portable radio hung by his steering wheel, tuned to WQXR. Tchaikovsky's Romeo and Juliet overture flowed syrupy around him and his passengers. As the bus crossed Columbus Avenue, a faceless delinquent heaved a rock at it. Cries in Spanish ascended to it out of the darkness. A report which could have been either a backfire or a gunshot sounded a few blocks downtown. 
Captured in the score's black symbols given life by vibrating air columns and strings, having taken passage through transducers, coils, capacitors, and tubes to a shuddering paper cone, the eternal drama of love and death continued to unfold entirely disconnected from this evening and place. The bus entered the sudden waste country of Central Park. Out there, Esther knew, up and downtown, they would be going at it under bushes, mugging, raping, killing. She, her world, knew nothing of the square confines of the park after sundown. It was reserved as if by covenant for cops, delinquents, and all manner of deviates. Suppose she were telepathic and could tune in on what was going on out there. She preferred not to think about it. There would be power in telepathy, she thought, but much pain. And someone else might tap your own mind without your knowing. Had Rachel been listening in on the phone extension? She touched the tip of her new nose delicately in secret, a mannerism she'd developed just recently, not so much to point it out to whoever might be watching as to make sure it was still there. The bus came out of the park onto the safe, bright east side, into the lights of Fifth Avenue. They reminded her to go shopping tomorrow for a dress she'd seen, $39.95 at Lord & Taylor, which he would like. What a brave girl I am, she trilled to herself, coming through so much night and lawlessness to visit my lover. She got off at First Avenue and tap-tapped along the sidewalk, facing uptown in perhaps some dream. Soon she turned right, began to fish in her purse for a key, found the door opened, stepped inside. The front rooms were all deserted. Beneath the mirror, two golden imps in a clock danced the same unsyncopated tango they'd always danced. Astor felt home. Behind the operating room, a sentimental glance sideways through the open door toward the table on which her face had been altered, was a small chamber, in it a bed, he lay, head and shoulders circled by the intense halo of a paraboloid reading light. His eyes opened to her, her arms to him. You are early, he said. I am late, she answered, already stepping out of her skirt. 1. Sean Maker, being conservative, referred to his profession as the art of Taliacozzi. His own methods, while not as primitive as those of the sixteenth-century Italian, were marked by a certain sentimental inertia, so that Schoenmaker was never quite up to date. He went out of his way to cultivate the Togliacozzi look, showing his eyebrows thin and semicircular, wearing a bushy mustache, pointed beard, sometimes even a skullcap, his old schoolboy yarmulke. He'd received his impetus, like the racket itself, from the World War. At seventeen, coeval with the century, he raised a mustache, which he never shaved off, falsified his age and name, and wallowed off in a fetid troop ship to fly, so he thought, high over the ruined chateaus and scarred fields of France, got up like an earless raccoon to scrimmage with the Hun, a brave Icarus. Well, the kid never did get up in the air, but they made him a grease monkey, which was more than he'd expected anyway. It was enough. He got to know the guts not only of Brigades, Bristol Fighters, and JNs, but also of the Birdman who did go up, and whom, of course, he adored. There was always a certain feudal homosexual element in this division of labor. Sean Maker felt like a page boy. Since those days, as we know, democracy has made its inroads, and those crude flying machines have evolved into weapon systems of a then undreamed of complexity, so that the maintenance man today has to be as professional noble as the flight crew he supports. But then it was a pure and abstract passion, directed for Schoenmaker at least toward the face. His own mustache may have been partly responsible. He was often mistaken for a pilot. On off hours, infrequently, he would sport a silk kerchief obtained in Paris at his throat by way of imitation. The war being what it was, 
certain of the faces, craggy or smooth, with slicked-down hair or bald, never came back. To this, the young Sean Maker responded with all adolescent love's flexibility, his free-floating affection sad and thwarted for a time till it managed to attach itself to a new face. But in each case, loss was as unspecified as the proposition, love dies. They flew off and were swallowed in the sky. Until Evan Godolphin, a liaison officer in his middle thirties, TDY with the Americans for reconnaissance missions over the Argonne Plateau. Godolphin carried the natural foppishness of the early aviators to extremes, which in the time's hysterical context seemed perfectly normal. Here were no trenches, after all. The air up there was free of any taint of gas or comrades' decay. Combatants on both sides could afford to break champagne glasses in the majestic fireplaces of commandeered country seats, treat their captives with utmost courtesy, adhere to every point of the duelo when it came to a dogfight. In short, practice with finicking care the entire rigmarole of nineteenth-century gentlemen at war. Evan Godolphin wore a Bond Street tailored flying suit, would often, dashing clumsily across the scars of their makeshift airfield toward his French spad, stop to pluck a lone poppy, survivor of strafing by autumn and the Germans, naturally aware of the Flanders Fields poem and punch, three years ago when there'd still been an idealistic tinge to trench warfare, and insert it into one faultless lapel. Godolphin became Schoenmaker's hero. Tokens tossed his way, an occasional salute, a well-done for the pre-flights which came to be the boy mechanic's responsibility, a tense smile, were hoarded fervently. Perhaps he saw an end also to this unrequited love. Doesn't a latent sense of death always heighten the pleasure of such an involvement? The end came soon enough. One rainy afternoon toward the end of the Battle of Meuse-Argonne, Godolphin's crippled plane materialized suddenly out of all that gray, looped feebly, dipped on a wing toward the ground, and slid like a kite in an air current toward the runway. It missed the runway by a hundred yards. By the time it impacted, corpsmen and stretcher-bearers were already running out toward it. Schoenmaker happened to be nearby and tagged along, having no idea what had happened till he saw the heap of rags and splinters, already soggy in the rain, and from it, limping toward the medics, the worst possible travesty of a human face, lolling atop an animate corpse. The top of the nose had been shot away. Shrapnel had torn out part of one cheek and shattered half the chin. The eyes, intact, showed nothing. Schoenmaker must have lost himself. The next he could remember, he was back at an aid station trying to convince the doctors there to take his own cartilage. Godolphin would live, they'd decided, but his face would have to be rebuilt. Life for the young officer would be otherwise unthinkable. Now, luckily for some, a law of supply and demand had been at work in the field of plastic surgery. Godolphin's case by 1918 was hardly unique. Methods had been in existence since the 5th century B.C. for rebuilding noses. Tiersch grafts had been around for forty or so years. During the war, new techniques were developed by necessity and were practiced by G.P.'s, eye, ear, nose, and throat men, even a hastily recruited gynecologist or two. The techniques that worked were adopted and passed on quickly to the younger medics. Those that failed produced a generation of freaks and pariahs who, along with those who'd received no restorative surgery at all, became a secret and horrible post-war fraternity. No good at all in any of the usual rungs of society, where did they go? Profane would see some of them under the street. Others you could meet at any rural crossroads in America— as Profane had, come to a new road, right angles to his progress, smelled the diesel exhaust of a truck long gone like walking through a ghost, and seen there like a milestone one of them. 
whose limp might mean a brocade or bas-relief of scar tissue down one leg. How many women had looked and shied, whose cicatrix on the throat would be hidden modestly like a gaudy war decoration, whose tongue, protruding through a hole in the cheek, would never speak secret words with any extra mouth. Evan Godolphin proved to be one of them. The doctor was young. He had ideas of his own, which the AEF was no place for. His name was Halidom, and he favored allografts. The introduction of inert substances into the living face. It was suspected at the time that the only safe transplants to use were cartilage or skin from the patient's own body. Schoenmaker, knowing nothing about medicine, offered his cartilage, but the gift was rejected. Allografting was plausible, and Halidom saw no reason for two men being hospitalized when only one had to be. Thus, Godolphin received a nose bridge of ivory, a cheekbone of silver, and a paraffin and celluloid chin. A month later, Schoenmaker went to visit him in the hospital, the last time he ever saw Godolphin. The reconstruction had been perfect. He was being sent back to London in some obscure staff position and spoke with a grim flippancy. Take a long look. It won't be good for more than six months. Schoenmaker stammered. Godolphin continued. See him down the way? Two cots over lay what would have been a similar casualty, except that the skin of the face was whole, shiny, but the skull beneath was misshapen. Foreign body reaction, they call it, sometimes infection, inflammation, sometimes only pain. The paraffin, for instance, doesn't hold shape. Before you know it, you're back where you started. He talked like a man under death sentence. Perhaps I can pawn my cheekbone. It's worth a fortune. Before they melted it down, it was one of a set of pastoral figurines, 18th century, nymphs, shepherdesses, looted from a chateau the Hun was using for a CP. Lord knows where they're originally from. Couldn't... Schoenmaker's throat was dry. Couldn't they fix it somehow, start over? Too rushed. I'm lucky to get what I got. I can't complain. Think of the devils who haven't even six months to bash around in. What will you do when... I'm not thinking of that. But it will be a grand six months. The young mechanic stayed in a kind of emotional limbo for weeks. He worked without the usual slacking off, believing himself no more animate than the spanners and screwdrivers he handled. When there were passes to be had, he gave his to someone else. He slept on an average of four hours a night. This mineral period ended by an accidental meeting with a medical officer one evening in the barracks. Schoenmaker put it as primitively as he felt. How can I become a doctor? Of course, it was idealistic and uncomplex. He wanted only to do something for men like Godolphin to help prevent a takeover of the profession by its unnatural and traitorous halidoms. It took ten years of working at his first specialty mechanic, as well as navvy in a score of markets and warehouses, bill collector, once administrative assistant to a bootlegging syndicate operating out of Decatur, Illinois. These years of labor were interlarded with night courses and occasional day enrollments, though none more than three semesters in a row, after Decatur, when he could afford it. Internship. Finally, on the eve of the Great Depression, entrance to the medical Freemasonry. If alignment with the inanimate is the mark of a bad guy, Schoenmaker at least made a sympathetic beginning. But at some point along his way, there occurred a shift in outlook so subtle that even profane who was unusually sensitive that way, probably couldn't have detected it. He was kept going by hatred for Halidom and perhaps a fading love for Godolphin. These had given rise to what is called a sense of mission, something so tenuous it has to be fed more solid fare than either hatred or love. So it came to be sustained, plausibly enough, 
by a number of bloodless theories about the idea of the plastic surgeon. Having heard his vocation on the embattled wind, Schoenmaker's dedication was toward repairing the havoc wrought by agencies outside his own sphere of responsibility. Others, politicians and machines, carried on wars. Others, perhaps human machines, condemned his patients to the ravages of acquired syphilis. Others, on the highways and the factories, undid the work of nature with automobiles, milling machines, other instruments of civilian disfigurement. What could he do toward eliminating the causes? They existed, formed a body of things as they are. He came to be afflicted with a conservative laziness. It was social awareness of a sort, but with boundaries and interfaces which made it less than the Catholic rage filling him that night in the barracks with the M.O. It was, in short, a deterioration of purpose, a decay. 2. Esther met him, oddly enough, through Stencil, who at the time was only a newcomer to the crew. Stencil, pursuing a different trail, happened for reasons of his own to be interested in Evan Godolphin's history. He'd followed it as far as Muzargan. Having finally got Schoenmaker's alias from the AEF records, it took Stencil months to trace him to Germantown and the Muzak-filled face hospital. The good doctor denied everything. After every variety of cajolement Stencil knew, it was another dead end. As is usual after certain frustrations, we react with benevolence. Aster had been languishing ripe and hot-eyed about the rusty spoon, hating her figure six nose and proving as well as she could the unhappy undergraduate adage, all the ugly ones fuck. The thwarted stencil, casting about for somebody to take it all out on, glommed on to her despair, hopefully, a taking which progressed to sad summer afternoons wandering among parched fountains, sun-struck shop fronts and streets bleeding tar, eventually to a father-daughter agreement, casual enough to be cancelled at any time should either of them desire, no post-mortems necessary. It struck him with a fine irony that the nicest sentimental trinket for her would be an introduction to Schoenmaker. Accordingly, in September, the contact was made, and Esther, without ado, went under his knives and kneading fingers. Collected for her in the anteroom that day were a rogue's gallery of malformed. A bald woman without ears contemplated the gold imp clock, skin flush and shiny from temples to occiput. Beside her sat a younger girl whose skull was fissured such that three separate peaks, paraboloid in shape, protruded above the hair, which continued down either side of a densely acneed face like a skipper's beard. Across the room studying a copy of the Reader's Digest sat an aged gentleman in a moss-green gabardine suit who possessed three nostrils, no upper lip, and an assortment of different-sized teeth which leaned and crowded together like the headstones of a boneyard in tornado country. And off in a corner, looking at nothing, was a sexless being with hereditary syphilis, whose bones had acquired lesions and had partially collapsed, so that the gray face's profile was nearly a straight line, the nose hanging down like a loose flap of skin, nearly covering the mouth, the chin depressed at the side by a large sunken crater containing radial skin wrinkles, the eyes squeezed shut by the same unnatural gravity that flattened the rest of the profile. Esther, who was still at an impressionable age, identified with them all. It was confirmation of this alien feeling which had driven her to bed with so many of the whole sick crew. This first day, Schoenmaker spent in preoperative reconnaissance of the terrain, photographing Esther's face and nose from various angles, checking for upper respiratory infections, running a wasserman. Irving and Trench also assisted him in making two duplicate casts or death masks. They gave her two paper straws to breathe through, and in her childish way she thought of soda shops, cherry cokes, true confessions. Next day she was back at the office. The two casts were there on his desk, side by side. I'm twins, she giggled. Schoenmaker reached out and snapped the plaster nose from one of the masks. 
No, he smiled, producing like a magician a lump of modeling clay with which he replaced the broken-off nose. What sort of nose did you have in mind? What else? Irish, she wanted, turned up, like they all wanted. To none of them did it occur that the retrousse nose, too, is an aesthetic misfit. A Jew nose in reverse is all. Few had ever asked for a so-called perfect nose, where the roof is straight, the tip untilted and unhooked, the cardiomella, separating the nostrils, meeting the upper lip at ninety degrees. All of which went to support his private thesis that correction, along all dimensions, social, political, emotional, entails retreat to a diametric opposite, rather than any reasonable search for a golden mean. A few artistic finger flourishes and wrist twistings. Would that be it? Eyes aglow, she nodded. It has to harmonize with the rest of your face, you see. It didn't, of course. All that could harmonize with a face, if you were going to be humanistic about it, was obviously what the face was born with. But, he'd been able to rationalize years before, there is harmony and harmony. So Esther's nose, identical with an ideal of nasal beauty established by movies, advertisements, magazine illustrations, cultural harmony, Schoenmaker called it. Try next week, then. He gave her the time. Esther was thrilled. It was like waiting to be born and talking over with God, calm and businesslike, exactly how you wanted to enter the world. Next week she arrived, punctual, guts tight, skin sensitive. Come. Schoenmaker took her gently by the hand. She felt passive, even a little sexually aroused. She was seated in a dentist's chair, tilted back and prepared by Irving, who hovered about her like a handmaiden. Esther's face was cleaned in the nasal region with green soap, iodine, and alcohol. The hair inside her nostrils was clipped, and the vestibules cleaned gently with antiseptics. She was then given Nembutol. It was expected this would calm her down, but barbituric acid derivatives affect individuals differently. Perhaps her initial sexual arousal contributed, but by the time Esther was taken to the operating room, she was near delirium. Should have used hyacinth, Trench said. It gives them amnesia, man. Quiet, schlep, said the doctor, scrubbing. Irving set about arranging his armamentarium while Trench strapped Esther to the operating table. Esther's eyes were wild. She sobbed quietly, obviously beginning to get second thoughts. Too late now, Trench consoled her, grinning. Lay quiet, hey? Eh? All three wore surgical masks. The eyes looked suddenly malevolent to Esther. She tossed her head. Trench, hold her head, came Schoenmaker's muffled voice. And Irving can be the anesthetist. You need practice, babe. Go get the Novocaine bottle. Sterile towels were placed under Esther's head and a drop of castor oil in each eye. Her face was again swabbed, this time with metaphen and alcohol. Gauze packing was then jammed far up her nostrils to keep antiseptics and blood from flowing down her pharynx and throat. Irving returned with the Novocaine, a syringe, and a needle. First she put the anesthetic into the tip of Esther's nose, one injection on each side. Next, she made a number of injections radially around each nostril to deaden the wings or alley, her thumb going down on the plunger each time as the needle withdrew. Switch to the big one, Schoenmaker said quietly. Irving fished a two-inch needle out of the autoclave. This time the needle was pushed just under the skin all the way up each side of the nose from the nostril to where the nose joined forehead. No one had told Esther that anything about the operation would hurt, but these injections hurt. Nothing before in her experience had ever hurt quite so much. All she had free to move for the pain were her hips. Trench held her head and leered appreciatively as she squirmed, constrained on the table. Inside the nose again, with another burden of anesthetic, Irving's hypodermic was inserted between the upper and lower cartilage and pushed all the way up to the glabella, the bump between the eyebrows. A series of internal injections to the septum, the wall of bone and cartilage which separates the two halves of the nose, and anesthesia was complete. The sexual metaphor in all this wasn't lost on Trench, who kept chanting, Stick it in, pull it out, stick it in, ooh, that was good, pull it out, 
and tittering softly above Esther's eyes. Irving would sigh each time, exasperated. That boy, you expected her to say. After a while, Schoenmaker started pinching and twisting Esther's nose. How does it feel? Hurt? I whispered, no. Schoenmaker twisted harder. Hurt? No. Okay, cover her eyes. Maybe she wants to look, Trench said. You want to look, Esther? See what we're going to do to you? I don't know. Her voice was weak, teetering between here and hysteria. Watch, then, said Schoenmaker. Get an education. First we'll cut out the hump. Let's see a scalpel. It was a routine operation. Schoenmaker worked quickly, neither he nor his nurse wasting any motion. Caressing sponge strokes made it nearly bloodless. Occasionally a trickle would elude him and get halfway to the towels before he caught it. Schoenmaker first made two incisions, one on either side, through the internal lining of the nose, near the septum at the lower border of the side cartilage. He then pushed a pair of long-handled curved and pointed scissors through the nostril, up past the cartilage to the nasal bone. The scissors had been designed to cut both on opening and closing. Quickly, like a barber finishing up a high-tipping head, he separated the bone from the membrane and skin over it. Undermining, we call this, he explained. He repeated the scissors' work through the other nostril. You see, you have two nasal bones. They're separated by your septum. At the bottom, they're each attached to a piece of lateral cartilage. I'm undermining you all the way from this attachment to where the nasal bones join the forehead. Irving passed him a chisel-like instrument. McKenty's elevator, this is. With the elevator, he probed around, completing the undermining. Now, gently like a lover, I'm going to saw off your hump. Esther watched his eyes as best she could, looking for something human there. Never had she felt so helpless. Later she would say, It was almost a mystic experience. What religion is it? One of the eastern ones where the highest condition we can attain is that of an object, a rock. It was like that. I felt myself drifting down this delicious loss of Esterhood, becoming more and more a blob with no worries, traumas, nothing, only being. The mask with the clay nose lay on a small table nearby. Referring to it with quick side glances, Schoenmaker inserted the saw blade through one of the incisions he'd made and pushed it up to the bony part, then lined it up with the line of the new nose roof and carefully began to saw through the nasal bone on that side. Bone saws easily, he remarked to Esther. We're all really quite frail. The blade reached soft septum. Schoenmaker withdrew the blade. Now comes the tricky part. I got to saw off the other side exactly the same. Otherwise your nose will be lopsided. He inserted the saw in the same way on the other side, studied the mask for what seemed to Esther a quarter of an hour, made several minute adjustments, then finally sawed off the bone there in a straight line. Your hump is now two loose pieces of bone attached only to the septum, we have to cut that through, flush with the other two cuts. This he did with an angle-bladed pull-knife, cutting down swiftly, completing the phase with some graceful sponge flourishing. And now the hump floats inside the nose. He pulled back one nostril with a retractor, inserted a pair of forceps, and fished around for the hump. Take that back, he smiled. It doesn't want to come just yet. With scissors, he snipped the hump loose from the lateral cartilage, which had been holding it, then with the bone forceps removed a dark-colored lump of gristle, which he waved triumphantly before Esther. Twenty-two years of social unhappiness, Niktvar. End of Act One. We'll put it in formaldehyde. You can keep it for a souvenir if you wish. As he talked, he smoothed the edges of the cuts with a small rasp file. So much for the hump. But where the hump had been was now a flat area. The bridge of the nose had been too wide to begin with and now had to be narrowed. Again, he undermined the nasal bones, this time around to where they met the cheekbones and beyond. As he removed the scissors, he inserted a right-angled saw in its place. Your nasal bones are anchored firmly, you see, at the side to the cheekbone, at the top to the forehead. 
We must fracture them so we can move your nose around, just like that lump of clay. He sawed through the nasal bones on each side, separating them from the cheekbones. He then took a chisel and inserted it through one nostril, pushing it as high as he could until it touched bone. Let me know if you feel anything. He gave the chisel a few light taps with a mallet, stopped, puzzled, and then began to hammer harder. It's a rough mother, he said, dropping his jocular tone. Tap, tap, tap. Come on, you bastard. The chisel point edged its way, millimeter by millimeter, between Esther's eyebrows. Scheiße. With a loud snap, her nose was broken free of the forehead. By pushing in from either side with his thumbs, Schoenmaker completed the fracture. See, it's all wobbly now. That's act two. Now we shorten the septum, yeah? With a scalpel, he made an incision around the septum, between it and its two adjoining lateral cartilages. He then cut down around the front of the septum to the spine, located just inside the nostrils at the back which should give you a free-floating septum. We use scissors to finish the job. With dissecting scissors, he undermined the septum along its sides and up over the bones as far as the glabella at the top of the nose. He passed a scalpel next into one of the incisions just inside the nostril and out the other, and worked the cutting edge around until the septum was separated at the bottom. Then elevated one nostril with a retractor, reached in with Alice clamps, and pulled out part of the loose septum. A quick transfer of calipers from mask to exposed septum. Then with a pair of straight scissors, Schoenmaker snipped off a triangular wedge of septum. Now to put everything in place. Keeping one eye on the mask, he brought together the nasal bones. This narrowed the bridge and eliminated the flat part where the hump had been cut off. He took some time making sure the two halves were lined up dead center. The bones made a curious crackling sound as he moved them. For your turned-up nose, we make two sutures. The seam was between the recently cut edge of the septum and the calumella. With needle and needle holder, two silk stitches were taken obliquely through the entire widths of calumella and septum. The operation had taken, in all, less than an hour. They cleaned Esther up, removed the plain gauze packing, and replaced it with sulfur ointment and more gauze. A strip of adhesive tape went on over her nostrils, another over the bridge of the new nose. On top of this went a stent mold, a tin guard, and more adhesive plaster. Rubber tubes were put in each nostril so she could breathe. Two days later the packing was removed. The adhesive plaster came off after five days. The sutures came out after seven. The up-tilted end product looked ridiculous, but Schoenmaker assured her it would come down a little after a few months. It did. Three. That would have been all except for Esther. Possibly her old hump-nosed habits had continued on by virtue of momentum, but never before had she been so passive with any male— Passivity having only one meaning for her, she left the hospital Schoenmaker had sent her to after a day and a night, and roamed the east side in fugue, scaring people with her white beak and a certain shock about the eyes. She was sexually turned on, was all, as if Schoenmaker had located and flipped a secret switch or clitoris somewhere inside her nasal cavity. A cavity is a cavity, after all. Trench's gift for metaphor might have been contagious. Returning the following week to have the stitches removed, she crossed and uncrossed her legs, batted eyelashes, talked soft, everything crude she knew. Schoenmaker had spotted her at the outset as an easy make. Come back tomorrow, he told her. Irving was off. Esther arrived the next day, garbed underneath as lacily and with as many fetishes as she could afford. There might even have been a dab of Shalimar on the gauze in the center of her face. In the back room. How do you feel? She laughed, too loud. It hurts. But? Yes, but. There are ways to forget the pain. She seemed unable to get rid of a silly, half-apologetic smile. It stretched her face, adding to the pain in her nose. Do you know what we're going to do? No. 
What I am going to do to you? Of course. She let him undress her. He commented only on a black garter belt. Oh, oh, God, an attack of conscience. Slab had given it to her, with love, presumably. Stop. Stop the peep show routine. You're not a virgin. Another self-deprecating laugh. That's just it. Another boy. Gave it to me. Boy that I loved. She's in shock, he thought, vaguely surprised. Come, we'll make believe it's your operation. You enjoyed your operation, didn't you? Through a crack in the curtains opposite, Trench looked on. Lie on the bed. That will be our operating table. You are to get an intermuscular injection. No, she cried. You have worked on many ways of saying no. No meaning yes. That no, I don't like. Say it differently. No, with a little moan. Different. Again. No. This time a smile. Eyelids at half-mast. Again. No. You're getting better. Unknotting his tie, trousers in a puddle about his feet, Schoenmaker serenaded her. Have I told you, fella, she's got the sweetest calumella and a septum that swept them all on their ass? Each casual contract to me meant only a big fat check to me till I sawed this osteoclastable lass. Refrain. Till you've cut into Esther, you've cut nothing at all. She's one of the best, sir. To her nose I'm in thrall. She never acts nasty but lies still as a rock. She loves my rhinoplasty, but the others are schlock. Esther is passive, her aplomb is massive. How could any poor assive ever pass her by? And let me to you say, she puts Ireland to shame, for her nose is retrousse, and Esther's her name. For the last eight bars she chanted no on one and three. Such was the as it were, Jacobean etiology of Esther's eventual trip to Cuba, which see. Chapter 5 In which Stencil nearly goes west with an alligator. V. 1. This alligator was pinto, pale white, seaweed black. It moved fast, but clumsy. It could have been lazy, or old, or stupid. Profane thought maybe it was tired of living. The chase had been going on since nightfall. They were in a section of forty-eight-inch pipe. His back was killing him. Profane hoped the alligator would not turn off into something smaller, somewhere he couldn't follow, because then he would have to kneel in the sludge, aim half-blind, and fire all quickly before the cocodrilo got out of range. Angel held the flashlight, but he had been drinking wine and would crawl along behind Profane absent-mindedly, letting the beam waver all over the pipe. Profane could only see the cocoa in occasional flashes. From time to time his quarry would half-turn, coy, enticing, a little sad. Up above it must have been raining. A continual thin drool sounded behind them at the last sewer opening. Ahead was darkness. The sewer tunnel here was tortuous and built decades ago. Profane was hoping for a straightaway. He could make an easy kill there. If he fired anywhere in this stretch of short, crazy angles, there'd be danger from ricochets. It wouldn't be his first kill. He'd been on the job two weeks now and bagged four alligators and one rat. Every morning and evening for each shift there was a shape-up in front of a candy store on Columbus Avenue. Zeitzus, the boss, secretly wanted to be a union organizer. He wore shark-skin suits and horn rims. Normally there weren't enough volunteers to cover even this Puerto Rican neighborhood, let alone the city of New York. Still, Zeitzus paced before the mornings at six, stubborn in his dream. His job was civil service, but someday he would be Walter Ruther. Okay there, Rodriguez, yeah. I guess we can take you. And here was the department without enough volunteers to go round. Still a few came, straggling and reluctant, and not at all constant. Most quit after the first day. A weird collection it was. Bums, mostly bums. Up from the winter sunlight of Union Square, and a few gibbering pigeons for loneliness. 
up from the Chelsea district and down from the hills of Harlem, or a little sea-level warmth sneaking glances from behind the concrete pillar of an overpass at the rusty Hudson and its tugs and stone barges. What in this city pass, perhaps, for dryads? Watch for them the next winter day you happen to be overpassed, gently growing out of the concrete, trying to be part of it, or at least safe from the wind and the ugly feeling they... We have about where it is that persistent river is really flowing. Bombs from across both rivers, or just in from the Midwest, humped, cursed at, coupled and recoupled beyond all remembrance to the slow, easy boys they used to be, or the poor corpses they would make some day. One beggar, or the only one who talked about it, who owned a closet full of hickey freemen and like-priced suits, who drove after working hours a shiny white Lincoln, who had three or four wives, staggered back along the private Route 40 of his progress east. Mississippi, who came from Kielce in Poland, and whose name nobody could pronounce, who had had a woman taken at the Oshwiensim extermination camp, and I taken by the bitter end of a hoist cable on the freighter Mikolai Ray and fingerprints taken by the San Diego cops when he tried to jump ship in 49. Nomads from the end of a bean-picking season, somewhere exotic, so exotic it might really have been last summer and east of Babylon, Long Island. But they, with only the season to remember, had to have it just ended, only just fading. Wanderers uptown from the classic bums keep of them all, the Bowery, Lower Third Avenue, used shirt bins, barber schools, a curious loss of time. They worked in teams of two. One held the flashlight, the other carried a 12-gauge repeating shotgun. Zeitzus was aware that most hunters regard use of this weapon like anglers feel about dynamiting fish, but he was not looking for write-ups in field and stream. Repeaters were quick and sure. The department had developed a passion for honesty, following the great sewer scandal of 1955. They wanted dead alligators. Rats, too, if any happened to get caught in the blast. Each hunter got an armband, a Zeitz's idea. Alligator patrol, it said, in green lettering. At the beginning of the program, Zeitz's had moved a big plexiglass plotting board engraved with a map of the city and overlaid with a grid coordinate sheet into his office. Zeitz's would sit in front of this board while a plotter one V.A. Brushhook Spugo, who claimed to be eighty-five and also to have slain forty-seven rats with a brushhook under the summer streets of Brownsville on 13 August 1922, would mark up with yellow grease pencil sightings, probables, hunts in progress, kills. All reports came back from roving anchormen who would walk around a route of certain manholes and yell down and ask how it was going. Each anchor man had a walkie-talkie tied in on a common network to Zeitz's office and a low-fidelity 15-inch speaker mounted on the ceiling. At the beginning, it was pretty exciting business. Zeitz kept all the lights out except for those on the plotting board and a reading light over his desk. The place looked like a kind of combat center, and anybody walking in would immediately sense this tenseness, purpose, feeling of a great net spreading out all the way to the boondocks of the city, with this room its brains, its focus. That is, until they heard what was coming in over the radios. One good provolone, she says. I got a good provolone. Why can't she do shopping herself? She spends all day watching Mrs. Grosseria's TV. Did you see Ed Sullivan last night? Hey, Andy. He had this bunch of monkeys playing a piano with their... From another part of the city. And Speedy Gonzalez says, Senor, please get your hand off my ass. Ha, ha. And you ought to be over here on the east side. There is stuff all over the place. It all has a zipper on it over on the east side. That is how come yours is so short? It's not how much you got, it's how you use it. Naturally... There was unpleasantness from the FCC, who ride around, it said, in little monitor cars with direction-finding antennas, just looking for people like this. First came warning letters, then phone calls, 
Then finally somebody wearing a shark-skin suit, glossier even than Zeitzus's. So the walkie-talkies went, and soon after that, Zeitzus's supervisor called him in and told him, very paternal, that there wasn't enough budget to keep the patrol going in the style it had been accustomed to. So Alligator Hunter Killer Central was taken over by a minor branch of the payroll department, and old Brushhook Spugo went off to Astoria, Queens, a pension, a flower garden where wild marijuana grew, and an early grave. Sometimes now, when they mustered out in front of the candy store, Zeitzos would give them pep talks. The day the department put a limit on the shotgun shell allotment, he stood out hatless under a half-freezing February rain to tell them about it. It was hard to see if it was melted sleet running down his face or tears. You guys, he said, some of you been here since this patrol started. I've been seeing a couple of the same ugly faces out here every morning. A lot of you don't come back, and okay. If it pays better someplace else, more power to you, I say. This here is not a rich outfit. If it was union, I can tell you, a lot of them ugly faces would be back every day. You that do come back live in human shit and alligator blood eight hours a day, and nobody complains, and I'm proud of you. We've seen a lot of cutbacks in our patrol in just the short time it's been a patrol, and you don't hear anybody go crying about that either, which is worse than shit. Well, today they chopped us down again. Each team will be issued five rounds a day instead of ten. Downtown they think you guys are wasting ammo. I know you don't, but how can you tell somebody like that who has never been downstairs because it might mess up their hundred-dollar suit? So all I'm saying is, only get the sure kills. Don't waste your time on probables. Just keep going the way you have. I am proud of you guys. I am so proud. They all shuffled around, embarrassed. Zeitzus didn't say anything else. Just stood there, half-turned, watching an old Puerto Rican lady with a shopping basket limp her way uptown on the other side of Columbus Avenue. Zeitzus was always saying how proud he was, and despite his loud mouth, his AF of L way of running things, his delusions of high purpose, they liked him. Because under the shark skin and behind the tinted lenses, he was a bum too. Only an accident of time and place kept them all from sharing a wine drunk together now. And because they liked him, his own pride in our patrol, which none of them doubted, made them uncomfortable, thinking of the shadows they had fired at, wine shadows, loneliness shadows, the snoozes taken during working hours against the sides of flushing tanks near the rivers, the bitching they had done but in whispers so quiet their partner didn't even hear, the rats they had let get away because they felt sorry for them. They couldn't share the boss's pride, but they could feel guilty about making what he felt a lie, having learned through no very surprising or difficult schooling, that pride in our patrol and yourself, even as a deadly sin, does not really exist in the same way that, say, three empty beer bottles exist to be cashed in for subway fare and warmth, someplace to sleep for a while. Pride you could exchange for nothing at all. What was Zeitzus, the poor innocent, getting for it? Chopped down was what. But they liked him, and nobody had the heart to wise him up. So far as Profane knew... Zeitzus didn't know who he was or care. Profane would have liked to think he was one of those recurring ugly faces. But what was he, after all? Only a latecomer. He had no right, he decided, after the ammo speech, to think one way or the other about Zeitzus. He didn't feel any group pride, God knew. It was a job, not a patrol. He'd learned how to work a repeater, even how to field strip and clean it. And now, two weeks on the job, he was almost beginning to feel less clumsy, like he wouldn't accidentally shoot himself in the foot or someplace worse after all. Angel was singing, Mi corazón está tan solo, mi corazón. Profane watched his own hip boots move, synced with the beat of Angel's song, watched the erratic gleam of the flashlight on the water, watched the gentle switching of the alligator's tail ahead. 
They were coming up to a manhole. Rendezvous point. Look sharp, men of the alligator patrol. Angel wept as he sang. Knock it off, Profane said. If Bung the Foreman is up there, it's our ass. Act sober. I hate Bung the Foreman, Angel said. He began to laugh. Shush, Profane said. Bung the Foreman had carried a walkie-talkie before the FCC clamped down. Now he carried a clipboard and filed daily reports with Zeitzus. He didn't talk much except to give orders. One phrase he used always, I'm the foreman. Sometimes, I'm Bung, the foreman. Angel's theory was that he had to keep saying this to remind himself. Ahead of them, the alligator lumbered, forlorn. It was moving slower, as if to let them catch up and end it. When they arrived at the manhole, Angel climbed up the ladder and hammered with a short crowbar on the underside of the cover. Profane held the flashlight and kept an eye on the cocoa. There were scraping sounds from above, and the cover was suddenly jacked to one side. A crescent of pink neon sky appeared. Rain came down, splashing into Angel's eyes. Bung the foreman's head appeared in the crescent. Chinga tu madre, said Angel pleasantly. Report, said Bung. He's moving off, Profane called from below. We're after one now, Angel said. You're drunk, Bung said. No, said Angel. Yes, cried Bung. I'm the foreman. Angel, Profane said. Come on, we'll lose him. I'm sober, Angel said. It occurred to him how nice it might be to punch Bung in the mouth. I am going to write you up, said Bung. I smell booze on your breath. Angel started climbing out of the manhole. I would like to discuss this with you. What are you guys doing, Profane said, playing potsy? Carry on, Bung called into the hole. I am detaining your partner for disciplinary action. Angel, halfway out of the hole, sank his teeth into Bung's leg. Bung screamed. Profane saw Angel disappear, and the pink crescent replace him. Rain spattered down out of the sky and drooled along the old brick sides of the hole. Scuffling sounds were heard in the street. Now what the hell... Profane said. He swung the flashlight beam down the tunnel, saw the tip of the alligator's tail sashaying around the next bend. He shrugged. Carry on your ass, he said. He moved away from the manhole, carrying the gun safetyed under one arm, the flashlight in the other hand. It was the first time he'd hunted solo. He wasn't scared. When it came to the kill, there would be something to prop the flashlight against. Nearly as he could figure... He was on the east side, uptown somewhere. He was out of his territory. God, had he chased this alligator all the way across town? He rounded the bend. The light from the pink sky was lost. Now there moved only a sluggish ellipse with him and the alligator at Fokai, and a slender axis of light linking them. They angled to the left half uptown. The water began to get a little deeper. They were entering Fairings Parish, named after a priest who'd lived topside years ago. During the depression of the thirties, in an hour of apocalyptic well-being, he had decided that the rats were going to take over after New York died. Lasting eighteen hours a day, his beat had covered the bread lines and missions, where he gave comfort, stitched up raggedy souls. He foresaw nothing but a city of starved corpses covering the sidewalks and the grass of the parks, lying belly up in the fountains, hanging wry-necked from the street lamps. The city, maybe America, his horizons didn't extend that far, would belong to the rats before the year was out. This being the case, Father Faring thought it best for the rats to be given a head start, which meant conversion to the Roman church. One night early in Roosevelt's first term, he climbed downstairs through the nearest manhole, bringing a Baltimore catechism, his breviary, and, for reasons nobody found out, a copy of Knight's Modern Seamanship. The first thing he did, according to his journals, discovered months after he died, was to put an eternal blessing and a few exorcisms on all the water flowing through the sewers between Lexington and the East River and between 86th and 79th Streets. This was the area which became Faring's Parish. These Benisons made sure of an adequate supply of holy water, 
also eliminated the trouble of individual baptisms when he had finally converted all the rats in the parish. Two, he expected other rats to hear what was going on under the Upper East Side and come likewise to be converted. Before long, he would be spiritual leader of the inheritors of the earth. He considered it small enough sacrifice on their part to provide three of their own per day for physical sustenance in return for the spiritual nourishment he was giving them. Accordingly, he built himself a small shelter on one bank of the sewer, his cassock for a bed, his breviary for a pillow. Each morning he'd make a small fire from driftwood collected and set out to dry the night before. Nearby was a depression in the concrete which sat beneath a downspout for rainwater. Here he drank and washed. After a breakfast of roast rat, the livers, he wrote, are particularly succulent, he set about his first task, learning to communicate with the rats. Presumably he succeeded. An entry for 23 November 1934 says, Ignatius is proving a very difficult student indeed. He quarreled with me today over the nature of indulgences. Bartholomew and Teresa supported him. I read them from the Catechism, the Church, by means of indulgences, remits the temporal punishment due to sin by applying to us from her spiritual treasury part of the infinite satisfaction of Jesus Christ and of the superabundant satisfaction of the Blessed Virgin Mary and of the saints. And what, inquired Ignatius, is this superabundant satisfaction? Again, I read, that which they gained during their lifetime but did not need, and which the Church applies to their fellow members of the communion of saints. Aha! crowed Ignatius. Then I cannot see how this differs from Marxist communism, which you told us is godless, to each according to his needs, from each according to his abilities. I tried to explain that there were different sorts of communism, that the early church indeed was based on a common charity and sharing of goods. Bartholomew chimed in at this point with the observation that perhaps this doctrine of spiritual treasury arose from the economic and social conditions of the church in her infancy. Theresa promptly accused Bartholomew of holding Marxist views himself, and a terrible fight broke out in which poor Theresa had an eye scratched from the socket. To spare her further pain, I put her to sleep and made a delicious meal from her remains shortly after sexed. I have discovered the tales, if boiled long enough, are quite agreeable. Evidently he converted at least one batch. There is no further mention in the journals of the skeptic Ignatius. Perhaps he died in another fight. Perhaps he left the community for the pagan reaches of downtown. After the first conversion, the entries begin to taper off, but all are optimistic, at times euphoric. They give a picture of the parish as a little enclave of light in a howling, dark age of ignorance and barbarity. Ratmeat didn't agree with the father in the long run. Perhaps there was infection. Perhaps, too, the Marxist tendencies of his flock reminded him too much of what he had seen and heard above ground on the breadlines, by sick and maternity beds, even in the confessional. And thus... The cheerful heart reflected by his late entries was really only a necessary delusion to protect himself from the bleak truth that his pale and sinuous parishioners might turn out no better than the animals whose estate they were succeeding to. His last entry gives a hint of some such feeling. When Augustine is mayor of the city, for he is a splendid fellow and the others are devoted to him, will he or his council remember an old priest? not with any sinecure or fat pension, but with true charity in their hearts? For their devotion to God is rewarded in heaven, and just as surely is not rewarded on this earth, some spiritual satisfaction, I trust, will be found in the new city whose foundations we lay here, in this Iona beneath the old foundations. If it cannot be, I shall nevertheless go to peace at one with God. Of course, that is the best reward. I have been the classical old priest, never particularly robust, never affluent, most of my life. Perhaps the journal ends here. 
It is still preserved in an inaccessible region of the Vatican Library and in the minds of the few old-timers in the New York Sewer Department who got to see it when it was discovered. It lay on top of a brick, stone, and stick cairn large enough to cover a human corpse assembled in a stretch of thirty-six-inch pipe near a frontier of the parish. Next to it lay the breviary. There was no trace of the catechism or Knight's modern seamanship. Maybe, said Zeitz as his predecessor, Manfred Katz, after reading the journal, maybe they are studying the best way to leave a sinking ship. The stories, by the time Profane heard them, were pretty much apocryphal, and more fantasy than the record itself warranted. At no point in the twenty or so years the legend had been handed on did it occur to anyone to question the old priest's sanity. It is this way with sewer stories. They just are. Truth or falsity don't apply. Profane had moved across the frontier, the alligator still in front of him. Scrawled on the walls were occasional quotes from the Gospels, Latin tags, Agnus Dei Quitolis Peccatamundi, Dona Nobis Pacem, Lamb of God who taketh away the sins of the world, grant us peace. Peace. Here had been peace, once in a depression season crushed slow, starving nervous into the street by the dead weight of its own sky. In spite of time distortions and Father Faring's tale, Profane had got the general idea, excommunicated most likely by the very fact of his mission here, a skeleton in Rome's closet and in the priest hole of his own cassock and bed, the old man sat preaching to a congregation of rats with saints' names, all to the intention of peace. He swung the beam over the old inscriptions, saw a dark stain shaped like a crucifix and broke out in goosebumps. For the first time since leaving the manhole, Profane realized he was all alone. The alligator up there was no help. It'd be dead soon to join other ghosts. What had interested him most were the accounts of Veronica, the only female besides the luckless Teresa who is mentioned in the journal. Sewer hands being what they are, favorite rejoinder, your mind is in the sewer. One of the apocrypha dealt with an unnatural relationship between the priest and this female rat, who was described as a kind of voluptuous Magdalene. From everything profane had heard, Veronica was the only member of his flock Father Faring felt to have a soul worth saving. She would come to him at night, not as a succubus, but seeking instruction, perhaps to carry back to her nest, wherever in the parish it was, something of his desire to bring her to Christ. A scapular medal, a memorized verse from the New Testament, a partial indulgence, a penance, something to keep... Veronica was none of your traitor rats. My little joke may have been in earnest. When they are established firmly enough to begin thinking about canonization, I am sure Veronica will head the list, with some descendant of Ignatius, no doubt, acting as devil's advocate. V came to me tonight upset. She and Paul have been at it again. The weight of guilt is so heavy on the child... She almost sees it as a huge, white, lumbering beast pursuing her, wanting to devour her. We discussed Satan and his wiles for several hours. V has expressed a desire to be a sister. I explained to her that to date there is no recognized order for which she would be eligible. She will talk to some of the other girls to see if there is interest widespread enough to require action on my part. It would mean a letter to the bishop and my Latin is so wretched. Lamb of God, profane thought, did the priest teach them rat of God? How did he justify killing them off three a day? How would he feel about me or the alligator patrol? He checked the action of the shotgun. Here in the parish were twistings intricate as any early Christian catacomb. No use risking a shot, not here. Was it only that? His back throbbed. He was getting tired, beginning to wonder how much longer this would have to keep up. 
It was the longest he'd chased any alligator. He stopped for a minute, listened back along the tunnel. No sound except the dull wash of water. Angel wouldn't be coming. He sighed and started plodding again toward the river. The alligator was burbling in the sewage, blowing bubbles and growling gently. Is it saying anything, he wondered, to me? He wound on, feeling soon he'd start to think about collapsing and just letting the stream float him out with pornographic pictures, coffee grounds, contraceptives used and unused, shit, up through the flushing tank to the East River and across on the tide to the stone forests of Queens. And to hell with this alligator and this hunt, here between chalk-written walls of legend. It was no place to kill. He felt the eyes of ghost rats, kept his own eyes ahead for fear he might see the thirty-six-inch pipe that was Father Faring's sepulchre, tried to keep his ears closed to the sub-threshold squeakings of Veronica, the priest's old love. Suddenly, so suddenly it scared him, there was light ahead, around a corner, not the light of a rainy evening in the city, but paler, less certain. They rounded the corner. He noticed the flashlight bulb starting to flicker, lost the alligator momentarily, then turned the corner and found a wide space like the nave of a church, an arched roof overhead, a phosphorescent light coming off walls whose exact arrangement was indistinct. Wah, he said out loud. Backwash from the river? Seawater shines in the dark sometimes. In the wake of a ship, you see the same uncomfortable radiance, but not here. The alligator had turned to face him. It was a clear, easy shot. He waited. He was waiting for something to happen, something otherworldly, of course. He was sentimental and superstitious. Surely the alligator would receive the gift of tongues, the body of Father Faring be resurrected. The sexy V tempt him away from murder. He felt about to levitate, and at a loss to say where really he was, in a bone cellar, a sepulchre. Ah, Schlemiel, he whispered into the phosphorescence. Accident-prone Schlemazel. The gun would blow up in his hands. The alligator's heart would tick on, his own would burst, mainspring and escapement rust in this shin-deep sewage, in this unholy light. Can I let you just go? Bung the foreman knew he was after a sure thing. It was down on the clipboard. And then he saw the alligator couldn't go any further. Had settled down on its haunches to wait, knowing damn well it was going to be blasted. In Independence Hall in Philly, when the floor was rebuilt, they left part of the original, a foot square, to show the tourists. Maybe, the guide would tell you, Benjamin Franklin stood right there, or even George Washington. Profane, on an eighth-grade class trip, had been suitably impressed. He got that feeling now. Here, in this room, an old man had killed and boiled a catechumen, had committed sodomy with a rat had discussed a rodent nunhood with thee, a future saint, depending which story you listen to. I'm sorry, he told the alligator. He was always saying he was sorry. It was a Schlemiel stock line. He raised the repeater to his shoulder, flicked off the safety. Sorry, he said again. Father Faring talked to rats, profane talked to alligators. He fired. The alligator jerked, did a backflip, thrashed briefly, was still. Blood began to seep out, amoeba-like, to form shifting patterns with the weak glow of the water. Abruptly, the flashlight went out. Two. Governor Rooney Winsome sat on his grotesque espresso machine, smoking string and casting baleful looks at the girl in the next room. The apartment, perched high over Riverside Drive, ran to something like thirteen rooms, all decorated in early homosexual, and arranged to present what the writers of the last century liked to call vistas when the connecting doors were open, as they were now. Mafia, his wife, was in on the bed playing with Fang, the cat. 
At the moment she was naked and dangling an inflatable brassiere before the frustrated claws of Fang, who was Siamese, grey, and neurotic. Bouncy, bouncy, she was saying. Is the duet big kitties angry because it can't play with the bois? Eee, he's so cute and echo. Oh, man, thought Winsome, an intellectual. I had to pick an intellectual. They all revert. The string was from Bloomingdale's. Fine quality. Procured by Charisma several months before on one of his sporadic work binges. He'd been a shipping clerk that time. Winsome made a mental note to see the pusher from Lord and Taylor's, a frail girl who hoped someday to sell pocketbooks in the accessories department. The stuff was highly valued by string smokers, on the same level as Chivas Regal Scotch or black Panamanian marijuana. Rooney was an executive for outlandish records. Volkswagens in hi-fi, the Leavenworth Glee Club sings old favorites, and spent most of his time out prowling for new curiosities. He had once, for example, smuggled a tape recorder disguised as a Kotex dispenser into the ladies' room at Penn Station, could be seen microphone in hand, lurking in false beard and Levi's in the Washington Square Fountain, being thrown out of a whorehouse on 125th Street, sneaking along the bullpen at Yankee Stadium on opening day. Rooney was everywhere and irrepressible. His closest scrape had come the morning two CIA agents, armed to the teeth, came storming into the office to destroy Winsome's great and secret dream, the version to end all versions of Tchaikovsky's 1812 overture. What he planned to use for bells, brass band, or orchestra, God and Winsome only knew. These were of no concern to the CIA. It was the cannon shots they had come to find out about. It seemed Winsome had been putting out feelers among higher echelon personnel in the Strategic Air Command. Why? said the CIA man in the gray suit. Why not? said Winsome. Why? said the CIA man in the blue suit. Winsome told them. My God, they said, blanching in unison. It would have to be the one dropped on Moscow, naturally, Rooney said. We want historical accuracy. The cat let loose a nerve-jangling scream. Charisma came crawling in from one of the adjoining rooms, covered by a great green Hudson's Bay blanket. Morning, Charisma said, his voice muffled by the blanket. No, said Winsome. You guessed wrong again. It is midnight, and Mafia, my wife, is playing with the cat. Go in and see. I'm thinking of selling tickets. Where is Foo? From under the blanket. Out rollicking, said Winsome, downtown. Rune, the girl squealed. Come in and look at him. The cat was lying on its back with all four paws up in the air and a death grin on its face. Winsome made no comment. The green mound in the middle of the room moved past the espresso machine, entered Mafia's room. Going past the bed, it stopped briefly. A hand reached out and patted Mafia on the thigh. Then it moved on again in the direction of the bathroom. The Eskimos, Winsome reflected, consider it good hostmanship to offer a guest your wife for the night, along with food and lodging. I wonder if old Charisma is getting any there off of Mafia. Mucklock, he said aloud. He reckoned it was an Eskimo word. If it wasn't too bad, he didn't know any others. Nobody heard him anyway. The cat came flying through the air into the espresso machine room. His wife was putting on a peignoir, kimono, housecoat, or negligee. He didn't know the difference, though. Periodically, Mafia tried to explain to him. All Winsome knew was it was something you had to take off her. I am going to work for a while, she said. His wife was an authoress. Her novels, three to date, ran a thousand pages each, and like sanitary napkins, had gathered in an immense and faithful sisterhood of consumers. There had even evolved, somehow, a kind of sodality or fan club that sat around, read from her books, and discussed her theory. If the two of them ever did get around to making a final split, it would be that theory there that would do it. Unfortunately, Mafia believed in it as fervently as any of her followers. It wasn't much of a theory, more wishful thinking on Mafia's part than anything else. There being but the single proposition, 
the world can only be rescued from certain decay through heroic love. In practice, Heroic love meant screwing five or six times a night, every night, with a great many athletic, half-sadistic wrestling holds thrown in. The one time Winsome had blown up, he'd yelled, You are turning our marriage into a trampoline act, which Mafia thought was a pretty good line. It appeared in her next novel. Spoken by Schwartz, a weak Jewish psychopath who was the major villain. All her characters fell into this disturbingly predictable racial alignment, the sympathetic, those godlike, inexhaustible sex athletes she used for heroes and heroines. And heroine, he wondered, were all tall, strong, white, though often robustly tanned, all over, Anglo-Saxon, Teutonic, and or Scandinavian. Comic relief and villainy were invariably the lot of Negroes, Jews, and South European immigrants. Winsome, being originally from North Carolina, resented her urban or Yankee way of hating Negroes. During their courtship, he'd admired her vast repertoire of Negro jokes. Only after the marriage did he discover a truth horrible as the fact she wore falsies. She was in nearly total ignorance about the Southern feeling toward Negroes. She used nigger as a term of hatred, not apparently being capable herself of anything more demanding than sledgehammer emotions. Winsome was too upset to tell her it was not a matter of love, hate, like, or not like, so much as an inheritance you lived with. He'd let it slide like everything else. If she believed in heroic love, which is nothing really but a frequency, then obviously Winsome wasn't on the man end of half of what she was looking for. In five years of marriage, all he knew was that both of them were whole cells, hardly fusing at all, with no more emotional osmosis than leakage of seed through the solid membranes of contraceptive or diaphragm that were sure to be there protecting them. Now, Winsome had been brought up on the white Protestant sentiments of magazines like The Family Circle. One of the frequent laws he encountered there was the one about how children sanctify a marriage. Mafia, at one time, had been daft to have kids, there may have been some intention of mothering a string of superchildren founding a new race. Who knew? Winsome had apparently met her specifications, both genetic and eugenic. Sly, however, she waited, and the whole contraceptive rigmarole was gone through in the first year of heroic love. Things, meanwhile, having started to fall apart, Mafia became naturally more and more uncertain of how good a choice Winsome had been, after all. Why she'd hung on this long, Winsome didn't know. Literary reputation, maybe. Maybe she was holding off divorce till her public relations sense told her go. He had a fair suspicion she'd describe him in court as near impotence as the limits of plausibility allowed. The Daily News, and maybe even Confidential Magazine, would tell America he was a eunuch. The only grounds for divorce in New York State is adultery. Rooney, dreaming mildly of beating Mafia to the punch, had begun to look with more than routine interest at Paola Maestro, Rachel's roommate. Pretty and sensitive and unhappy, he'd heard, with her husband Pappy Hod, BM3 USN, from whom she was separated. But did that mean she'd think any better of Winsome? Charisma was in the shower, splashing around. Was he wearing the green blanket in there? Winsome had the impression he lived in it. Hey, called Mafia from the writing desk. How do you spell Prometheus, anybody? Winsome was about to say it started off like prophylactic when the phone rang. Winsome hopped down off the espresso machine and padded over to it. Let her publishers think she was illiterate. Rooney, have you seen my roommate, the young one? He had not. Or Stencil? Stencil has not been here all week, Winsome said. He is out tracking down leads, he says, all quite mysterious and Dashiell Hammett-like. Rachel sounded upset, her breathing something. Would they be together? Winsome spread his hands and shrugged, keeping the phone tucked between neck and shoulder. Because she didn't come home last night. No telling what Stencil is doing, said Winsome, but I will ask Charisma. Charisma was standing in the bathroom, wrapped in the blanket, observing his teeth in the mirror. Eigenvalue, eigenvalue, he mumbled. I could do a better root canal job. What is my buddy Winsome paying you for, anyway? 
Where is Stencil? said Winsome. He sent a note yesterday by a vagrant in an old army campaign hat, circa 1898. Something about he would be in the sewers tracing down a lead indefinitely. Don't slouch, Winsome's wife said as he chugged back to the phone, emitting puffs of string smoke. Stand up straight. I can value, moaned Charisma. The bathroom had a delayed echo. The what? Rachel said. None of us, Winsome told her, have ever inquired into his business. If he wants to grouse around the sewer system, why let him? I doubt Paola is with him. Paola, Rachel said, is a very sick girl. She hung up, angry but not at Winsome, and turned to see Esther sneaky peeting out the door wearing Rachel's white leather raincoat. He could have asked me, Rachel said. The girl was always swiping things and then getting all kittenish when she was caught. Where are you going at this hour? Rachel wanted to know. Oh, out. Vaguely. If she had any guts, Rachel thought, she would say, Who the hell are you? I have to account to you for where I go? And Rachel would answer, I am who you owe a thousand odd bucks to is who. And Esther would get all hysterical and say, If that's the way it is, I'm leaving. I will go into prostitution or something and send you your money in the mail. And Rachel would watch her stomp out, and then, just as she was at the door, deliver the exit line. You'll go broke. You'll have to pay them. Go and be damned. The door would slam. High heels clatter away down the hall. A hiss thump of elevator doors, and hurrah, no more Esther. And next day she would read in the paper where Esther Harvitz, 22, honors graduate of CCNY, had taken a brody off some bridge, overpass, or high building, and Rachel would be so shocked she wouldn't even be able to cry. Was that me? Out loud. Esther had left. So, she continued in a Viennese dialect, this is what we call repressed hostility. You secretly want to kill your roommate, or something. Somebody was banging on the door. She opened it to Foo and a Neanderthal wearing the uniform of a third-class bosun's mate in the U.S. Navy. This is Pig Bodine, said Foo. Isn't it a small world, said Pig Bodine. I'm looking for Pappy Hod's woman. So am I, said Rachel. And what are you, playing Cupid for Pappy? Paola doesn't want to see him again. Pig tossed his white hat at the desk lamp, scoring a ringer. Beer in the icebox, said Fu. All smiles. Rachel was used to being barged in on at all hours by members of the crew and their random acquaintances. My sa, she said, which is crew talk for make yourself at home. Pappy is over in the med, said Pig, lying on the couch. He was short enough so that his feet didn't hang over the edge. He let one thick, furry arm fall to the floor with a dull thump, which Rachel suspected would have been more like a splat if there hadn't been a rug there. We are on the same ship. How come, then, you aren't over in the Med, wherever that is, said Rachel. She knew he meant Mediterranean, but felt hostile. I am AWOL, said Pig. He closed his eyes. Fu came back with beer. Oh, boy, oh, boy, yeah, said Pig. I smell Ballantine. Pig has this remarkably acute nose, Fu said, putting an opened quart of Ballantine into Pig's fist, which looked like a badger with pituitary trouble. I have never known him to guess wrong. How did you two get together? Rachel asked, seating herself on the floor. Pig, eyes still closed, was slobbering beer. It ran out of the corners of his mouth, formed brief pools in the bushy caverns of his ears, and soaked on into the sofa. If you had been down the spoon at all, you would know, Fu said. He referred to the rusty spoon, a bar on the western fringes of Greenwich Village, where, legend has it, a noted and colorful poet of the twenties drank himself to death. Ever since then, it has had kind of a rep among groups like the whole sick crew. Pig has made a big hit there. I'll bet Pig is the darling of the rusty spoon, said Rachel, acid, considering that sense of smell he has and how he can tell what brand of beer it is and all. Pig removed the bottle from his mouth where it had been somehow miraculously balanced. Glug, he said. 
Ah. Rachel smiled. Perhaps your friend would like to hear some music, she said. She reached over and turned on the FM, full volume. She screwed the dial over to a hillbilly station. On came a heartbroken violin, guitar, banjo, and vocalist. Last night I went and raced with the highway patrol, but that Pontiac done had more guts than mine. And so I wrapped my tail around a telephone pole, and now my baby, she just sits a-crying. I'm up in heaven, darling, now don't you cry. Ain't no reason why you should be blue. Just go on out and race a cop in Daddy's old Ford, and you can join me up in heaven, too. Pig's right foot had begun to wobble roughly in time with the music. Soon his stomach, where the beer bottle was now balanced, started to move up and down to the same rhythm. Fu watched Rachel puzzled. There's nothing I love, said Pig, and paused. Rachel did not doubt this. Then good, shit-kicking music. Oh, she shouted, not wanting to get on the subject, but too nosy she was aware to leave it. I suppose you and Pappy Hod used to go out on liberty and have all sorts of fun kicking shit. We kicked a few jarheads, Pig bellowed over the music, which is about the same thing. Where did you say Polly was? I didn't. Your interest in her is purely platonic, is that it? What? said Pig. No screwing, Fu explained. I wouldn't do that to anybody but an officer, Pig said. I have a code. All I want to see her for is Pappy told me before they got underway I should look her up if I was ever in New York. Well, I don't know where she is, Rachel yelled. I wish I did, she said quieter. For a minute or so they heard about a soldier who was overseas in Korea, fighting for the red, white, and blue, and one day his sweetheart, Belinda Sue, to rhyme with blue, up and run off with an itinerant propeller salesman. Said for that lonely G.I. Abruptly, Pig swung his head toward Rachel, opened his eyes, and said, What do you think of Sartre's thesis that we are all impersonating an identity? Which did not surprise her. After all, he'd been hanging around the spoon. For the next hour, they talked proper nouns. The hillbilly station continued full blast. Rachel opened a quart of beer for herself, and things soon grew convivial. Fu even became gleeful enough to tell one of a bottomless repertoire of Chinese jokes, which went, The vagrant minstrel Ling, having insinuated himself into the confidence of a great and influential Mandarin, made off one night with a thousand gold yuan and a priceless jade lion, a theft which so unhinged his former employer that in one night the old man's hair turned snow white, and to the end of his life he did little more than sit on the dusty floor of his chamber, plucking listlessly at a pipa, and chanting, Was that not a curious minstrel? At half-past one the phone rang. It was Stencil. Stencil's just been shot at, he said. Private eye, indeed. Are you all right? Where are you? He gave her the address in the East Eighties. Sit down and wait, she said. We'll come get you. He can't sit down, you know. He hung up. Come, she said, grabbing her coat. Fun, excitement, thrill. Stencil has just been wounded, tracking down a lead. Fu whistled, giggled. Those leads are beginning to fight back. Stencil had called from a Hungarian coffee shop on York Avenue, known as Hungarian Coffee Shop. At this hour, the only customers were two elderly ladies and a cop off duty. The woman behind the pastry counter was all tomato cheeks and smiles, looking like the type who gave extra portions to poor growing boys and mothered bombs with free refills on coffee though it was a neighborhood of rich kids and bums who were only accidental there, and knew it, and so moved on quickly. Stencil was in an embarrassing and possibly dangerous position, a few pellets from the first shotgun blast. He dodged the second by an adroit flop in the sewage, had ricocheted into his left buttock. He wasn't especially anxious to sit down. 
He'd stowed the waterproof suit and mask near a walkway abutment on the East River Drive, combed his hair and straightened his clothing by mercury light in a nearby rain puddle. He wondered how presentable he looked. Not a good job, this policeman being here. Stencil left the phone booth and edged his right buttock gingerly onto a stool at the counter, trying not to wince, hoping his middle-aged appearance would account for any creakiness he showed. He asked for a cup of coffee, lit a cigarette, and noticed that his hand wasn't shaking. The match flame burned pure, conical, unwavering. Stencil, you're a cool one, he told himself. But God, how did they get on to you? That was the worst part of it. He and Zeitzus had met only by accident. Stencil had been on the way over to Rachel's place. As he crossed Columbus Avenue, he noticed a few ragged files of workmen lined up on the sidewalk opposite and being harangued by Zeitzus. Any organized body fascinated him, especially irregulars. These looked like revolutionaries. He crossed the street. The group broke up and wandered away. Zaitza stood watching them for a moment, then turned and caught sight of Stencil. The light in the east turned the lenses of Zaitza's glasses pale and blank. You're late, Zaitza called. So he was, Stencil thought, years. See Bung the foreman, that fellow there in the plaid shirt. Stencil realized then that he had a three-day stubble and had been sleeping in his clothes for the same length of time. Curious about anything even suggesting overthrow, he approached Zeitza, smiling his father's foreign service smile. Not looking for employment, he said. You're a limey, Zeitza said. Last limey we had wrestled his alligators to death. You boys are all right. Why don't you try it for a day? Naturally, Stencil asked, try what? And so the contact was made. Soon they were back in the office Zeitzes shared with some vaguely defined estimates group, talking sewers. Somewhere in the Paris dossier, Stencil knew, was recorded an interview with one of the collecteurs généraux who worked the main sewer line which ran under Boulevard Saint-Michel. The fellow, old at the time of the interview but with an amazing memory, recalled seeing a woman who might have been V on one of the semi-monthly Wednesday tours shortly before the outbreak of the Great War. Having been lucky with sewers once, Stencil saw nothing wrong with trying again. They went out to lunch. In the early afternoon it rained, and the conversation got around to sewer stories. A few old-timers drifted in with their own memories. It was only a matter of an hour or so before Veronica was mentioned, a priest's mistress who wanted to become a nun, referred to by her initial in the journal. Persuasive and charming, even in a wrinkled suit and nascent beard, trying not to betray any excitement, Stencil talked his way downstairs. But had found them waiting. And where to go from here? He'd seen all he wanted to see of Faring's Parish. Two cups of coffee later, the cop left, and five minutes after that, Rachel Fu and Pig Bodine showed up. They piled into Foo's Plymouth. Foo suggested they go to the Spoon. Pig was all for it. Rachel, bless her heart, didn't make a scene or ask questions. They got off two blocks from her apartment. Foo peeled out down the drive. It had started to rain again. All Rachel said on the way back was, I'll bet your ass is sore. She said it through long eyelashes and a little girl grin, and for ten seconds or so, Stencil felt like the altar cocker Rachel may have thought he was. Chapter 6 In Which Profane Returns to Street Level V. 1 Women had always happened to profane the schlemiel like accidents. Broken shoelaces, dropped dishes, pins in new shirts— Fina was no exception. Profane had figured at first that he was only the disembodied object of a corporal work of mercy. But in the company of innumerable small and wounded animals, bombs on the street near dying and lost to God, he was only another means to grace or indulgence for Fina. 
but as usual he was wrong. His first indication came with the cheerless celebration Anhale and Geronimo staged following his first eight hours of alligator hunting. They had all been on a night shift and got back to the Mendozas around 5 a.m. Put on a suit, said Anhale. I don't have a suit, Profane said. They gave him one of Anhale's. It was too small, and he felt ridiculous. All I want to do, he said, really, is sleep. Sleep in the daytime, Geronimo said. Ho, ho, you crazy man. We are going out after some cogno. Fina came in all warm and sleepy-eyed, heard they were holding a party, wanted to tag along. She worked eight to four-thirty as a secretary, but she had sick leave coming. Anhel got all embarrassed. This sort of put his sister in the class of Konya. Geronimo suggested calling up Dolores and Pilar, two girls they knew. Girls are different from Konya. Anhel brightened. The six of them started at an after-hours club up near 125th Street, drinking gallo wine with ice in it. A small group, vibes and rhythm, played listlessly in one corner. These musicians had been to high school with Angel, Fina, and Geronimo. During the breaks, they came over and sat at the table. They were drunk and threw pieces of ice at each other. Everybody talked in Spanish, and Profane responded in what Italo-American he'd heard around the house as a kid. There was about ten percent communication, but nobody cared. Profane was only guest of honor. Soon Fina's eyes changed from sleepy to shiny from wine and she talked less and spent more of her time smiling at Profane. This made him uncomfortable. It turned out Delgado, the vibes player, was going to be married the next day and having second thoughts. A violent and pointless argument developed about marriage pro and con. While everybody else was screaming, Fina leaned toward Profane till their foreheads touched and whispered, Benito, her breath light and acid with wine. Josephine. He nodded, pleasant. He was getting a headache. She continued to lean against his head until the next set when Geronimo grabbed her and they went off to dance. Dolores, fat and amiable, asked Profane to dance. Non posso ballare, he said. No puedo bailar, she corrected him, and yanked him to his feet. The world became filled with the sounds of inanimate calluses slapping inanimate goatskin, Felt hitting metal, sticks knocking together. Of course he couldn't dance. His shoes kept getting in the way. Dolores, halfway across the room, didn't notice. Commotion broke out at the door, and half a dozen teenagers wearing playboy jackets invaded. The music bonged and clattered on. Profane kicked off his shoes, old black loafers of Geronimo's, and concentrated on dancing in his socks. After a while, Dolores was there again, and five seconds later a spike heel came down square in the middle of his foot. He was too tired to yell. He limped off to a table in the corner, crawled under it, and went to sleep. The next thing he knew, there was sunlight in his eyes. They were carrying him down Amsterdam Avenue like pallbearers, all chanting, Mierda, mierda, mierda. He lost count of all the bars they visited. He became drunk. His worst memory was of being alone with Fina somewhere in a telephone booth. They were discussing love. He couldn't remember what he'd said. The only other thing he remembered between then and the time he woke up in Union Square at sundown, blindfolded by a raging hangover and covered by a comforter of chilly pigeons who looked like vultures, was some sort of unpleasantness with the police after Anhel and Geronimo had tried to smuggle parts of a toilet under their coats out of the men's room in a bar on 2nd Avenue. In the next few days, Profane came to tally his time in reverse, or Schlemiel's light. Time on the job as escape. Time exposed to any possibility of getting involved with Fina as ass-breaking, wageless labor. What had he said in that phone booth? The question met him at the end of every shift, day, night, or swing, like an evil fog that hovered over whatever manhole he happened to climb out of. Nearly that whole day of slew-footing drunk under February's sun was a blank. He was not about to ask Fina what had happened. There grew a mutual embarrassment between them, as if they'd been to bed after all. Benito, she said one night, 
How come we never talk? What? said Profane, who was watching a Randolph Scott movie on television. Why, well, I talk to you. Sure, nice dress. How about more coffee? I got me another cocodrilo today. You know what I mean. He knew what she meant. Now, here was Randolph Scott, cool, imperturbable, keeping his trap shut and only talking when he had to, and then saying the right things and not running off haphazard and inefficient at the mouth. And here on the other side of the phosphorus screen was Profane, who knew that one wrong word would put him closer than he cared to be to street level, and whose vocabulary, it seemed, was made up of nothing but wrong words. "'Why don't we go to a movie or something?' she said. "'This here,' he answered, "'is a good movie. "'Randolph Scott is this U.S. Marshal, "'and that sheriff there he goes now "'is getting paid off by the gang, "'and all he does all day long is play Fantan "'with a widow who lives up the hill.' "'She withdrew after a while, sat and pouting. "'Why, why did she have to behave like he was a human being? "'Why couldn't he be just an object of mercy? "'What did Fina have to go pushing it for?' What did she want? Which was a stupid question. She was a restless girl, this Josephine, warm and viscous moving, ready to come in a flying machine or any place else. But curious, he decided to ask Anhil. How do I know? Anhil said. It's her business. She don't like anybody in the office. They're all maricon, she says, except for Mr. Winsome, the boss, but he's married, so he's out. What does she want to be? Profane said, a career girl. What does your mother think? My mother thinks everybody should get married. Me, Fina, Geronimo. She'll be after your ass soon. Fina doesn't want anybody. You, Geronimo, the playboys, she doesn't want. Nobody knows what she wants. Playboys, Profane said. Why? It came out then that Fina was spiritual leader or den mother of this youth gang. She had learned in school about a saint called Joan of Arc, who went around doing the same thing for armies who were more or less chicken and no good in a rumble. The playboys, Angel felt, were pretty much the same way. Profane knew better than to ask whether she was giving them sexual comfort, too. He didn't have to ask. He knew this was another work of mercy. The mother to the troops bit, he guessed, not knowing anything about women, was a harmless way to be what maybe every girl wants to be a camp follower with the advantage that here she was not a follower but a leader. How many in the Playboys? Nobody knew, Anhel said. Maybe hundreds. They all were crazy for Fina in a spiritual way. In return, she had to put out nothing but charity and comfort, which she was only too glad to do, punchy with grace already. The Playboys were a strangely exhausted group. Mercenaries, many of them lived in Fina's neighborhood. But unlike other gangs, they had no turf of their own. They were spread out all over the city. Having no common geographical or cultural ground, they put their arsenal and street-fighting prowess at the disposal of any interested party who might be considering a rumble. The youth board had never taken account on them. They were everywhere, but, as Angel had mentioned, chicken. The main advantage in having them on your side was psychological. They cultivated a carefully sinister image— coal-black velvet jackets with the clan name discreetly lettered, small and bloody on the back. Faces pale and soulless as the other side of the night. And you felt that was where they lived, for they would appear suddenly across the street from you and keep pace for a while, and then vanish again as if back behind some invisible curtain. All of them affecting prowling walks, hungry eyes, feral mouths. Profane didn't meet them in any social way until the feast of San Acole de Rinoceronte, which comes on the Ides of March and is celebrated downtown in the neighborhood called Little Italy. High over all Mulberry Street that night soared arches of light bulbs arranged in receding sets of whorls, each spanning the street, shining clear to the horizon because the air was so windless. Under the lights were jury-rigged stalls for penny toss, bingo, pick up the plastic duck and win a prize. Every few steps were stands for Zapoli, beer, sausage, pepper sandwiches. Behind it all was music from two bandstands, one at the downtown end of the street and one halfway along. Popular songs, operas, 
not too loud in the cold night, as if confined only to the area below the lights. Chinese and Italian residents sat out on the stoops as if it were summer, watching the crowds, the lights, the smoke from the Zapoli stands, which rose lazy and unturbulent up toward the lights, but disappeared before it reached them. Profane Angel and Geronimo were out prowling for Konya. It was Thursday night. Tomorrow, according to the nimble calculations of Geronimo, they were working not for Zeitzes, but for the U.S. government, since Friday is one-fifth of the week, and the government takes one-fifth of your check for withholding tax. The beauty of Geronimo's scheme was that it didn't have to be Friday, but could be any day or days in the week, depressing enough to make you feel it would be a breach of loyalty if the time were dedicated to good old Zeitzes. Profane had got into this way of thinking, and along with parties in the daytime and a rotating shift system devised by Bung the foreman, whereby you didn't know till the day before which hours you would be working the next, it put him on a weird calendar which was not ruled off into neat squares at all, but more into a mosaic of tilted street surfaces that changed position according to sunlight, streetlight, moonlight, nightlight. He wasn't comfortable in this street, the people mobbing the pavement between the stalls seemed no more logical than the objects in his dream. They don't have faces, he said to Anhel. A lot of nice asses, though, Anhel said. Look, look, said Geronimo. Three jailbait, all lipstick and shiny, machined breast and buttock surfaces, stood in front of the Wheel of Fortune, twitching and hollow-eyed. Benito, you speak Guinea. Go tell them how about a little. Behind them, the band was playing Madame Butterfly, non-professional, non-rehearsed. It isn't like it was a foreign country, Profane said. Geronimo is a tourist, Angel said. He wants to go down to San Juan and live in the Cariba Hilton and ride around the city looking at Puerto Riqueños. They'd been moseying slow, casing the jailbait at the wheel. Profane's foot came down on an empty beer can. He started to roll. Angel and Geronimo, flanking him, caught him by the arms about halfway down. The girls had turned around and were giggling, the eyes mirthless, ringed in shadow. Angel waved. He goes weak in the knees, Geronimo purred, when he sees beautiful girls. The giggling got louder. Someplace else, the American ensign and the geisha would be singing in Italian to the music behind them. And how was that for a tourist's confusion of tongues? The girls moved away, and the three fell into step beside them. They bought beer and took over an unoccupied stoop. Benny here talks Guinea, said Angel. Say something in Guinea, hey? Svatch him, Profane said. The girls got all shocked. Your friend is a nasty mouth, one of them said. I don't want to sit with any nasty mouth, said the girl, sitting next to Profane. She got up, flipped her butt, and moved down into the street, where she stood hip-shot and stared at Profane out of her dark eye-holes. "'That's his name,' Geronimo said is all. "'And I am Peter O'Leary, and this here is Chain Ferguson.' Peter O'Leary, being an old school chum who was now at a seminary upstate studying to be a priest, he'd been so clean-living in high school that Geronimo and his friends always used him for an alias whenever there might be any trouble." God knew how many had been deflowered, hustled off of for beer, or slugged in his name. Chain Ferguson was the hero of a western they'd been watching on the Mendoza TV the night before. Benny Svachim is really your name? said the one in the street. Svachimento. In Italian it meant destruction or decay. You didn't let me finish. That's all right, then, she said. That isn't bad at all. Bet your shiny, twitching ass, he thought, all unhappy. The other could knock her up higher than those arches of light. She couldn't be more than fourteen, but she knew already that men are drifters. Good for her. Bedmates and all the svachim they have yet to get rid of drift on. And if some stays with her and swells into a little drifter who'll go some day too, why, she wouldn't like that too much, he reckoned. He wasn't angry with her. He looked that thought at her, but who knew what went on in those eyes? They seemed to absorb all the light in the street, from flames beneath sausage grills, from the bridges of light bulbs, windows of neighborhood apartments. 
glowing ends of Denobili cigars, flashing gold and silver of instruments on the bandstand, even light from the eyes of what innocent there were among the tourists. The eyes of a New York woman, he started to sing, are the twilight side of the moon. Nobody knows what goes on back there, where it's always late afternoon. Under the lights of Broadway, far from the lights of home, with a smile as sweet as a candy cane and a heart all plated with chrome. Do they ever see the wandering bums and the boys with no place to go and the drifter who cried for an ugly girl that he left in Buffalo? Dead is the leaves in Union Square, dead is the graveyard sea. The eyes of a New York woman are never going to cry for me, are never going to cry for me. The girl on the sidewalk twitched. It doesn't have any beat. It was a song of the Great Depression. They were singing it in 1932, the year Profane was born. He didn't know where he'd heard it. If it had a beat, it was the beat of beans thumping into an old bucket someplace down in Jersey. Some WPA pick against the pavement. Some bum-laden freight car on a downgrade hitting the gaps between the rails every 39 feet. She'd have been born in 1942. Wars don't have my beat. They're all noise. As a poly man across the street began to sing, Angel and Geronimo started to sing. The band across the street acquired an Italian tenor from the neighborhood. Non dimenticar che ti ho voluto tanto bene, ho saputo amar, non dimenticar. And the cold street seemed all at once to have bloomed into singing. He wanted to take the girl by the fingers, lead her to some place out of the wind, any place warm, pivot her back on those poor ball-bearing heels, and show her his name was Svachim after all. It was a desire he got, off and on, to be cruel and feel at the same time sorrow so big it filled him, leaked out his eyes and the holes in his shoes, to make one big pool of human sorrow on the street, which had everything spilled on it from beer to blood, but very little compassion. I'm Lucille, the girl said to Profane. The other two introduced themselves. Lucille came back up the stoop to sit next to Profane. Geronimo went off for more beer. Angel continued to sing. What do you guys do? Lucille said. I tell tall stories to girls I want to screw, Profane thought. He scratched his armpit. Kill alligators, he said. What? He told her about the alligators. Angel, who had a fertile imagination, too, added detail, color. Together on the stoop, they hammered together a myth. Because it wasn't born from fear of thunder, dreams, astonishment at how the crops kept dying after harvest and coming up again every spring, or anything else very permanent, only a temporary interest, a spur-of-the-moment tumescence. It was a myth, rickety and transient as the bandstands and the sausage-pepper booths of Mulberry Street. Geronimo came back with beer. They sat and drank beer and watched people and told sewer stories. Every once in a while the girls would want to sing. Soon enough they became kittenish. Lucille jumped up and pranced away. Catch me, she said. Oh, God, said Profane. You have to chase her, said one of her friends. Angel and Geronimo were laughing. I have to what? said Profane. The other two girls, annoyed that Angel and Geronimo were laughing, arose and went running off after Lucille. Chase them? Geronimo said. Angel belched. Swat out some of this beer. They got off the stoop unsteadily and fell side by side into a little jog trot. Where'd they go? Profane said. Over there. It seemed after a while they were knocking people over. Somebody swung a punch at Geronimo and missed. They dived under an empty stand, single file, and found themselves out on the sidewalk. The girls were loping along up ahead. Geronimo was breathing hard. They followed the girls who cut off on a side street. By the time they got around the corner, there wasn't girl one to be seen. There followed... A confused quarter hour of wandering along the streets bordering Mulberry, looking under parked cars, behind telephone poles, in back of stoops. 
Nobody here, said Onhill. There was music on Mott Street, coming out of a basement they investigated. A sign outside said social club, beer, dancing. They went down, opened a door, and there, sure enough, was a small beer bar set up in one corner, a jukebox in another, and fifteen or twenty curious-looking juvenile delinquents. The boys wore Ivy League suits, the girls wore cocktail dresses. There was rock and roll on the jukebox. The greasy heads and cantilever braziers were still there, but the atmosphere was refined, like a country club dance. The three of them just stood. Profane saw Lucille after a while, bopping in the middle of the floor with somebody who looked like a chairman of the board of some delinquent's corporation. Over his shoulder, she stuck out her tongue at Profane, who looked away. I don't like it, he heard somebody say, fuzz-wise. Why don't we send it through Central Park and see if anybody rapes it? He happened to glance off to the left. There was a coat room, hanging on a row of hooks, neat and uniform, padded shoulders falling symmetrical either side of the hooks, were two dozen black velvet jackets with red lettering on the back. Ding, dang, thought Profane. Playboy country. Angel and Geronimo had been looking the same way. Do you think we should maybe? Angel wondered. Lucille was beckoning to Profane from a doorway across the dance floor. Wait a minute, he said. He weaved between the couples on the floor. Nobody noticed him. What took you so long? She had him by the hand. It was dark in the room. He walked into a pool table. Here, she whispered. She was lying spread on the green felt. Corner pockets, side pockets, and Lucille. There are some funny things I could say, he began. They've all been said, she whispered. In the dim light from the doorway, her fringed eyes seemed part of the felt. It was as if he were looking through her face to the surface of the table. Skirt raised, mouth open, teeth all white, sharp, ready to sink into whatever soft part of him got that close. Oh, she would surely haunt him. He unzipped his fly and started to climb up on the pool table. There was a sudden scream from the next room. Somebody knocked over the jukebox. The lights went out. What? she said, sitting up. Rumble? Profane said. She came flying off the table, knocked him over. He lay on the floor, his head against a cue rack. Her sudden movement dislodged an avalanche of pool balls on his stomach. Dear God, he said, covering his head. Her high heels tapped away fading with distance over the empty dance floor. He opened his eyes. A pool ball lay even with his eyes. All he could see was a white circle and this black eight inside it. He started to laugh. Outside somewhere, he thought he heard Angel yelling for help. Profane creaked to his feet, zipped his fly up again, blundered out through the darkness. He got out to the street after tripping over two folding chairs and the cord to the jukebox. Crouched behind the brownstone balusters of the front stoop, he saw a great mob of playboys milling around in the street. Girls were sitting on the stoop and lining the sidewalk, cheering. In the middle of the street, Lucille's late partner, the board chairman, was going round and round with a huge negro in a jacket that read, Bop Kings. A few other Bop Kings were mixing it up with the playboys at the fringes of the crowd. Jurisdictional dispute, Profane figured. He couldn't see either Angel or Geronimo. Somebody's going to get burned, said a girl who sat almost directly above him on the steps. Like tinsel suddenly tossed on a Christmas tree, the merry twinkling of switchblades, tire irons, and filed-down garrison belt buckles appeared among the crowd in the street. The girls on the stoop drew breath in concert through bared teeth. They watched eagerly, as if each had kicked in on a pool for who'd draw first blood. It never happened. Whatever they were waiting for, not tonight. Out of nowhere, Fina, Saint Fina of the Playboys, came walking her sexy walk in among fangs, talons, tusks. The air turned summer mild. A boy's choir on a brilliant mauve cloud came floating over from the direction of Canal Street, singing O Salutaris Hostia. The board chairman and the Bob King clasped arms in token of friendship, as their followers stacked arms and embraced. And Fina was borne up by a swarm of pneumatically fat, darling cherubs, 
to hover over the sudden peace she'd created, beaming, serene. Profane gaped, snuffled, and slunk away. For the next week or so, he pondered on Fina and the Playboys and presently began to worry in earnest. There was nothing so special about the gang. Punks are punks. He was sure any love between her and the Playboys was for the moment Christian, unworldly, and proper. But how long was that going to go on? How long could Fina herself hold out? The minute her horny boys caught a glimpse of the wanton behind the saint, the black lace slip beneath the surplice, Fina could find herself on the receiving end of a gangbang, having in a way asked for it. She was overdue now. One evening he came into the bathroom, mattress slung over his back. He'd been watching an ancient Tom Mix movie on television. Fina was lying in the bathtub, seductive. No water, no clothes, just Fina. Now look, he said. Benny, I'm cherry. I want it to be you. She said it defiantly. For a minute it seemed plausible. After all, if it wasn't him, it might be that whole godforsaken wolf pack. He glanced at himself in the mirror. Fat, pig pouches around the eyes. Why did she want it to be him? Why me, he said. You save it for the guy you marry. Who wants to get married, she said. Look, what is Sister Maria Nunziata going to think? Here you've been doing all these nice things for me, for those unfortunate delinquents down the street. You want to get that all scratched off the books? Who'd have thought Profane would ever be arguing like this? Her eyes burned. She twisted, slow and sexy, all those tawny surfaces quivering like quicksand. No, said Profane. Now hop out of there. I want to go to sleep, and don't go yelling rape to your brother. He believes in his sister, shouldn't do any jazzing around, but he knows you better. She climbed out of the bathtub and put a robe around her. I'm sorry, she said. He threw the mattress in the tub, threw himself on top of it and lit a cigarette. She turned off the light and shut the door behind her. Two. Profane's worries about Fina turned real and ugly soon enough. Spring came, quiet, unspectacular, and after many false starts. Hailstorms and high winds dovetailed with days of unwintry peace. The alligators living in the sewers had dwindled to a handful. Zeitzus found himself with more hunters than he needed, so Profane, Anhel, and Geronimo started working part-time. More and more... Profane was coming to feel a stranger to the world downstairs. It had probably happened as imperceptibly as the fall-off in the alligator population, but somehow it began to look like he was losing contact with a circle of friends. "'What am I?' he yelled at himself. "'A St. Francis for alligators? I don't talk to them. I don't even like them. I shoot them.' "'Your ass,' answered his devil's advocate. How many times have they come waddling up to you out of the darkness like friends looking for you? Did it ever occur to you they want to be shot? He thought back to the one he'd chased solo, almost to the East River through Farings Parish. It had lagged, let him catch up, had been looking for it. It occurred to him that somewhere, when he was drunk, too horny to think straight, tired, He'd signed a contract above the paw prints of what were now alligator ghosts, almost as if there had been this agreement, a covenant, profane giving death, the alligators giving him employment, tit for tat. He needed them, and if they needed him at all, it was because in some prehistoric circuit of the alligator brain they knew that as babies they'd been only another consumer object, along with the wallets and pocketbooks of what might have been parents or kin, and all the junk of the world's Macy's. And the soul's passage down the toilet and into the underworld was only a temporary peace intention. Borrowed time till they would have to return to being falsely animated kids' toys. Of course they wouldn't like it. Would want to go back to what they'd been, and the most perfect shape of that was dead. What else? To be gnawed into exquisite rococo by rat artisans, eroded to an antique bone finish by the holy water of the parish, 
tinted to phosphorescence by whatever had made that one alligator's sepulcher so bright that night. When he went down for his now four hours a day, he talked to them sometimes. It annoyed his partners. He had a close call one night when a gator turned and attacked. Mateo caught the flashlight man a glancing blow off his left leg. Profane yelled at him to get out of the way and pumped all five rounds in a cascade of re-echoing blasts square in the alligator's teeth. It's all right, his partner said. I can walk on it. Profane wasn't listening. He was standing by the headless corpse, watching a steady stream of sewage wash its lifeblood out to one of the rivers. He'd lost sense of direction. Baby, he told the corpse, you didn't play it right. You don't fight back. That's not in the contract. Bung, the foreman, lectured him once or twice about this talking to alligators, how it set a bad example for the patrol. Profane said, sure, okay, and remembered after that to say what he was coming to believe he had to say under his breath. Finally, one night in mid-April, he admitted to himself what he'd been trying for a week not to think about, but he and the patrol as functioning units of the sewer department had about had it. Fina had been aware that there weren't many alligators left, and the three of them would soon be jobless. She came upon Profane one evening by the TV set. He was watching a rerun of The Great Train Robbery. Benito, she said, you ought to start looking around for another job. Profane agreed. She told him her boss, Winsome of Outlandish Records, was looking for a clerk, and she could get him an interview. Me, Profane said. I'm not a clerk. I'm not smart enough, and I don't go for that inside work too much. She told him people stupider than he worked as clerks. She said he'd have a chance to move up, make something of himself. A schlemiel is a schlemiel. What can you make out of one? What can one make out of himself? You reach a point, and Profane knew he'd reached it, where you know how much you can and cannot do. But every now and again he got attacks of acute optimism. I will give it a try, he told her, and thanks. She was grace-happy. Here he had kicked her out of the bathtub, and now she was turning the other cheek. He began to get lewd thoughts. Next day she called up. Angel and Geronimo were on day shift. Profane was off till Friday. He lay on the floor playing pinochle with Cook, who was on the hook from school. Find a suit, she said. One o'clock is your interview. What? said Profane. He'd grown fatter after these weeks of Mrs. Mendoza's cooking. Angel's suit didn't fit him anymore. Borrow one of my father's, she said, and hung up. Old Mendoza didn't mind. The biggest suit in the closet was a George Raft model circa mid-thirties, double-breasted, dark blue serge, padded shoulders. He put it on and borrowed a pair of shoes from Angel. On the way downtown on the subway, he decided that we suffer from great temporal homesickness for the decade we were born in, because he felt now as if he were living in some private depression days. The suit, the job with the city that would not exist after two weeks more at the most. All around him were people in new suits, millions of inanimate objects being produced brand new every week, new cars in the streets, Houses going up by the thousands all over the suburbs he had left months ago. Where was the depression? In the sphere of Benny Profane's guts, and in the sphere of his skull, concealed optimistically by a tight blue serge coat and a schlemiel's hopeful face. The outlandish office was in the Grand Central area, seventeen floors up. He sat in an anteroom full of tropical hothouse groves, while the wind streamed bleak and heat-sucking past the windows. The receptionist gave him an application to fill out. He didn't see Fina. As he handed the completed form to the girl at the desk, a messenger came through, a negro wearing an old suede jacket. He dropped a stack of inter-office mail envelopes on the desk, and for a second his eyes and profanes met. Maybe Profane had seen him under the street, or at one of the shape-ups, 
but there was a little half-smile and a kind of half-telepathy, and it was as if this messenger had brought a message to profane, too. Sheathed to everybody but the two of them in an envelope of eye beams touching that said, Who are you trying to kid? Listen to the wind. He listened to the wind. The messenger left. Mr. Winsom will see you in a moment, said the receptionist. Profane wandered over to the window and looked down at 42nd Street. It was as if he could see the wind, too. The suit felt wrong on him. Maybe it was doing nothing, after all, to conceal this curious depression which showed up in no stock market or year-end report. Hey, where are you going, said the receptionist. Changed my mind, Profane told her. Out in the hall, going down in the elevator, in the lobby, and in the street, he looked for the messenger but couldn't find him. He unbuttoned the jacket of old Mendoza's suit and shuffled along 42nd Street, head down straight into the wind. Friday at the shape-up, Zeitzis, almost crying, gave them the word from now on only two days a week operation, only five teams for some mopping up out in Brooklyn. On the way home that evening, Profane, Anhel, and Geronimo stopped off at a neighborhood bar on Broadway. They stayed till near last call when a few of the girls wandered in. This was on Broadway in the 80s, which is not the Broadway of showbiz, or even a broken heart for every light on it. Uptown was a bleak district with no identity, where a heart never does anything so violent or final as break, merely gets increased tensile, compressive, sheer loads piled on it bit by bit every day, till eventually these and its own shudderings fatigue it. The first wave of girls came in around midnight to get change for the evening's clients. They weren't pretty, and the bartender always had a word for them. Some would be back in again near closing time to have a nightcap, whether there'd been any business or not. If they did have a customer along, usually one of the small gangsters around the neighborhood, the bartender would be as attentive and cordial as if they were young lovers, which in a way they were. And if a girl came in without having found any business all night, the bartender would give her coffee with a big shot of brandy and say something about how it was raining or too cold and not much good, he supposed, for customers. She'd usually have a last try at whoever was in the place. Profane, Anhel, and Geronimo laughed after talking with the girls and having a few rounds at the bowling machine. Coming out, they met Mrs. Mendoza. You seen your sister? she asked Anhel. She was going to come help me shop right after work. She never did anything like this before, Angelito. I'm worried. Cook came running up. Dolores says she's out with the Playboys, but she doesn't know where. Fina just called up, and Dolores says she sounded funny. Mrs. Mendoza grabbed him by the head and asked where from this phone call, and Cook said he'd told her already. Nobody knew. Profane looked toward Angel and caught Angel looking at him. When Mrs. Mendoza was gone, Angel said, I don't like to think about it, my own sister, but if one of those little pingas tries anything, man. Profane didn't say he'd been thinking the same thing. Angel was upset enough already, but he knew Profane was thinking about a gangbang, too. They both knew Fina. We have to find her, he said. They're all over the city, Geronimo said. I know a couple of their hangouts. They decided to start at the Mott Street Clubhouse. Till midnight, they took subways all over the city, finding only empty clubhouses or locked doors. But as they were wandering along Amsterdam in the 60s, they heard noise around the corner. Jesus Christ, Geronimo said. A full-scale rumble was on. A few guns in evidence, but mostly knives, lengths of pipe, garrison belts. The three skirted along the side of the street where cars were parked and found somebody in a tweed suit hiding behind a new Lincoln and fiddling with the controls of a tape recorder. A sound man was up in a nearby tree dangling microphones. The night had become cold and windy. Howdy, said the tweed suit. My name is Winsome. My sister's boss, Anhel whispered. Profane heard a scream up the street, which might have been Fina. He started running. There was shooting and a lot of yelling. Five bop kings came running out of an alley ten feet ahead into the street. 
Angel and Geronimo were right behind Profane. Somebody had parked a car in the middle of the street with WLIB on the radio turned up to top volume. Close at hand, they heard a belt whiz through the air and a scream of pain, but a big tree's black shadow hid whatever was happening. They cased the street for a clubhouse. Soon they found PB and an arrow chalked on the sidewalk, the arrow pointing in toward a brownstone. They ran up the steps and saw PB chalked on the door. The door wouldn't open. Angel kicked at it a couple of times, and the lock broke. Behind them, the street was chaos. A few bodies lay prostrate near the sidewalk. Angel ran down the hall, profane and Geronimo behind him. Police sirens from uptown and crosstown started to converge on the rumble. Angel opened a door at the end of the hall, and for half a second profane saw Fina through it, lying on an old army cot, naked, hair in disarray, smiling. Her eyes had become hollowed as Lucille's that night on the pool table. Angel turned and showed all his teeth. Don't come in, he said, wait. The door closed behind him, and soon they heard him hitting her. Angel might have been satisfied only with her life. Profane didn't know how deep the code ran. He couldn't go in and stop it, didn't know if he wanted to. The police sirens had grown to a crescendo and suddenly cut off. Rumble was over. More than that, he suspected, was over. He said good night to Geronimo and left the brownstone, didn't turn his head to see what was happening behind him in the street. He wouldn't go back to Mendoza's, he figured. There was no more work under the street. What peace there had been was over. He had to come back to the surface, the Dream Street. Soon he found a subway station. Twenty minutes later he was downtown, looking for a cheap mattress. Chapter 7 She Hangs on the Western Wall V. Dudley Eigenvalue, DDS, browsed among treasures in his Park Avenue office residence. Mounted on black velvet in a locked mahogany case, showpiece of the office, was a set of false dentures, each tooth a different precious metal. The upper right canine was pure titanium, and for Eigenvalue the focal point of the set. He had seen the original sponge at a foundry near Colorado Springs a year ago, having flown there in the private plane of one Clayton Bloody Chicklets. Chicklets of Yo-Yo Dine, one of the biggest defense contractors on the East Coast, with subsidiaries all over the country. He and Eigenvalue were part of the same circle. That was what the enthusiast Stencil said and believed. For those who keep an eye on such things, bright little flags had begun to appear toward the end of Eisenhower's first term, fluttering bravely in history's gray turbulence, signaling that a new and unlikely profession was gaining moral ascendancy. Back around the turn of the century, psychoanalysis had usurped from the priesthood the role of Father Confessor. Now, it seemed, the analyst in his turn was about to be deposed by, of all people, the dentist. It appeared actually to have been little more than a change in nomenclature. Appointments became sessions. Profound statements about oneself came to be prefaced by, My dentist says, Psychodontia, like its predecessors, developed a jargon. You called neurosis malocclusion. Oral, anal, and genital stages, deciduous dentition. Id, pulp, and superego, enamel. The pulp is soft and laced with little blood vessels and nerves. The enamel, mostly calcium, is inanimate. These were the it and I psychodontia had to deal with. The hard, lifeless eye covered up the warm, pulsing it, protecting and sheltering. Eigenvalue, enchanted by the titanium's dull spark, brooded on Stencil's fantasy, thinking of it with conscious effort as a distal amalgam, an alloy of the illusory flow and gleam of mercury with the pure truth of gold or silver, filling a breach in the protective enamel far from the root. Cavities in the teeth occur for good reason, Eigenvalue reflected, but even if there are several per tooth, 
There's no conscious organization there against the life of the pulp, no conspiracy. Yet we have men like Stencil, who must go about grouping the world's random carries into cabals. Intercom blinked gently. Mr. Stencil, it said. So, what pretext this time? He'd spent three appointments getting his teeth cleaned. Gracious and flowing Dr. Agenvalue entered the private waiting room. Stencil rose to meet him, stammering. Toothache, the doctor suggested, solicitous. Nothing wrong with the teeth, Stencil got out. You must talk. You must both drop pretense. From behind his desk in the office, Eigenvalue said, You're a bad detective and a worse spy. It isn't espionage, Stencil protested, but the situation is intolerable, a term he'd learned from his father. They're abandoning the alligator patrol, slowly so as not to attract attention. You think you've frightened them? Please. The man was ashen. He produced a pipe and pouch and set about scattering tobacco on the wall-to-wall -wall carpeting. You presented the alligator patrol to me, said Eigenvalue, in a humorous light, an interesting conversation piece while my hygienist was in your mouth. Were you waiting for her hands to tremble, for me to go all pale? Had it been myself and a drill, such a guilt reaction might have been very, very uncomfortable. Stencil had filled the pipe and was lighting it. You've conceived somewhere the notion that I am intimate with the details of a conspiracy. In a world such as you inhabit, Mr. Stencil, any cluster of phenomena can be a conspiracy. So no doubt your suspicion is correct. But why consult me? Why not the Encyclopedia Britannica? It knows more than I about any phenomena you should ever have interest in. Unless, of course, you're curious about dentistry. How weak he looked sitting there. How old was he? Fifty-five. And he looked seventy. Whereas Eigenvalue, at roughly the same age, looked thirty-five. Young as he felt. Which field, he asked playfully. Periodontia, oral surgery, orthodontia, prosthetics? Suppose it was prosthetics, taking Eigenvalue by surprise. Stencil was building a protective curtain of aromatic pipe smoke to be inscrutable behind, but his voice had somehow regained a measure of self-possession. Come, said Eigenvalue. They entered a rear office where the museum was. Here were a pair of forceps once handled by Fauchard, a first edition of the Surgeon Dentist, Paris, 1728, a chair sat in by patients of Chapin Aaron Harris, a brick from one of the first buildings of the Baltimore College of Dental Surgery. Eigenvalue led Stencil to the mahogany case. Whose? said Stencil, looking at the dentures. Like Cinderella's prints, Eigenvalue smiled. I'm still looking for the jaw to fit these. And Stencil, possibly. It would be something she'd wear. I made them, said Eigenvalue. Anybody you'd be looking for would never have seen them. Only you, I, and a few other privileged have seen them. How does Stencil know? That I'm telling the truth? Tut, Mr. Stencil. The false teeth in the case smiled, too, twinkling as if in reproach. Back in the office, Eigenvalue, to see what he could see, inquired, Who then is V? But the conversational tone didn't take Stencil aback. He didn't look surprised that the dentist knew of his obsession. Psychodontia has its secrets, and so does Stencil, Stencil answered. But most important, so does V. She's yielded him only the poor skeleton of a dossier. Most of what he has is inference. He doesn't know who she is, nor what she is. He's trying to find out, as a legacy from his father. The afternoon curled outside with only a little wind to stir it. Stencil's words seemed to fall insubstantial inside a cube no wider than Eigenvalue's desk. The dentist kept quiet as Stencil told how his father had come to hear of the girl V. When he'd finished, Eigenvalue said, You followed up, of course, on the spot investigation. Yes, 
but found out hardly more than Stencil has told you, which was the case. Florence, only a few summers ago, had seemed crowded with the same tourists as at the turn of the century, but V, whoever she was, might have been swallowed in the airy Renaissance spaces of that city, assumed into the fabric of any of a thousand great paintings, for all Stencil was able to determine. He had discovered, however, what was pertinent to his purpose, that she'd been connected, though perhaps only tangentially, with one of those grand conspiracies or foretastes of Armageddon, which seemed to have captivated all diplomatic sensibilities in the years preceding the Great War. V and a conspiracy. Its particular shape governed only by the surface accidents of history at the time. Perhaps history this century, thought Eigenvalue, is rippled with gathers in its fabric such that if we are situated, as stencils seem to be, at the bottom of a fold, it's impossible to determine warp, woof, or pattern anywhere else. By virtue, however, of existing in one gather, it is assumed there are others, compartmented off into sinuous cycles, each of which come to assume greater importance than the weave itself and destroy any continuity. Thus it is that we are charmed by the funny-looking automobiles of the thirties, the curious fashions of the twenties, the peculiar moral habits of our grandparents. We produce and attend musical comedies about them and are conned into a false memory, a phony nostalgia about what they were. We are, accordingly, lost to any sense of a continuous tradition. Perhaps if we lived on a crest, things would be different. We could at least see. One. In April of 1899, young Evan Godolphin, daft with the spring and sporting a costume too aesthetic for such a fat boy, pranced into Florence. Camouflaged by a gorgeous sun shower which had burst over the city at three in the afternoon, his face was the color of a freshly baked pork pie and as noncommittal. Alighting at the Stazione Centrale, he flagged down an open cab with his umbrella of cerise silk, roared the address of his hotel to a cook's luggage agent, and, with a clumsy entrechat de and a jolly ho to no one in particular, leaped in and was driven caroling away down Via de Ponzani. He had come to meet his old father, Captain Hugh, F.R.G.S., and explorer of the Antarctic. At least, such was the ostensible reason. He was, however, the sort of ne'er-do-well who needs no reason for anything, ostensible or otherwise. The family called him Evan the Oaf. In return, in his more playful moments, he referred to all other Godolphins as the Establishment. But like his other utterances, there was no rancor here. In his early youth he had looked aghast at Dickens's fat boy as a challenge to his faith in all fat boys as innately nice fellows and subsequently worked as hard at contradicting that insult to the breed as he did at being a ne'er-do-well. For despite protests from the establishment to the contrary, shiftlessness did not come easily to Evan. He was not, though fond of his father, much of a conservative. For as long as he could remember, he had labored beneath the shadow of Captain Hugh, a hero of the Empire, resisting any compulsion to glory which the name Godolphin might have implied for himself. But this was a characteristic acquired from the age, and Evan was too nice a fellow not to turn with the century. He had dallied for a while with the idea of getting a commission and going to sea, not to follow in his old father's wake, but simply to get away from the establishment. His adolescent mutterings in times of family stress were all prayerful, exotic syllables. Bahrain, Dar es Salaam, Samarang. But in his second year at Dartmouth, he was expelled for leading a nihilist group called the League of the Red Sunrise, whose method of hastening the revolution was to hold mad and drunken parties beneath the Commodore's window. Flinging up their collective arms at last in despair, the family exiled him to the continent, hoping, possibly, that he would stage some prank harmful enough to society to have him put away in a foreign prison. At Deauville, 
recuperating after two months of good-natured lechery in Paris, he'd returned to his hotel one evening, seventeen thousand francs to the good, and grateful to a bay named Cher Ballon. To find a telegram from Captain Hugh, which said, Here you were sacked. If you need someone to talk to, I am at Piazza della Signoria 5, eighth floor. I should like very much to see you, son. Unwise to say too much in telegram. Vesu. You understand. Father. Vesu. Of course. A summons he couldn't ignore, Vesu. He understood. Hadn't it been their only nexus for longer than Evan could remember? Had it not stood preeminent in his catalogue of outlandish regions where the establishment held no sway? It was something which, to his knowledge, Evan alone shared with his father, though he himself had stopped believing in the place around the age of sixteen. His first impression on reading the wire, that Captain Hugh was senile at last, or raving, or both, was soon replaced by a more charitable opinion. Perhaps, Evan reasoned, his recent expedition to the south had been too much for the old boy. But en route to Pisa, Evan had finally begun to feel disquieted at the tone of the thing. He'd taken of late to examining everything in print, menus, railway timetables, posted advertisements, for literary merit. He belonged to a generation of young men who no longer called their fathers pater because of an understandable confusion with the author of the Renaissance, and was sensitive to things like tone. And this had a je ne sais quoi de sinistre about it, which sent pleasurable chills racing along his spinal column. His imagination ran riot. Unwise to say too much in telegram, intimations of a plot, a cabal grand and mysterious, combined with that appeal to their only common possession. Either by itself would have made Evan ashamed. Ashamed at hallucinations belonging in a spy thriller, even more painfully ashamed for an attempt at something which should have existed but did not, based only on the sharing long ago of a bedside story. But both, together, were like a parley of horses, capable of a whole arrived at by some operation more alien than simple addition of parts. He would see his father. In spite of the heart's vagrancy, the cerise umbrella, the madcap clothes. Was rebellion in his blood? He'd never been troubled enough to wonder. Certainly the League of the Red Sunrise had been no more than a jolly lark. He couldn't yet become serious over politics but he had a mighty impatience with the older generation, which is almost as good as open rebellion. He became more bored with talk of empire the further he lumbered upward out of the slough of adolescence. Shunned every hint of glory like the sound of a leper's rattle. China, the Sudan, the East Indies, they Sioux had served their purpose. Given him a sphere of influence roughly congruent with that of his skull, private colonies of the imagination whose borders were solidly defended against the establishment's incursions or depredations. He wanted to be left alone, never to do well in his own way, and would defend that oaf's integrity to the last lazy heartbeat. The cab swung left, crossing the tram tracks with two bone-rattling jolts, and then right again into the Via dei Vecchietti. Evan shook four fingers in the air and swore at the driver, who smiled absently. A tram came blithering up behind them, drew abreast. Evan turned his head and saw a young girl in dimity blinking huge eyes at him. Signorina, he cried, a brava fanciula, sei tu inglese? She blushed and began to study the embroidery on her parasol. Evan stood up on the cab seat, postured, winked, began to sing De Vieni alla Finestra from Don Giovanni. Whether or not she understood Italian, the song had a negative effect. She withdrew from the window and hid among a mob of Italians standing in the center aisle. Evan's driver chose this moment to lash the horses into a gallop and swerve across the tracks again, 
in front of the tram. Evan, still singing, lost his balance and fell halfway over the back of the carriage. He managed to catch hold of the boot's top with one flailing arm, and after a deal of graceless floundering, to haul himself back in. By this time they were in Via Peccari. He looked back and saw the girl getting out of the tram. He sighed as his cab bounced on past Giotto's Campanile, still wondering if she were English. 2. In front of a wine shop on the Ponte Vecchio sat Signor Montisa and his accomplice in crime, a seedy-looking calabrese named Cesare. Both were drinking Broglio wine and feeling unhappy. It had occurred to Cesare, sometime during the rain, that he was a steamboat. Now that the rain was only a slight drizzle, the English tourists were beginning to emerge once more from the shops lining the bridge and Cesare was announcing his discovery to those who came within earshot. He would emit short blasts across the mouth of the wine bottle to encourage the illusion. Toot, he would go. Toot, vaporetto io. Signor Montisa was not paying attention. His five feet three rested angular on the folding chair, a body small, well wrought, and somehow precious as if it were the forgotten creation of any goldsmith, even Cellini, shrouded now in dark surge and waiting to be put up for auction. His eyes were streaked and rimmed with the pinkness of what seemed to be years of lamenting. Sunlight bouncing off the Arno, off the fronts of shops, fractured into spectra by the falling rain, seemed to tangle or lodge in his blonde hair, eyebrows, mustache, turning that face to a mask of inaccessible ecstasy, contradicting the sorrowing and weary eye-holes. He would be drawn inevitably again to these eyes, linger as you might have on the rest of the face. Any visitor's guide to Signor Montesa must accord them an asterisk denoting a special interest, though offering no clue to their enigma, for they reflected a free-floating sadness unfocused, indeterminate. A woman, the casual tourist might think at first, be almost convinced until some more Catholic light moving in and out of a web of capillaries would make him not so sure. What then? Politics, perhaps. Thinking of gentle-eyed Mazzini with his lambent dreams, the observer would sense frailness, a poet-liberal, but if he kept watching long enough, the plasma behind those eyes would soon run through every fashionable permutation of grief. Financial trouble, declining health, destroyed faith, betrayal, impotence, loss, until eventually it would dawn on our tourist that he had been attending no wake after all. Rather, a street-long festival of sorrow with no booth the same, no exhibit offering anything solid enough to merit lingering at. The reason was obvious and disappointing, simply that Signor Montisa himself had been through them all. Each booth was a permanent exhibit in memory of some time in his life when there had been a blonde seamstress in Lyon, or an abortive plot to smuggle tobacco over the Pyrenees, or a minor assassination attempt in Belgrade. All his reversals had occurred, had been registered. He had assigned each one equal weight, had learned nothing from any of them except that they would happen again. Like Machiavelli, he was in exile, and visited by shadows of rhythm and decay. He mused in violet by the serene river of Italian pessimism, and all men were corrupt. History would continue to recapitulate the same patterns. There was hardly ever a dossier on him wherever in the world his tiny, nimble feet should happen to walk. No one in authority seemed to care. He belonged to that inner circle of deracinated seers whose eyesight was clouded over only by occasional tears, whose outer rim was tangent to rims enclosing the decadence of England and France, the generation of ninety-eight in Spain, for whom the continent of Europe was like a gallery one is familiar with, but long weary of, 
useful now only as shelter from the rain or some obscure pestilence. Cesare drank from the wine bottle. He sang, Il piove dolor mia, ed anch'io piango. No, said Signor Montisa, waving away the bottle. No more for me till he arrives. There are two English ladies, Cesare cried. I will sing to them, for God's sake. Vedi, donna vezzosa, questo poveretto, sempre cantante d'amore come. Be quiet, can't you? Un vaporetto. Triumphantly, he boomed a hundred-cycle note across the Ponte Vecchio. The English ladies cringed and passed on. After a while, Signor Montisa reached under his chair, coming up with a new fiasco of wine. Here is the gaucho, he said. A tall, lumbering person in a wide-awake hat loomed over them, blinking curiously. Biting his thumb irritably at Cesare, Signor Montisa found a corkscrew, gripped the bottle between his knees, drew the cork. The gaucho straddled a chair backwards and took a long swallow from the wine bottle. Brolio, Signor Montisa said, the finest. The gaucho fiddled absently with his hat brim, then burst out. I'm a man of action, Signor. I'd rather not waste time. Allora, the business. I have considered your plan. I asked for no details last night. I dislike details. As it was, the few you gave me were superfluous. I'm sorry, I have many objections. It is much too subtle. There are too many things that can go wrong. How many people are in it now? You, myself, and this lout. Chasery beamed. Too, too many. You should have done it all alone. You mentioned wanting to bribe one of the attendants. It would make four. How many more will have to be paid off? Consciences set at ease. Chances arise that someone can betray us to the guardier before this wretched business is done. Signor Montisa drank, wiped his mustaches, smiled painfully. Cesare is able to make the necessary contacts, he protested. He's below suspicion. No one notices him. The river barge to Pisa, the boat from there to Nice. Who should have arranged these if not... You, my friend, the gaucho said menacingly, prodding Signor Montisa in the ribs with the corkscrew. You alone... Is it necessary to bargain with the captains of barges and boats? No. It is necessary only to get on board, to stow away. From there on in, assert yourself. Be a man. If the person in authority objects, he twisted the corkscrew savagely, furling several square inches of Signor Montisa's white linen shirt around it. Capisci? Signor Montisa, skewered like a butterfly, flapped his arms, grimaced, tossed his golden head. Certo io, he finally managed to say. Of course, signor commendatore, to the military mind, uh, direct action, of course, but in such a delicate matter. Pa! The gaucho disengaged the corkscrew, sat glaring at signor Montisa. The rain had stopped, the sun was setting, the bridge was thronged with tourists, returning to their hotels on the Longano. Cesare gazed benignly at them. The three sat in silence until the gaucho began to talk, calmly but with an undercurrent of passion. Last year in Venezuela it was not like this. Nowhere in America was it like this. There were no twistings, no elaborate maneuverings. The conflict was simple. We wanted liberty. They didn't want us to have it. Liberty or slavery, my Jesuit friend— Two words only. It needed none of your extra phrases, your tracts, none of your moralizing, no essays on political justice. We knew where we stood and where one day we would stand, and when it came to the fighting, we were equally as direct. You think you are being Machiavellian with all these artful tactics. You once heard him speak of the lion and the fox, and now your devious brain can see only the fox. What has happened to the strength, the aggressiveness, the natural nobility of the lion? What sort of an age is this where a man becomes one's enemy only when his back is turned? 
Signor Montisa had regained some of his composure. It is necessary to have both, of course, he said placatingly, which is why I chose you as a collaborator, Commendatore. You are the lion, I, humbly, a very small fox. And he is the pig, the gaucho roared, clapping Cesare on the shoulder. Bravo, a fine cadre. Pig, said Cesare happily, making a grab for the wine bottle. No more, the gaucho said. The signor here has taken the trouble to build us all a house of cards. Much as I dislike living in it, I won't permit your totally drunken breath to blow it over in indiscreet talk. He turned back to Signor Montisa. No, he continued, you are not a true Machiavellian. He was an apostle of freedom for all men. Who can read the last chapter of Il Principe and doubt his desire for a republican and united Italy? Right over there. He gestured toward the left bank, the sunset. He lived, suffered under the Medici. They were the foxes, and he hated them. His final exhortation is for a lion, an embodiment of power, to arise in Italy and run all foxes to earth forever. His morality was as simple and honest as my own and my comrades in South America. And now, under his banner, you wish to perpetuate the detestable cunning of the Medici, who suppressed freedom in this very city for so long. I am dishonored irrevocably, merely having associated with you. If, again the pained smile, if the commendatore has perhaps some alternative plan, we should be happy. Of course there's another plan, the gaucho retorted. The only plan. Here, you have a map? Eagerly, Signor Montisa produced from an inside pocket a folded diagram, hand-sketched in pencil. The gaucho peered at it distastefully. So, that is the Uffizi, he said. I've never been inside the place. I suppose I shall have to, to get the feel of the terrain. And where is the objective? Signor Montisa pointed to the lower left-hand corner. The Sala di Lorenzo Monaco, he said. Here, you see. I have already had a key made for the main entrance. Three main corridors, east, west, and a short one on the south, connecting them. From the west corridor, number three, we enter a smaller one here, marked Ricciati Diversi. At the end, on the right, is a single entrance to the gallery. She hangs on the western wall. A single entrance, which is also the single exit, the gaucho said. Not good. A dead end. And to leave the building itself, one must go all the way back up the eastern corridor to the steps leading to the Piazza della Signoria. There is a lift, said Signor Montisa, leading to a passage which lets one out in the Palazzo Vecchio. A lift, the gaucho sneered. About what I'd expect from you. He leaned forward, baring his teeth. You already propose to commit an act of supreme idiocy by walking all the way down one corridor, all along another, halfway up a third, down one more into a cul-de-sac, and then out again the same way you came in. A distance of, he measured rapidly, some six hundred meters, with guards ready to jump out at you every time you pass a gallery or turn a corner. But even this isn't confining enough for you. You must take a lift. Besides which, Cesare put in, she's so big. The gaucho clenched one fist. How big? One hundred seventy-five by two hundred seventy-nine centimeters, admitted Signor Montisa. Capo di Minghe, the gaucho sat back, shaking his head. With an obvious effort at controlling his temper, he addressed Signor Montisa. I'm not a small man, he explained patiently. In fact, I am rather a large man and broad. I am built like a lion. Perhaps it's a racial trait. I come from the north, and there may be some Tedesco blood in these veins. The Tedeschi are taller than the Latin races, taller and broader. Perhaps some day this body will run to fat, but now it is all muscle. So, I am big, non è vero? Good. Then let me inform you, his voice rising in violent crescendo, that there would be room enough under your damnable Botticelli for me and the fattest whore in Florence, with plenty left over for her elephant of a mother to act as chaperone, 
How in God's name do you intend to walk three hundred meters with that? Will it be hidden in your pocket? Come, commended Torre, Signor Montisa pleaded. Anyone might be listening. It is a detail, I assure you, provided for. The florist Cesare visited last night. Florist? Florist? You've let a florist into your confidence. Wouldn't it make you happier to publish your intentions in the evening newspapers? But he is safe. He is only providing the tree. The tree. The Judas tree. Small, some four meters, no taller. Cesare has been at work all morning, hollowing out the trunk. So we shall have to execute our plan soon before the purple flowers die. Forgive what may be my appalling stupidity, the gaucho said. But as I understand it, you intend to roll up the birth of Venus, hide it in the hollow trunk of a Judas tree, and carry it some three hundred meters past an army of guards who will soon be aware of its theft, and out into the Piazza della Signoria, where presumably you will then lose yourself in the crowds. Precisely. Early evening would be the best time. Arrivederci. Signor Montisa leaped to his feet. I beg you, Commendatore, he cried. Aspetta. Cesare and I will be disguised as workmen, you see. The Uffizi is being redecorated. There will be nothing unusual. Forgive me, the gaucho said. You are both lunatics. But your cooperation is essential. We need a lion, someone skilled in military tactics and strategy. Very well. The gaucho retraced his steps and stood towering over Signor Montisa. I suggest this. The Sala di Lorenzo Monaco has windows, does it not? Heavily barred? No matter. A bomb. A small bomb, which I'll provide. Anyone who tries to interfere will be disposed of by force. The window should let us out next to the posta centrale. Your rendezvous with the barge? Under the Ponte San Trinita. Some four or five hundred yards up the Lungarno. We can commandeer a carriage. Have your barge waiting at midnight tonight? That's my proposal. Take it or leave it. I shall be at the Uffizi till supper time, reconnoitering. From then till nine at home, making the bomb. After that, at Scheisvogel's, the Biriere. Let me know by ten. But the tree, commendatory, it cost close to two hundred lira. Damn your tree! With a smart about face, the gaucho turned and strode away in the direction of the right bank. The sun hovered over the Arno. Its declining rays tinged the liquid gathering in Signor Montisa's eyes to a pale red, as if the wine he'd drunk were overflowing, watered down with tears. Cesare let a consoling arm fall round Signor Montisa's thin shoulders. It will go well, he said. The gaucho is a barbarian. He's been in the jungles too long. He doesn't understand. She is so beautiful, Signor Montisa whispered. Davvero. And I love her, too. We are comrades in love. Signor Montisa did not answer. After a little while, he reached for the wine. Three. Miss Victoria Wren, late of Lardwick in the Fen, Yorkshire, recently self-proclaimed a citizen of the world, knelt devoutly in the front pew of a church just off Via dello Studio. She was saying an act of contrition. An hour before, in the Via dei Vecchietti, she'd had impure thoughts while watching a fat English boy cavort in a cab. She was now being heartily sorry for them. At nineteen, she'd already recorded a serious affair, having the autumn before in Cairo seduced one good fellow, an agent of the British Foreign Office. Such is the resilience of the young that his face was already forgotten. Afterward, they'd both been quick to blame the violent emotions which arise during any tense international situation. This was at the time of the Fashoda crisis, for her deflowering. Now, six or seven months later, she found it difficult to determine how much she had in fact planned, how much had been out of her control. The liaison had, in due course, been discovered by her widowed father, Sir Alistair, with whom she and her sister Mildred were traveling. There were words, 
sobbings, threats, insults, late one afternoon under the trees in the Esbekia garden, with little Mildred gazing struck and tearful at it all, while God knew what scars were carved into her. At length, Victoria had ended it with a glacial goodbye and a vow never to return to England. Sir Alistair had nodded and taken Mildred by the hand. Neither had looked back. Support after that was readily available. By prudent saving, Victoria had amassed some four hundred pounds from a wine merchant in Antibes, a Polish cavalry lieutenant in Athens, an art dealer in Rome. She was in Florence now to negotiate the purchase of a small couturier's establishment on the left bank. A young lady of enterprise, she found herself acquiring political convictions, beginning to detest anarchists, the Fabian Society, even the Earl of Rosebury. Since her eighteenth birthday, she had been carrying a certain innocence like a penny candle, sheltering the flame under a ringless hand, still soft with baby fat, redeemed from all stain by her candid eyes and small mouth, and a girl's body entirely honest as any act of contrition. So she knelt, unadorned save for an ivory comb, gleaming among all the plausibly English quantities of brown hair. An ivory comb, five-toothed, whose shape was that of five crucified, all sharing at least one common arm. None of them was a religious figure. They were soldiers of the British Army. She had found the comb in one of the Cairo bazaars. It had apparently been hand-carved by a fuzzy-wuzzy, an artisan among the modists, in commemoration of the crucifixions of 83, in the country east of invested Khartoum. Her motives in buying it may have been as instinctive and uncomplex as those by which any young girl chooses a dress or gewgaw of a particular hue and shape. Now she did not regard her time with Goodfellow or with the three since him as sinful. She only remembered Goodfellow at all because he had been the first. It was not that her private outre brand of Roman Catholicism merely condoned what the Church as a whole regarded as sin— this was more than simple sanction. It was implicit acceptance of the four episodes as outward and visible signs of an inward and spiritual grace belonging to Victoria alone. Perhaps it was a few weeks she had spent as a girl in the novitiate, preparing to become a sister, perhaps some malady of the generation, but somehow at age nineteen she had crystallized into a nun-like temperament pushed to its most dangerous extreme. Whether she had taken the veil or not, it was as if she felt Christ were her husband, and that the marriage's physical consummation must be achieved through imperfect, mortal versions of himself, of which there had been to date four. And he would continue to perform his husband's duties through as many more such agents as he deemed fit. It is easy enough to see where such an attitude might lead. In Paris, similarly-minded ladies were attending black masses, in Italy they lived in pre-Raphaelite splendor as the mistresses of archbishops or cardinals. It happened that Victoria was not so exclusive. She arose and walked down the center aisle to the rear of the church. She dipped her fingers in holy water and was about to genuflect when someone collided with her from behind. She turned, startled, to see an elderly man a head shorter than herself, his hands held in front of him, his eyes frightened. You are English, he said. I am. You must help me. I am in trouble. I can't go to the Consul General. He didn't look like a beggar or a hard-up tourist. She was reminded somehow of good fellow. Are you a spy, then? The old man laughed mirthlessly. Yes, in a way I am engaged in espionage, but against my will, you know. I didn't want it this way. Distraught. I want to confess, don't you see? I'm in a church, a church is where one confesses. Come, she whispered. Not outside, he said. The cafes are being watched. She took his arm. There is a garden in the back, I think. This way, through the sacristy. He let her guide him, docile. A priest was kneeling in the sacristy, reading his breviary. She handed him ten soldi as they passed. He didn't look up. A short... Groined arcade led into a miniature garden 
surrounded by mossy stone walls and containing a stunted pine, some grass, and a carp pool. She led him to a stone bench by the pool. Rain came over the walls in occasional gusts. He carried a morning newspaper under his arm. Now he spread sheets of it over the bench. They sat. Victoria opened her parasol, and the old man took a minute lighting a cavour. He sent a few puffs of smoke out into the rain and began, I don't expect you've ever heard of a place called Vesu. She had not. He started telling her about Vesu, how it was reached on camelback over a vast tundra, past the dolmens and temples of dead cities, finally to the banks of a broad river which never sees the sun, so thickly roofed is it with foliage. The river is traveled in long teak boats which are carved like dragons and paddled by brown men whose language is unknown to all but themselves. In eight days' time there is a portage over a neck of treacherous swampland to a green lake, and across the lake rise the first foothills of the mountains which ring Vesu. Native guides will only go a short distance into these mountains. Soon they will turn back, pointing out the way. Depending on the weather, it is one to two more weeks over moraine, sheer granite, and hard blue ice before the borders of Vesu are reached. Then you have been there, she said. He had been there fifteen years ago, and been fury-ridden since. Even in the Antarctic, huddling in hasty shelter from a winter storm, striking camp high on the shoulder of some as yet unnamed glacier, there would come to him hints of the perfume those people distill from the wings of black moths. Sometimes sentimental scraps of their music would seem to lace the wind, memories of their faded murals depicting old battles and older love affairs among the gods would appear without warning in the aurora. You are Godolphin, she said, as if she had always known. He nodded, smiled vaguely. I hope you are not connected with the press. She shook her head, scattering droplets of rain. This isn't for general dissemination, he said, and it may be wrong. Who am I to know my own motives? But I did foolhardy things. Brave things, she protested. I've read about them in newspapers and books. But things which did not have to be done. The trek along the barrier. The try for the pole in June. June down there is midwinter. It was madness. It was grand. Another minute, he thought hopelessly, and she'd begin talking about a Union Jack flying over the pole. Somehow this church, towering gothic and solid over their heads, the quietness, her impassivity, his confessional humor, he was talking too much, must stop, but could not. We can always so easily give the wrong reasons, he cried, can say... The Chinese campaigns, they were for the Queen, and India for some gorgeous notion of empire. I know. I have said these things to my men, the public, to myself. There are Englishmen dying in South Africa today and about to die tomorrow who believe these words as, I dare say, as you believe in God. She smiled secretly. And you did not? she asked gently. She was gazing at the rim of her parasol. I did, until... Yes. But why? Have you never harrowed yourself halfway to disorder with that single word, why? His cigar had gone out. He paused to relight it. It's not, he continued, as if it were unusual in any supernatural way. No, High priests with secrets lost to the rest of the world, jealously guarded since the dawn of time, generation to generation. No universal cures, nor even panaceas for human suffering. Vesu is hardly a restful place. There's barbarity, insurrection, internecine feud. It's no different from any other godforsakenly remote region the English have been jaunting in and out of places like Vesu for centuries, except... She had been gazing at him. The parasol leaned against the bench, its handle hidden in the wet grass. 
the colors. So many colors. His eyes were tightly closed, his forehead resting on the bowed edge of one hand. The trees outside the head shaman's house have spider monkeys which are iridescent. They change color in the sunlight. Everything changes. The mountains, the lowlands are never the same color from one hour to the next. No sequence of colors is the same from day to day, as if you lived inside a madman's kaleidoscope. Even your dreams become flooded with colors, with shapes no Occidental ever saw, not real shapes, not meaningful ones, simply random, the way clouds change over a Yorkshire landscape. She was taken by surprise. Her laugh was high and brittle. He hadn't heard. They stay with you, he went on. They aren't fleecy lambs or jagged profiles. They are... they are... Vesu, it's raiment, perhaps it's skin. And beneath? You mean soul, don't you? Of course you do. I wondered about the soul of that place, if it had a soul, because their music, poetry, laws, and ceremonies come no closer. They are skin, too, like the skin of a tattooed savage. I often put it that way to myself, like a woman. I hope I don't offend. It's all right. Civilians have curious ideas about the military, but I expect in this case there's some justice to what they think about us. This idea of the randy young subaltern somewhere out in the back of beyond collecting himself a harem of dusky native women. I dare say a lot of us have this dream, though I've yet to run across anyone who's realized it. And I won't deny I get to thinking this way myself. I got to thinking that way in Vesu. Somehow, there, his forehead furrowed, dreams are not, not closer to the waking world, but somehow I think they do seem more real. Am I making sense to you? Go on. She was watching him rapt. But as if the place were, were a woman you had found somewhere out there, a dark woman tattooed from head to toes, and somehow you had got separated from the garrison and found yourself unable to get back so that you had to be with her, close to her, day in and day out. And you would be in love with her. At first, but soon that skin, the gaudy, god-awful riot of pattern and color, would begin to get between you and whatever it was in her that you thought you loved. And soon, in perhaps only a matter of days, it would get so bad that you would begin praying to whatever god you knew of to send some leprosy to her, to flay that tattooing to a heap of red, purple, and green debris, leave the veins and ligaments raw and quivering and open at last to your eyes and your touch. I'm sorry. He wouldn't look at her. The wind blew rain over the wall. Fifteen years. It was directly after we'd entered Khartoum. I'd seen some beastliness in my Oriental campaigning, but nothing to match that. We were to relieve General Gordon. Oh, you were, I suppose, a chit of a girl then, but you've read about it, surely. What the Mahdi had done to that city, to General Gordon, to his men. I was having trouble with fever then, and no doubt it was seeing all the carrion and the waste on top of that. I wanted to get away suddenly. It was as if a world of neat hollow squares and snappy countermarching had deteriorated into rout or mindlessness. I'd always had friends on the staffs at Cairo, Bombay, Singapore, and in two weeks this surveying business came up, and I was in. I was always weaseling in, you know, on some show where you wouldn't expect to find naval personnel. This time it was escorting a crew of civilian engineers into some of the worst country on earth. Oh, wild, romantic. Contour lines and fathom markings, cross hatchings and colors where before there were only blank spaces on the map. All for the Empire. This sort of thing might have been lurking at the back of my head. But then I only knew I wanted to get away. All very good to be crying St. George and no quarter about the Orient. But then the modest army had been gibbering the same thing, really, in Arabic, and had certainly meant it at Khartoum. Mercifully, he did not catch sight of her comb. Did you get maps of Esu? He hesitated. No, he said. 
No data ever got back, either to F.O. or to the Geographic Society. Only a report of failure. Bear in mind, it was bad country. Thirteen of us went in and three came out. Myself, my second-in-command, and a civilian whose name I have forgotten and who, so far as I know, has vanished from the earth without a trace. And your second-in-command? He is... he is in hospital, retired now. There was a silence. There was never a second expedition, old Godolphin went on. Political reasons, who could say? No one cared. I got out of it scot-free. Not my fault, they told me. I even received a personal commendation from the Queen, though it was all hushed up. Victoria was tapping her foot absently. And all this has some bearing on your, oh, espionage activities at present? Suddenly he looked older. The cigar had gone out again. He flung it into the grass. His hand shook. Yes. He gestured helplessly at the church, the gray walls. For all I know, you might be... I may have been indiscreet. Realizing that he was afraid of her, she leaned forward intent. Those who watch the cafes, are they from Vesu, emissaries? The old man began to bite at his nails slowly and methodically, using the top central and lower lateral incisors to make minute cuts along a perfect arc segment. You have discovered something about them, she pleaded, something you cannot tell. Her voice, compassionate and exasperated, rang out in the little garden. You must let me help you. Snip, snip. The rain fell off, stopped. What sort of world is it where there isn't at least one person you can turn to if you're in danger? Snip, snip, no answer. How do you know the Consul General can't help? Please let me do something. The wind came in, lorn now of rain over the wall. Something splashed lazily in the pool. The girl continued to harangue old Godolphin as he completed his right hand and switched to his left. Overhead, the sky began to darken. 4. The eighth floor at Piazza della Signoria 5 was murky and smelled of fried octopus. Evan, puffing from the last three flights of stairs, had to light four matches before he found his father's door. Tacked to it, instead of the card he'd expected to find, was a note on ragged-edged paper, which read simply, Evan. He squinted at it curiously. Except for the rain and the house's creakings, the hallway was silent. He shrugged and tried the door. It opened. He groped his way inside, found the gas, lit it. The room was sparsely furnished. A pair of trousers had been tossed haphazard over the back of a chair. A white shirt, arms outstretched, lay on the bed. There were no other signs that anyone lived there. No trunks, no papers. Puzzled. He sat on the bed and tried to think. He pulled the telegram out of his pocket and read it again. Vesu. The only clue he had to go on. Had old Godolphin really, after all, believed such a place existed? Evan, even the boy, had never pressed his father for details. He had been aware that the expedition was a failure, caught perhaps some sense of personal guilt or agency in the droning kindly voice which recited those stories. But that was all. He'd asked no questions, had simply sat and listened, as if anticipating that some day he would have to renounce Vesu, and that such renunciation would be simpler if he formed no commitment now. Very well. His father had been undisturbed a year ago when Evan had last seen him. Something must therefore have happened in the Antarctic, or on the way back, perhaps here in Florence. Why should the old man have left a note with only his son's name on it? Two possibilities. A. If it were no note, but rather a name card, and Evan the first alias to occur to Captain Hugh, or... B. If he had wished Evan to enter the room. Perhaps both. On a sudden hunch, Evan picked up the pair of trousers, began rummaging through the pockets. He came up with three soldi and a cigarette case. Opening the case, he found four cigarettes, all hand-rolled. He scratched his stomach. Words came back to him. Unwise to say too much in telegram. He sighed. All right, then, young Evan, he muttered to himself. 
we shall play this thing to the hilt. Enter Godolphin, the veteran spy. Carefully, he examined the case for hidden springs, felt along the lining for anything which might have been put underneath. Nothing. He began to search the room, prodding the mattress and scrutinizing it for recently stitched seams. He combed the armoire, lit matches in dark corners, looked to see if anything was taped to the bottoms of chair seats. After twenty minutes he'd still found nothing and was beginning to feel inadequate as a spy. He threw himself disconsolate into a chair, picked up one of his father's cigarettes, struck a match. Wait, he said. Shook out the match, pulled a table over, produced a penknife from his pocket, and carefully slid each cigarette down the side, brushing the tobacco off onto the floor. On the third try he was successful. Written in pencil on the inside of the cigarette paper was, Discovered here, Scheisvogel's, 10 p.m., be careful, father. Evan looked at his watch. Now what in the devil was all this about? Why so elaborate? Had the old man been fooling with politics, or was it a second childhood? He could do nothing for a few hours at least. He hoped something was afoot, if only to relieve the grayness of his exile, but was ready to be disappointed. Turning off the gas, he stepped into the hall, closed the door behind him, began to descend the stairs. He was wondering where Scheisvogels could be when the stairs suddenly gave under his weight and he crashed through, clutching frantically in the air. He caught hold of the banister. It splintered at the lower end and swung him out over the stairwell seven flights up. He hung there, listening to the nails edge slowly out of the railing's upper end. I, he thought, am the most uncoordinated oaf in the world. That thing is going to give any second now. He looked around, wondering what he should do. His feet hung two yards away from and several inches above the next banister. The ruined stairway he'd just left was a foot away from his right shoulder. The railing he hung on swayed dangerously. What can I lose, he thought. Only hope my timing isn't too off. Carefully he bent his right forearm up until his hand rested flat against the side of the stairway, then gave himself a violent shove. He swung out over the gaping well, heard the nails shriek free of the wood above him as he reached the extreme point of his swing, flung the railing away, dropped neatly astride the next banister, and slid down it backwards, arriving at the seventh floor, just as the railing crashed to earth far below. He climbed off the banister, shaking, and sat on the steps. Neat, he thought. Bravo, lad. Do well as an acrobat or something. But a moment later, after he had nearly been sick between his knees, he thought, How accidental was it, really? Those stairs were all right when I came up. He smiled nervously. He was getting almost as loony as his father. By the time he reached the street, his shakiness had almost gone. He stood in front of the house for a minute, getting his bearings. Before he knew it, he'd been flanked by two policemen. Your papers, one of them said. Evan came aware, protesting automatically. Those are our orders, Cavaliere, Evan caught a slight note of contempt in the Cavaliere. He produced his passport. The guardier nodded together on seeing his name. Would you mind telling me, Evan began. They were sorry they could give him no information. He would have to accompany them. I demand to see the English consul general. But, Cavaliere, how do we know you are English? This passport could be forged. You may be from any country in the world even one we have never heard of. Flesh began to crawl on the back of his neck. He had suddenly got the insane notion they were talking about Vay Su. If your superiors can give a satisfactory explanation, he said, I am at your service. Certainly, Cavalieri. They walked across the square and around a corner to a waiting carriage. One of the policemen courteously relieved him of his umbrella and began to examine it closely. Avanti, cried the other, and away they galloped down the Borgo di Greci. Five. Earlier that day, the Venezuelan consulate had been in an uproar. A coded message had come through from Rome at noon in the daily bag, warning of an upswing in revolutionary activities around Florence. Various of the local contacts had already reported a tall, 
mysterious figure in a wide-awake hat lurking in the vicinity of the consulate during the past few days. Be reasonable, urged Salazar, the vice-consul. The worst we have to expect is a demonstration or two. What can they do? Break a few windows, trample the shrubbery. Bombs, screamed Raton, his chief. Destruction, pillage, rape, chaos. They can take us over, stage a coup, set up a junta. What better place? They remember Garibaldi in this country. Look at Uruguay. They will have many allies. What do we have? You, myself, one cretin of a clerk, and the charwoman. The vice-consul opened his desk drawer and produced a bottle of Rufina. My dear Raton, he said, calm yourself. This ogre in the flapping hat may be one of our own men, sent over from Caracas to keep an eye on us. He poured the wine into two tumblers, handed one to Raton. Besides which, the communique from Rome said nothing definite. It did not even mention this enigmatic person. He is in on it. Raton said, slurping wine. I have inquired. I know his name and that his activities are shady and illegal. Do you know what he is called? He hesitated dramatically. The Gaucho. Gauchos are in Argentina, Salazar observed soothingly, and the name might also be a corruption of the French gauche. Perhaps he is left-handed. It is all we have to go on, Raton said obstinately. It is the same continent, is it not? Salazar sighed. What is it you want to do? Enlist help from the government police here. What other course is there? Salazar refilled the tumblers. First, he said, international complications. There may be a question of jurisdiction. The grounds of this consulate are legally Venezuelan soil. We can have them place a cordon of guardia around us. Outside the property, Raton said craftily. That way they would be suppressing riot in Italian territory. Es possibile, the vice consul shrugged. But secondly, it might mean a loss of prestige with the higher echelons in Rome. In Caracas, we could easily make fools of ourselves acting with such elaborate precautions on mere suspicion, mere whimsy. Whimsy, shouted Raton. Have I not seen this sinister figure with my own eyes? One side of his mustache was soaked with wine. He wrung it out irritably. There is something afoot, he went on, something bigger than simple insurrection, bigger than a single country. The foreign office of this country has its eye on us. I cannot, of course, speak too indiscreetly, but I have been in this business longer than you, Salazar, and I tell you, we shall have much more to worry about than trampled bushes before this business is done. Of course, Salazar said peevishly, if I am no longer party to your confidences. You would not know. Perhaps they do not know at Rome. You will discover everything in due time, soon enough, he added darkly. If it were only your job, I would say fine. Call in the Italians, call in the English and the Germans, too, for all I care. But if your glorious coup doesn't materialize... I come out of it just as badly. And then, Raton chuckled, that idiot clerk can take over both our jobs. Salazar was not mollified. I wonder, he said thoughtfully, what sort of consul general he would make. Raton glowered. I am still your superior. Very well, then, Your Excellency, spreading his hands hopelessly. I await your orders. Contact the government police at once. Outline the situation. Stress its urgency. Ask for a conference at their earliest possible convenience. Before sundown, that means. That is all. You might request that this gaucho be put under apprehension. Salazar did not answer. After a moment of glaring at the Rufina bottle, Raton turned and left the office. Salazar chewed on the end of his pen meditatively. It was midday. He gazed out the window across the street at the Uffizi Gallery. He noticed clouds massing over the Arno. Perhaps there would be rain. They caught up with the gaucho finally in the Uffizi. He'd been lounging against one wall of the Sala di Lorenzo Monaco, leering at the birth of Venus. She was standing in half of what looked like a scungile shell. Fat and blonde, 
and the gaucho, being a Tedesco in spirit, appreciated this. But he didn't understand what was going on in the rest of the picture. There seemed to be some dispute over whether or not she should be nude or draped. On the right, a glassy-eyed lady, built like a pear, tried to cover her up with a blanket, and on the left, an irritated young man with wings tried to blow the blanket away, while a girl wearing hardly anything twined around him, probably trying to coax him back to bed. While this curious crew wrangled, Venus stood gazing off into God knew where, covering up with her long tresses. No one seemed to be looking at anyone else. A confusing picture. The gaucho had no idea why Signor Montisa should want it, but it was none of the gaucho's affair. He scratched his head under the wide-awake hat and turned with a still-tolerant smile to see four guardiae heading into the gallery toward him. His first impulse was to run, his second to leap out a window. But he'd familiarized himself with the terrain, and both impulses were checked almost immediately. It is he, one of the guardiae announced. Avanti! The gaucho stood his ground, cocking the hat aslant and putting his fists on his hips. They surrounded him, and a tenente with a beard informed him that he must be placed under apprehension. It was regrettable, true, but doubtless he would be released within a few days. The tenente advised him to make no disturbance. I could take all four of you, the gaucho said. His mind was racing, planning tactics, calculating angles of enfilade. Had Il Grand Signore Mantisa blundered so extravagantly as to be arrested? Had there been a complaint from the Venezuelan consulate? He must be calm and admit nothing until he saw how things lay. He was escorted along the Ritrati Diversi, then two short rites into a long passageway. He didn't remember it from Montesa's map. Where does this lead? Over the Ponte Vecchio to the Pitti Gallery, the tenente said. It is for tourists. We are not going that far. A perfect escape route. The idiot, Montesa. But halfway across the bridge they came out into the back room of a tobacconist's. The police seemed familiar with this exit. Not so good, then, after all. Yet why all this secrecy? No city government was ever this cautious. It must, therefore, be the Venezuelan business. In the street was a closed landau, painted black. They hustled him in and started toward the right bank. He knew they wouldn't head directly for their destination. They did not. Once over the bridge, the driver began to zigzag, run in circles, retrace his way. The gaucho settled back, cadged a cigarette from the tenente, and surveyed the situation. If it were the Venezuelans, he was in trouble. He had come to Florence specifically to organize the Venezuelan colony, who were centered in the northeast part of the city, near Via Cavour. There were only a few hundred of them. They kept to themselves and worked either in the tobacco factory or at the Mercato Centrale, or as sutlers to the Fourth Army Corps, whose installations were nearby. In two months, the gaucho had squared them away into ranks and uniforms under the collective title Figli di Machiavelli. Not that they had any particular fondness for authority— nor that they were, politically speaking, especially liberal or nationalistic. It was simply that they enjoyed a good riot now and again, and if martial organization and the aegis of Machiavelli could expedite things, so much the better. The gaucho had been promising them a riot for two months now, but the time was not yet favorable. Things were quiet in Caracas, with only a few small skirmishes going on in the jungles, he was waiting for a major incident, a stimulus to which he could provide a thunderous antiphonal response back across the Atlantic's nave. It had been, after all, only two years since settlement of the boundary dispute with British Guiana, over which England and the United States nearly came to blows. His agents in Caracas kept reassuring him the scene was being set, men were being armed, bribes given. It was only a matter of time. Apparently something had happened, or why should they be pulling him in? He had to figure out some way of getting a message to his lieutenant, Cuerna Cabron. Their usual rendezvous was at Scheisvogel's beer garden in Piazza Vittorio Emanuele, 
and there was still Montisa and his Botticelli. Regrettable about that, it would have to wait till another night. Imbecile. Wasn't the Venezuelan consulate located only some fifty meters from the Uffizi? If there were a demonstration in progress, the Guardier would have their hands full, might not even hear the bomb go off. A diversionary feint. Montisa, Cesare, and the fat blonde would all get away cleanly. He might even escort them to their rendezvous under the bridge. As instigator, it wouldn't be prudent to remain at the scene of the riot for very long. This was all assuming, of course, that he could talk his way out of whatever charges the police would try to press, or, failing that, escape. But the essential thing right now was to get word to Querna Cabron. He felt the carriage begin to slacken speed. One of the guardiae produced a silk handkerchief, doubled and redoubled it, and bound it over the gaucho's eyes. The Landau bounced to a halt. The tenente took his arm and led him through a courtyard, in a doorway, around a few corners, down a flight of stairs. In here, ordered the tenente. May I ask a favor, the gaucho said, feigning embarrassment. With all the wine I have drunk today, I have not had the chance, that is, if I am to answer your questions honestly and amiably, I should feel more at ease if— All right, the tenente growled. Angela, you keep an eye on him. The gaucho smiled his thanks. He trailed down the hall after Angelo, who opened the door for him. May I remove this, he asked. After all, un gabinetto e un gabinetto. Quite true, the guardia said. And the windows are opaque. Go ahead. Mire grazie. The gaucho removed his blindfold and was surprised to find himself in an elaborate W.C. There were even stalls. Only the Americans and the English could be so fastidious about plumbing, and the hallway outside, he remembered, had smelled of ink, paper, and sealing wax. A consulate, surely. Both the American and the British consuls had their headquarters in Via Tornabuoni, so he knew that he was roughly three blocks west of Piazza Vittorio Emanuele. Scheisvogels was almost within calling distance. Hurry up, Angelo said. Are you going to watch? the gaucho asked, indignant. Can't I have a little privacy? I am still a citizen of Florence. This was a republic once. Without waiting for a reply, he entered a stall and shut the door behind him. How do you expect me to escape? he called jovially from inside. Flush myself and swim away down the Arno? While urinating, he removed his collar and tie, scribbled a note to Querna Cabron on the back of the collar, reflected that occasionally the fox had his uses as well as the lion, replaced collar, tie, and blindfold, and stepped out. You decided to wear it after all, Angelo said, testing my marksmanship. They both laughed. The tenente had stationed the other two guardiae outside the door. The man lacks charity, mused the gaucho as they steered him back down the hall. Soon he was in a private office, seated on a hard wooden chair. "'Take the blindfold off,' ordered a voice with an English accent. A wizened man, going bald, blinked at him across a desk. "'You are the gaucho,' he said. "'We can speak English, if you like,' the gaucho said. Three of the guardia had withdrawn. The tenente and three plain clothesmen who looked to the gaucho like state police stood ranged about the walls. You are perceptive, the balding man said. The gaucho decided to give at least the appearance of honesty. All the Inglesi he knew seemed to have a fetish about playing cricket. I am, he admitted, enough to know what this place is, Your Excellency. The balding man smiled wistfully. I am not the consul general, he said. That is Major Percy Chapman, and he is occupied with other matters. Then I would guess, the gaucho guessed, that you are from the English Foreign Office, cooperating with Italian police. Possibly. Since you seem to be of the inner circle in this matter, I presume you know why you have been brought here. The possibility of a private arrangement with this man suddenly seemed plausible. He nodded. And we can talk honestly. The gaucho nodded again, grinning. Then let us start, the balding man said. 
by your telling me all you know about Vei Su. The gaucho tugged perplexedly at one ear. Perhaps he had miscalculated after all. Venezuela, you mean? I thought we had agreed not to fence. I said Vei Su. All at once the gaucho, for the first time since the jungles, felt afraid. When he answered, it was with an insolence that rang hollow even to himself. I know nothing about Vei Su, he said. The balding man sighed. Very well. He shuffled papers around on the desk for a moment. Let us get down to the loathsome business of interrogation. He signaled to the three policemen, who closed swiftly in a triangle around the gaucho. Six. When old Godolphin awoke, it was to a wash of red sunset through the window. It was a minute or two till he remembered where he was. His eyes flickered from the darkening ceiling to a flowered bouffant dress hanging on the door of the armoire, to a confusion of brushes, vials, and jars on the dressing table, and then he remembered that this was the girl Victoria's room. She had brought him here to rest for a while. He sat up on the bed, peering about the room nervously. He knew he was in the Savoy on the eastern side of the Piazza Vittorio Emanuele. But where had she gone? She had said she would stay, keep watch over him, see that no harm came. Now she had disappeared. He looked at his watch, twisting the dial to catch the failing sunlight. He'd been asleep only an hour or so. She had wasted little time in leaving. He arose, walked to the window, stood gazing out over the square, watching the sun go down. The thought struck him that she might, after all, be one of the enemy. He turned furiously, dashed across the room, twisted the doorknob. The door was locked. Damn the weakness, this compulsion to beg shrift of any random passer-by. He felt betrayal welling up around him, eager to drown, to destroy. He had stepped into the confessional and found himself instead in an oubliette. He crossed swiftly to the dressing-table, looking for something to force the door, and discovered a message neatly indicted on scented note-paper for him. If you value your well-being as much as I do, please do not try to leave. Understand that I believe you and want to help you in your terrible need. I have gone to inform the British consulate of what you have told me. I have had personal experience with them before. I know the Foreign Office to be highly capable and discreet. I shall return shortly after dark. He balled the paper up in his fist, flung it across the room. Even taking a Christian view of the situation, even assuming her intentions were well meant and that she was not leagued with those who watched the cafes, informing Chapman was a fatal error. They could not afford to have the F.O. in on this. He sank down on the bed, head hung, hands clasped tightly between his knees. Remorse and a numb impotence. They had been jolly chums riding arrogant on his epaulets like guardian angels for fifteen years. It was not my fault, he protested aloud to the empty room, as if the mother of pearl brushes, the lace and dimity, the delicate vessels of scent would somehow find tongue and rally round him. I was not meant to leave those mountains alive. That poor civilian engineer dropped out of human sight. Pike gleaming, incurable and insensate in a home in Wales, and Hugh Godolphin. He arose, walked to the dressing table, stood staring at his face in the mirror. He will only be a matter of time. A few yards of calico lay on the table, near them a pair of pinking shears. The girl seemed to be serious about her dressmaking scheme. She had been quite honest with him about her past not moved by his own confessional spirit, so much as wanting to give him some token to prepare the way toward a mutual trustfulness. He hadn't been shocked by her disclosure of the affair with Goodfellow in Cairo. He thought it unfortunate. It seemed to have given her some quaint and romantic views about espionage. He picked up the shears, turned them over in his hands. They were long and glittering. The ripple edges would make a nasty wound. He raised his eyes to those of his reflection with an inquiring look. The reflection smiled dolefully. No, he said aloud. 
not yet. Forcing the door with the shears took only half a minute. Two flights down the back stairs and out a service entrance, and he found himself in Via Tosinghi, a block north of the piazza. He headed east, away from the center of town. He had to find a way out of Florence. However he came out of this, he would have to resign his commission and live from here on in a fugitive, a temporary occupant of pension rooms, a dweller in the demimonde. Marching through the dusk, he saw his fate complete, preassembled, inescapable. No matter how he tacked, yawed, or dodged about, he'd only be standing still while that treacherous reef loomed closer with every shift in course. He turned right and headed toward the Duomo. Tourists sauntered by, cabs clattered in the street. He felt isolated from a human community, even a common humanity, which he had regarded until recently as little more than a cant concept which liberals were apt to use in making speeches. He watched the tourists gaping at the Campanile. He watched dispassionately without effort, curiously without commitment. He wondered at this phenomenon of tourism. What was it drove them to Thomas Cook and Son in ever-increasing flocks every year, to let themselves in for the Campania's fevers, the Levant's squalor, the septic foods of Greece. To return to Ludgate Circus at the desolate end of every season, having caressed the skin of each alien place, a peregrine or Don Juan of cities, but no more able to talk of any mistress's heart than to cease keeping that interminable catalogue, that non piccio libro. Did he owe it to them, the lovers of skins, not to tell about Vesu, not even to let them suspect the suicidal fact that below the glittering integument of every foreign land there is a hard, dead point of truth, and that in all cases, even England's, it is the same kind of truth, can be phrased in identical words? He had lived with his knowledge since June, and that headlong drive for the pole, was able now to control or repress it almost at will. But the humans, those from whom prodigal he had strayed and could expect no future blessing, those four fat schoolmistresses whinnying softly to one another by the south portals of the Duomo, that fop in tweeds and clipped mustaches who came hastening by in fumes of lavender toward God knew what assignation, had they any notion of what inner magnitudes such control must draw on? His own, he knew, were nearly played out. He wandered down Via del Orivolo, counting the dark spaces between street lamps as he had once counted the number of puffs it took him to extinguish all his birthday candles. This year, next year, sometime, never. There were more candles at this point, perhaps, than even he could dream, but nearly all had been blown to twisted black wicks, and the party needed very little to modulate to the most gently radiant of wakes. He turned left toward the hospital and surgeon's school, tiny and gray-haired, and casting a shadow, he felt much too large. Footsteps behind him. On passing the next street lamp, he saw the elongated shadows of helmeted heads bobbing about his quickening feet. Guardier? He nearly panicked. He'd been followed. He turned to face them, arms spread like the drooping wings of a condor at bay. He couldn't see them. You are wanted for questioning, a voice purred in Italian out of the darkness. For no good reason he could see... Life returned to him all at once. Things were as they had always been, no different from leading a renegade squad against the Mahdi, invading Borneo in a whaleboat, attempting the pole in midwinter. Go to hell, he said cheerfully. Skipped out of the pool of light they'd trapped him in and went dashing off down a narrow, twisting side street. He heard footsteps, curses, cries of Avanti behind him. Would have laughed, but couldn't waste the breath. Fifty meters on, he turned abruptly down an alley. At the end was a trellis. He grasped it, swung himself up, 
began to climb. Young rose thorns pricked his hands. The enemy howled closer. He came to a balcony, vaulted over, kicked in a set of French windows, and entered a bedroom where a single candle burned. A man and a woman cringed nude and dumbfounded on the bed, their caresses frozen to immobility. Madonna, the woman screamed, e il mio marito. The man swore and tried to dive under the bed. Old Godolphin, blundering through the room, guffawed. My God, he was thinking irrelevantly, I have seen them before. I have seen this all twenty years ago in a music hall. He opened a door, found a stairway, hesitated briefly, then started up. No doubt about it, he was in a romantic mood. He'd be let down if there weren't a dash over the rooftops. By the time he gained the roof, the voices of his pursuers were roaring in confusion far to his left. Disappointed, he made his way over the tops of two or three more buildings anyway, found an outside stairway, and descended to another alley. For ten minutes he jogged along, taking in great breaths, steering sinuous course. A brilliantly lighted back window finally attracted his attention. A cat footed up to it, peered in. Inside, three men conferred anxiously amid a jungle of hothouse flowers, shrubs, and trees. One of them he recognized and chuckled in amazement. It is a small planet indeed, he thought, whose nether end I have seen. He tapped on the window. Rough, he called softly. Signor Mantisa glanced up, startled. Minge, he said, seeing Godolphin's grinning face. The old Inglese. Let him in, someone. The florist, red-faced and disapproving, opened the rear door. Godolphin stepped in quickly. The two men embraced. Cesare scratched his head. The florist retreated behind a fan palm after re-securing the door. A long way from Port Said, Signor Montisa said. Not so far, Godolphin said, nor so long. Here was the sort of friendship which doesn't decay, however gapped it may be over the years with arid stretches of isolation from one another. More significant, a renewal of that instant, motiveless acknowledgment of kinship one autumn morning four years back on the coaling piers at the head of the Suez Canal. Godolphin, impeccable in full-dress uniform, preparing to inspect his man-o'-war. Raphael Montisa, the entrepreneur, overseeing the embarkation of a fleet of bumboats he'd acquired in a drunken baccarat game in Cannes the month before, had each touched glances and seen immediately in the other an identical uprootedness, a similarly Catholic despair. Before they spoke, they were friends. Soon they had gone out and got drunk together, told each other their lives, were in fights, found, it seemed, a temporary home in the half-world behind Port Said's Europeanized boulevards. No rot about eternal friendship or blood brotherhood ever needed to be spoken. What is it, my friend? Signor Montisa said now. Do you remember once, Godolphin said, a place I told you, Vesu? It hadn't been the same as telling his son or the board of inquiry or Victoria a few hours before. Telling Raff had been like comparing notes with a fellow sea dog on a liberty port both had visited. Signor Montisa made a sympathetic moo. That again, he said. You have business now, I'll tell you later. No, nothing, this matter of a Judas tree. I have no more, Gadrulfi, the florist muttered. I've been telling him this for half an hour. He's holding out, Cesare said ominously. Two hundred and fifty lire he wants this time. Godolphin smiled. What chicanery with the law requires a Judas tree? Without hesitation, Signor Montisa explained. And now, he concluded, we need a duplicate which we will let the police find. Godolphin whistled. You leave Florence tonight, then? One way or the other, on the river barge at midnight, see? And there would be room for one more? My friend, Signor Montisa, gripped him by the biceps. For you, he said. Godolphin nodded. You're in trouble, of course. You need not even have asked. If you had come along even without a word, I would have slain the barge captain at his first protest. The old man grinned. He was beginning to feel at least halfway secure for the first time in weeks. 
Let me make up the extra fifty lire, he said. I could not allow. Nonsense. Get the Judas tree. Sullenly, the florist pocketed the money, shambled to the corner, and dragged a Judas tree growing in a wine vat from behind a thick tangle of ferns. The three of us can handle it, Cesare said. Where to? The Ponte Vecchio, Signor Montisa said, and then to Scheisvogel's. Remember, Cesare, a firm and united front. We must not let the gaucho intimidate us. We may have to use his bomb, but we shall also have the Judas trees, the lion and the fox. They formed a triangle around the tree and lifted. The florist held the back door open for them. They carried the tree twenty meters down an alley to a waiting carriage. Andiam, Signor Montisa cried. The horses moved off at a trot. I am to meet my son at Scheisvogel's in a few hours, Godolphin said. He had almost forgotten that Evan was probably now in the city. I thought a beer hall would be safer than a cafe, but perhaps it is dangerous after all. The Guardia are after me. They and others may have the place under surveillance. Signor Montisa took a sharp right expertly. Ridiculous, he said. Trust me. You are safe with Montisa. I will defend your life as long as I have my own. Godolphin did not answer for a moment, then only shook his head in acceptance. But now he found himself wanting to see Evan almost desperately. You will see your son. It will be a jolly family reunion. Cesare was uncorking a bottle of wine and singing an old revolutionary song. A wind had risen off the Arno. It blew Signor Montisa's hair into a pale flutter. They headed toward the center of town, rattling along at a hollow clip. Cesare's mournful singing soon dissipated in the seeming vastness of that street. 7. The Englishman who had questioned the gaucho was named Stencil. A little after sundown, he was in Major Chapman's study, sitting bemused in a deep leather chair, his scarred Algerian briar gone out unnoticed in the ashtray beside him. In his left hand, he held a dozen wooden penholders, recently fitted with shiny new nibs. With his right hand, he was hurling the pens methodically like darts at a large photograph of the current foreign minister, which hung on the wall opposite. So far, he had scored only a single hit in the center of the minister's forehead. This had made his chief resemble a benevolent unicorn, which was amusing but hardly rectified the situation. The situation at the moment was frankly appalling. More than that, it seemed to be irreparably bitched up. The door suddenly burst open, and a rangy man, prematurely gray, came roaring in. They found him, he said, not too elated. Stencil glanced up quizzically, a pen poised in his hand. The old man? At the Savoy. A girl, a young English girl, has him locked in. She just told us, walked in and announced calmly enough. Go check it out, then, Stencil interrupted. Though he's probably bolted by now. Don't you want to see her? Pretty? Rather. Now, then, things are bad enough as it is, if you see my point. I'll leave her to you, demi -Volt. Bravo, Sidney. Dedicated to duty, aren't you? St. George and no quarter. I say. Well, I'm off, then. Don't say I didn't give you first chance. Stencil smiled. You're acting like a chorus boy. Perhaps I will see her later when you're done. Demi Volt smiled woefully. It makes the situation halfway tolerable, you know, and bounded sadly back out through the door. Stencil gritted his teeth. Oh, the situation, the bloody situation. In his more philosophical moments, he would wonder about this abstract entity, the situation, its idea, the details of its mechanism. He remembered times when whole embassies full of personnel had simply run amok and gibbering in the streets when confronted with a situation which refused to make sense no matter who looked at it or from what angle. He had once had a school chum named Kovas. They had entered the diplomatic service together, worked their way up neck and neck. Until last year, along came the Fashoda crisis, 
and quite early one morning Covis was discovered in spats and a pith helmet working his way around Piccadilly trying to recruit volunteers to invade France. There had been some idea of commandeering a Cunard liner. By the time they caught him, he'd sworn in several costermongers, two streetwalkers, and a music hall comedian. Stencil remembered painfully that they had all been singing onward Christian soldiers in various keys and tempi. He had decided long ago that no situation had any objective reality. It only existed in the minds of those who happened to be in on it at any specific moment. Since these several minds tended to form a sum total or complex more mongrel than homogeneous, the situation must necessarily appear to a single observer much like a diagram in four dimensions to an eye conditioned to seeing its world in only three. Hence, the success or failure of any diplomatic issue must vary directly with the degree of rapport achieved by the team confronting it. This had led to the near obsession with teamwork which had inspired his colleagues to dub him Soft Shoe Sydney on the assumption that he was at his best working in front of a chorus line. But it was a neat theory, and he was in love with it. The only consolation he drew from the present chaos was that his theory managed to explain it. Brought up by a pair of bleak, nonconformist aunts, he had acquired the Anglo-Saxon tendency to group northern Protestant intellectual against Mediterranean Roman Catholic irrational. He had thus arrived in Florence with a deep-rooted and chiefly subliminal ill-will toward all things Italian, and the subsequent conduct of his running mates from the secret police confirmed it. What sort of situation could one expect from such a scurvy and heterogeneous crew? The matter of this English lad, for example, Godolphin, alias Godrulfi. The Italians claimed they had been unable, after an hour of interrogation, to extract anything about his father, the naval officer. Yet the first thing the boy had done when they'd finally brought him round to the British consulate was to ask for Stencil's help in locating old Godolphin. He had been quite ready to answer all inquiries about Vey Sue, although he'd done little more than recapitulate information already in F.O.'s possession. He had gratuitously made mention of the rendezvous at Scheisvogel's at ten tonight. In general, he'd exhibited the honest concern and bewilderment of any English tourist confronted with a happening outside the ken of his Baedeker or the power of cooks to deal with it. And this simply did not fit in with the picture Stencil had formed of father and son as cunning arch-professionals. Their employers, whoever they might be, Scheisvogel's was a German beer hall, which might be significant, especially so with Italy a member of the Dreibund, could not tolerate such simplicity. This show was too big, too serious to be carried out by any but the top men in the field. The department had been keeping a dossier on old Godolphin since 84, when the surveying expedition had been all but wiped out. The name Vesu occurred in it only once, in a secret F.O. memorandum to the Secretary of State for War, a memo condensed from Godolphin's personal testimony. But a week ago, the Italian embassy in London sent round a copy of a telegram which the censor at Florence, after informing the state police, had let go through. The embassy had included no explanation except for a scribbled note on the copy. This may be of interest to you, cooperation to our mutual advantage. It was initialed by the Italian ambassador. On seeing Vesu alive file again, Stencil's chief had alerted operatives in Deauville and Florence to keep a close eye on father and son. Inquiries began to be made around the Geographical Society. Since the original had been somehow lost, junior researchers started piecing together the text of Godolphin's testimony at the time of the incident by interviewing all available members of the original Board of Inquiry. The chief had been puzzled that no code was used in the telegram, but it had only strengthened Stencil's conviction that the department was up against a pair of veterans. Such arrogance, he felt, 
Such cocksureness was exasperating, and one hated them for it, but at the same time one was overcome with admiration. Not bothering to use a code was the devil-may-care gesture of the true sportsman. The door opened hesitantly. I say, Mr. Stencil. Yes, Moffat. Do what I told you. They're together. Mine not to reason why, you know. Bravo. Give them an hour or so together. After that, we let young Godrulfi out. Tell him we have nothing really to hold him on. Sorry for the inconvenience. Pip-pip, arrivederci, you know. And then follow him, eh? Game is afoot, ha-ha. Oh, he'll go to Scheisvogel's. We've advised him to keep the rendezvous, and whether he's straight or not, he'll meet the old man, at least if he's playing his game the way we think he is. And the gaucho? Give him another hour. Then if he wants to escape, let him. Chancy, Mr. Stencil. Enough, Moffat, back in the chorus line. Tarara bumdie, said Moffat, soft chewing out the door. Stencil heaved a sigh, leaned forward in the chair, and recommenced his dark game. Soon a second hit, two inches from the first, had transfigured the minister into a lopsided goat. Stencil gritted his teeth. Pluck, lad, he muttered. Before the girl arrives, the old bastard should look like a blooming hedgehog. Two cells away, there was a loud Mora game in progress. Outside the window somewhere, a girl sang about her love, killed defending his homeland in a faraway war. She's singing for the tourists, the gaucho complained bitterly. She must be. No one ever sings in Florence. No one ever used to, except now and again the Venezuelan friends I told you about. But they sing marching songs which are useful for morale. Evan stood by the cell door, leaning his forehead against the bars. You may no longer have any Venezuelan friends, he said. They've probably all been rounded up and pushed into the sea. The gaucho came over and gripped Evan's shoulder sympathetically. You are still young, he said. I know how it must have been. That's the way they work. They attack a man's spirit. You will see your father again. I will see my friends. Tonight. We're going to stage the most wonderful festa this city has seen since Savonarola was burned. Evan looked around hopelessly at the small cell, the heavy bars. They told me I might be released soon, but you stand a fat chance of doing anything tonight except lose sleep. The gaucho laughed. I think they will release me, too. I told them nothing. I'm used to their ways. They are stupid and easily gotten round. Evan clenched the bars furiously. Stupid. Not only stupid, deranged. Illiterate, some bungling clerk misspelled my name, Gadrulfi, and they refused to call me anything else. It was an alias, they said. Did it not say Gadrulfi in my dossier? Was it not down in black and white? Ideas are so novel to them. Once they get hold of one, having the vague idea it is somehow precious, they wish to keep possession of it. If that were all... But someone in the higher echelons had got the idea Vesu was a code name for Venezuela. Either that, or it was the same bloody clerk, or his brother, who never learned to spell. They asked me about Vesu, the gaucho mused. What could I say? This time I really knew nothing. The English consider it important. But they don't tell you why. All they give you are mysterious hints. The Germans are apparently in on it. The Antarctic is concerned in some way. Perhaps in a matter of weeks, they say, the whole world will be plunged into apocalypse. And they think I'm in on it. And you? Why else, if they are going to release us anyway, did they throw us into the same cell? We'll be followed wherever we go. Here we are in the thick of a grand cabal, and we haven't the slightest notion of what's going on. I hope you didn't believe them. Diplomatic people always talk that way. They are living always on the verge of some precipice or other. Without a crisis, they wouldn't be able to sleep nights. Evan turned slowly to face his companion. But I do believe them, he said calmly. Let me tell you about my father. He would sit in my room before I went to sleep and spin yarns about this vase Sue. About the spider monkeys and the time he saw a human sacrifice 
and the rivers whose fish are sometimes opalescent and sometimes the color of fire. They circle round you when you go in to bathe and dance a kind of elaborate ritual all about to protect you from evil. And there are volcanoes with cities inside them, which once every hundred years abrupt into flaming hell, but people go to live in them anyway. And men in the hills with blue faces and women in the valleys who give birth to nothing but sets of triplets, and beggars who belong to guilds and hold jolly festivals and entertainments all summer long. You know how a boy is. There comes a time for departure, a point where he sees confirmed the suspicion he'd had for some time that his father is not a god, not even an oracle. He sees that he no longer has any right to any such faith. So Vesu becomes a bedtime story or fairy tale, after all, and the boy a superior version of his merely human father. I thought Captain Hugh was mad. I would have signed the commitment papers myself. But at Piazza della Signoria Five, I was nearly killed in something that could not have been an accident, a caprice of the inanimate world. And from then till now, I have seen two governments hag-ridden to alienation over this fairy tale or obsession I thought was my father's own. As if this condition of being just human, which had made Vesu and my boy's love for him a lie, were now vindicating them both for me, showing them to have been truth all along and after all. Because the Italians and the English in those consulates and even that illiterate clerk are all men. Their anxiety is the same as my father's, what is coming to be my own, and perhaps in a few weeks what will be the anxiety of everyone, living in a world none of us wants to see lit into Holocaust. Call it a kind of communion surviving somehow on a mucked-up planet which God knows none of us like very much. But it is our planet, and we live on it anyway. The gaucho did not answer. He walked to the window, stood gazing out. The girl was singing now about a sailor, halfway round the world from home, and his betrothed. From down the corridor floated cries, Cinque, tre, otto, brr. Soon the gaucho put his hands to his neck, removed his collar. He came back to heaven. If they let you out, he said, in time to see your father, there is also at Scheisvogel's a friend of mine. His name is Querna Cabron. Everyone knows him there. I would esteem it a favor if you would take him this, a message. Evan took the collar and pocketed it absently. A thought occurred to him. But they will see your collar missing. The gaucho grinned stripped off his shirt and tossed it under a bunk. It is warm, I will tell them. Thank you for reminding me. It's not easy for me to think like a fox. How do you propose to get out? Simply. When the turnkey comes to let you out, we beat him unconscious, take his keys, fight our way to freedom. If both of us get away, should I still take the message? See. Si. I must first go to Via Cavour. I will be at Scheisvogel's later to see some associates on another matter. Un gran colpo, if things work right. Soon footsteps, jangling keys, approached down the corridor. He reads our minds, the gaucho chuckled. Evan turned to him quickly, clasped his hand. Good luck. Put down your bludgeon, gaucho, the turnkey called in a cheerful voice. You are to be released, both of you. Ah, que fortuna, said the gaucho mournfully. He went back to the window. It seemed that the girl's voice could be heard all over April. The gaucho stood on tiptoe. Un gats, he screamed. Eight. Around Italian spy circles, the latest joke was about an Englishman who cuckolded his Italian friend. The husband came home one night to find the faithless pair in flagrante delicto on the bed. Enraged, he pulled out a pistol and was about to take revenge when the Englishman held up a restraining hand. I say, old chap, he said loftily, we're not going to have any dissension in the ranks, are we? Think what this might do to the quadruple alliance. The author of this parable was one Ferrante, a drinker of absinthe and destroyer of virginity. He was trying to grow a beard. He hated politics. 
Like a few thousand other young men in Florence, he fancied himself a neo-Machiavellian. He took the long view, having only two articles of faith. A, the foreign service in Italy was irreparably corrupt and nitwit, and B, someone should assassinate Umberto I. Ferrante had been assigned to the Venezuelan problem for half a year, and was beginning to see no way out of it except suicide. That evening, he was wandering around secret police headquarters with a small squid in one hand, looking for some place to cook it. He'd just bought it at the market. It was for supper. The hub of spy activities in Florence was the second floor of a factory which made musical instruments for devotees of the Renaissance and Middle Ages. It was run nominally by an Austrian named Vogt, who worked painstakingly during the daylight hours putting together Rebex, Shams, and Theorbos, and spied at night. In the legal or everyday segment of his life, he employed his helpers a Negro named Gascoigne, who would bring in his friends from time to time to test out the instruments, and Vogt's mother, an incredibly aged butterball of a woman who was under the curious illusion that she'd had an affair with Palestrina in her girlhood. She would be constantly haranguing visitors with fond reminiscences about Giovanino, these being mostly colorful allegations of sexual eccentricity in the composer. If these two were in on Vogt's espionage activities, no one was aware of it, not even Ferrante, who made it his business to spy on his colleagues as well as any more appropriate quarry. Vogt, however, being Austrian, could probably be given credit for discretion. Ferrante had no faith in covenants. He regarded them as temporary and more often than not farcical, but he reasoned that as long as you'd made an alliance in the first place, you might as well comply with its rules as long as was expedient. Since 1882, then, Germans and Austrians had been temporarily acceptable, but English most assuredly not, which had given rise to his joke about the cuckolded husband. He saw no reason for cooperating with London on this matter. It was a plot, he suspected, on Britain's part, to force a wedge into the Triple Alliance, to divide the enemies of England, so that England could deal with them separately and at her leisure. He descended into the kitchen. Horrible, screeching noises were coming from inside. Naturally leery of anything deviating from his private norm, Ferrante dropped quietly to hands and knees, crawled cautiously up behind the stove and peered around it. It was the old woman playing some sort of air on a viola da gamba. She did not play very well. When she saw Ferrante, she put the bow down and glared at him. A thousand pardons, signora, Ferrante said, getting to his feet. I did not mean to interrupt the music. I was wondering if I might borrow a skillet and some oil, my supper, which will take no more than a few minutes. He waved the squid at her placatingly. Ferrante, she croaked abruptly. This is no time for subtlety. Much is at stake. Ferrante was taken aback. Had she been snooping? Or merely in her son's confidence? I do not understand, he replied cautiously. That is nonsense, she retorted. The English know something you did not. It all began with this silly Venezuelan business, but by accident, unaware, your colleagues have stumbled on something so vast and terrifying that they are afraid even to speak its name aloud. Perhaps. Is it not true, then, that the young Gadrulfi has testified to Herr Stenzel that his father believes there to be agents of Vesu present in this city? Gadrulfi is a florist, said Ferrante impassively, whom we have under surveillance. He is associated with partners of the Gaucho, an agitator against the legally constituted government of Venezuela. We have followed them to this florist's establishment. You've got your facts confused. More likely, you and your fellow spies have got your names confused. I suppose you are maintaining as well this ridiculous fiction that Vesu is a code name for Venezuela. That is the way it appears in our files. You are clever, Ferrante. You trust no one. Can I afford to? I suppose not. Not when a barbaric and unknown race employed by God knows whom are even now blasting the Antarctic ice with dynamite, preparing to enter a subterranean network of natural tunnels. A network 
whose existence is known only to the inhabitants of Vesu, the Royal Geographic Society in London, Herr Godolphin, and the spies of Florence. Ferrante stood suddenly breathless. She was paraphrasing the secret memorandum Stencil had sent back to London not an hour ago. Having explored the volcanoes of their own region, she went on, certain natives of the Vesu district were the first to become aware of these tunnels, which lace the earth's interior at depths varying. Aspeti, Ferrante cried, you're raving. Tell the truth, she said sharply. Tell me what Vesu is really the code name for. Tell me, you idiot, what I already know, that it stands for Vesuvius. She cackled horribly. He was breathing with difficulty. She had guessed or spied it out or been told. She was probably safe. But how could he say, I detest politics, no matter if they are international or only within a single department, and the politics which have led to this work the same way and are equally as detestable? Everyone had assumed that the code word referred to Venezuela, a routine matter until the English informed them that Vesu actually existed. There was testimony from young Gadrulfi corroborating data already obtained from the Geographic Society and the Board of Inquiry fifteen years ago about the volcanoes. And from then on, fact had been added to meager fact, and the censorship of that single telegram had avalanched into a harrowing afternoon-long session of give-and-take, of log-rolling, bullying, factions and secret votes, until Ferrante and his chief had to face the sickening truth of the matter, that they must league with the English in view of a highly probable common peril, that they could hardly afford not to. It could stand for Venus, for all I know, he said. Please, I cannot discuss the matter. The old woman laughed again and began to saw away once more on her viola da gamba. She watched Ferrante contemptuously as he took down a skillet from a hook in the wall above the stove, poured olive oil into it, and poked the embers into flame. When the oil began to sizzle, he placed his squid carefully in it like an offering. He suddenly found himself sweating, though the stove gave off no great heat. Ancient music whined in the room, echoed off its walls. Ferrante let himself wonder for no good reason if it had been composed by Palestrina.